Section 41 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Bonaparte Before the Sphinx by Jean Lyon Jerome, France, 1824 to 1904. Painting, page 228. Now he, Jerome, guides us into the wilderness and shows us the encampment of the French legions in the desert. The cloudless blue of the sky, scintillating with heat, is softened toward the horizon by smoky vapors, through which mountains are faintly outlined. Over the sandy plains, masses of troops march and countermarch, so far away that clash of saber and blare of trumpet do not disturb the profound silence that envelops, as with a mantle, the majestic figure which dominates the scene. Preserving, in spite of mutilation, a marvellous expression of grandeur and repose, the sphinx rears its massive head and regards, with a calmness born of absolute knowledge, the vain struggles of a pygmy world. The lesser sphinx, on horseback, himself an incarnation of will and force, mutely demands of the oracle the secret of his future. In vain. The steady gaze passes over even his head. On, on, doubtless beholding the snowy steppes of Russia, reddened with blood and the light of conflagration. The wounded eagle, trailing his broken wings over the field of Waterloo, a lonely rock at whose base the sea makes incessant moan. There is no warning, no sign. Kismet. End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 42. The Story of the Suez Canal. From All the Year Round, 1854. One morning, in the month of August, 1854, a French gentleman was engaged in superintending some masons, who were at work adding a story to his house at La Chanaine, a house that had once been occupied by the famous Agnès Sorel. For the last two years he had devoted himself to agriculture and country pursuits. His career would, indeed, seem to have closed, for he had led a busy, stirring life in foreign countries, having filled the various grades of consulship in Tunis, Egypt, Rotterdam, Malaga, and Barcelona, had been minister at Madrid, and finally at Rome. He had shown himself a man of energy and purpose, and for his successful exertions at Barcelona in 1842, to avert a bombardment, had been presented with a gold medal by the resident French, and an address of thanks from the municipality. But his chief experience had been gained in the East, where he had made friends and connections, and with a Frenchman's sympathy had thoroughly identified himself with the politics and manners of Egypt. After some five-and-twenty years' service, he found that his course at Rome was not approved by his government, on which, in 1849, he resolved, apparently in some disgust, to withdraw from the service and claim his retirement. The name of this gentleman was Count Ferdinand de Lesseps, and as he was now about fifty years old, it might fairly be concluded that his career was closed, and that beyond an occasional cast at the game of politics, open to a Frenchman at any age, life did not offer space for any important undertaking. 
but his eyes and ears were still turned fondly back to the picturesque land of Egypt, and he entertained himself with what could be no more than a dream, or a fabric as baseless, of piercing the isthmus. At the moment almost of his retirement, this project began once more to fill his thoughts, for indeed twenty years before, when in Egypt he had often turned over the scheme, and seen in imagination the waters flowing through the canal and the ships sailing along. In 1852 he had again recurred to the design and drawn up a program which he had translated into Arabic, and took the step of writing to an old friend, the Dutch Consul General, to know what chances there were of its acceptance by Abbas Pasha, then Viceroy. The answer was unfavorable, but already the mind of the projector was beginning to be stimulated by obstacles, and to show that fertility of resource which obstacles generated. One of the Fulda family was then proposing to establish a bank at Constantinople, and de Lesseps seized the opportunity to have the proposal open to the Sultan. It was coldly declined, on the ground of its interfering with the prerogative of the Viceroy. Seeing that it was hopeless, our projector laid the whole aside for the present, and as we have seen, turned his thoughts to agriculture. And thus two years passed away. On that morning, then, of August 1854, when engaged with the Masons and standing on the roof of Anya Sorel's house, the post arrived, and the letters were handed up from workman to workman till they reached the proprietor. In one of the newspapers he read the news of the death of Abbas Pasha and of the accession of Mohammed Said a patron and friend of the old Egypt days. They had been indeed on affectionate and confidential terms. Instantly the scheme was born again in his busy soul, and his teeming brain saw the most momentous result from this change of authority. In a moment he had hurried down the ladder and was writing congratulations, and a proposal to hurry to Egypt and renew their old acquaintance. In a few weeks came the answer, and the ardent projector had written joyfully to his old friend, the Dutch consul, that he would be on his way in November, expressing the delight he would have in meeting him again, in our old land in Egypt. But there was not to be so much as a whisper to anyone of the scheme for piercing the isthmus. On the 7th of November, he landed at Alexandria, and was received with the greatest welcome by the new ruler. The viceroy was on the point of starting on a sort of military promenade to Cairo, and insisted on taking his friend with him. They started, but the judicious Frenchman determined to choose his opportunity, and waited for more than a week before opening his daring plan to his patron. It was when they had halted on their march, on a fine evening, the 15th, that he at last saw the opportunity. The viceroy was in spirits. He took his friend by the hand, which he detained for a moment in his own, then made him sit down beside him in his tent. It was an anxious moment. He felt, as he confessed, that all depended on the way the matter was put before the prince, and that he must succeed in inspiring him with some of his own enthusiasm. He accordingly proceeded to unfold his plan, which he did in a broad fashion, without insisting too much on petty details. He had his Arabian memoir almost by heart, so all the facts were present to his mind, the Eastern listened calmly to the end, made some difficulties, heard the answers, and then addressed his eager listener in these words. I am satisfied, and I accept your scheme. 
We'll settle all the details during our journey. But understand that it is settled, and you may count upon me. Delightful assurance for the projector, whose dreams that night must have been of an enchanting kind. This was virtually the concession of the Great Canal. But already the fair prospect was to be clouded, and at starting, opposition to so daring a scheme came from England, and from Turkey, moved by England. It is certainly not to the credit of England that from the beginning she should have persistently opposed it, not on the straightforward ground of disliking the scheme, but on the more disingenuous one of its not being feasible. She had so industriously disseminated this idea that it was assumed that the canal was impracticable. Those wonderful French savants, who went with the expedition to Egypt, had announced that there was a difference of level amounting to thirty feet between the two seas, so that the communication would only lead to an inundation or a sort of permanent waterfall. Captain Chine passing by in 1830, declared that this was not so. But the delusion was accepted popularly up to 1847, when a commission of three engineers, English, French, and German, made precise levelings, and ascertained that it was a scientific mistake. Robert Stevenson, the English member of the party, pronounced the whole scheme impracticable. Articles in the Edinburgh Review demonstrated with minute and elaborate pains the falsity of the data on which the promoters rested. And a more amusing half-hour's entertainment could not be desired than the perusal of this Edinburgh Review article for January 1856, in which it is proved triumphantly that the canal must fill up, and that no harbour or pier could be made. The article argued it all out, with a formidable array of facts. Lord Palmerston's opposition is well known, but the shower of articles in the leading journal which ridiculed, prophesied, and confuted are now well-nigh forgotten. It was first proposed to follow a roundabout route, making two sides of a triangle, with the existing line for the third. One portion of the waterway, from Damietta to Cairo, was supplied by the Nile itself, so there remained a distance of twenty miles to be dealt with. But the Nile was in itself a difficulty, the irrigation and other works would be all interfered with, and there were enormous problems as to levels, etc., the direct course was therefore adopted. A curious scientific party, known as the Mixed Commission, formed of engineers from all the leading nations, proceeded, at the close of 1855, to make a close examination of the question on the spot, and nothing is more creditable to science than the masterly style in which every point was investigated. The result was satisfactory, and it was determined to commence the work. The route chosen was favored by many advantages. The distance, though ninety miles in length, was already canalized by various lakes, great and small, to the extent of about thirty miles or more. Roughly, the course was as follows. Starting from the Mediterranean, the entrance is found in a strip of sand, from four to five hundred feet wide, and which forms the rim, as it were, of the bowl that holds Lake Menzala. Here is Port Said, the gate or doorway of the canal. Then, for about thirty miles, is found the great lake just named, where there rises a slight hill, about twenty-five feet high then a small lake, and then, for about thirty miles, a series of gradually rising hills, culminating in a rather stiff plateau. Beyond the plateau is Lake Timsa, about five miles long, 
Where there is the halfway port, is Maelia. Then succeeds another plateau, large basins known as the Bitter Lakes, extending about 20 miles, while the rest is land up to the Red Sea. These lakes were in some places dry. There were to be no sluices or locks, though these lakes would be greatly enlarged by the admission of the waters. It would take long to set out the story of the opposition, coldness and rebuffs which this intrepid projector was now to encounter. His own sovereign was indifferent, but in England the hostility was almost rancorous. It was repeated again, in and out of Parliament, that even if the canal were ever made, it would be no more than a stagnant ditch. And this phrase became a favorite one with the wiseacres, who knew nothing and fancied that they understood. Stevenson, in the House of Commons, renewed his condemnation of the whole scheme, and in contemptuous style repeated the favorite phrase, stagnant ditch. Never faltering, our projector brought out his company, and after untiring speechifyings, pamphlets, repasts, etc., opened the subscription. Nearly eight millions were found. In 1859, he started with the work. His faithful friend, the Pasha, stood by him gallantly, and supplied him with fellas by the thousand, according to the custom of forced labor in the country. Unfortunately, within five years, his patron died, and the present Pasha, who succeeded, had not the same admiration and faith in the projector. He presently took up a hostile attitude, and declined to supply any more forced labor. It is surprising that the blow did not at once wreck the undertaking, for the forced labor was an all-important element in the calculations. But the indomitable de Lesseps was now a force in Europe, and many eyes were following his proceedings with curiosity and sympathy. A man who had done so much against so much was not likely to be repelled by such an obstacle. He appealed to the Emperor Napoleon, and here we see again the good fortune that attended the brave adventurer. He was a connection of the Empress, Indeed, it has been stated that he was grandson of one of the Scotch Kirkpatricks, and this influence stood him in good stead. Further, he had wisely made the shares of his company small enough to attract the humble investor, and as they were held largely over the kingdom, the whole country was interested in the scheme. The emperor dared not disregard such pressure, and agreeing to act as umpire, made an equitable decision that satisfied both, to the effect that the pasha was to supply as much labor as was necessary, with a rearrangement of the concession. On this, the enterprise was pursued with fresh energy. The little canal, which was to convey fresh water for the workmen, had been completed. And at last, by the year 1865... A channel had been scraped out about the depth of a respectable duck pond, and sufficient to float a small boat through. A couple of years more, and it was deep enough to carry a vessel of thirty or forty tons. It seems incredible, but this progress only excited the derision of the leading English newspapers, who talked of cockle shells and who were dull enough not to see that the problem was already solved. It was then insinuated that it was merely a coup de théâtre, a cleverly arranged trick to raise the wind and extract more money. The idea seemed, indeed, to be generally entertained in England, that it was no more than the prophesied stagnant ditch, in which it was contrived to keep some water for show. More money, however, was wanting, and still this Cagliostro 
seems to have induced his disciples to subscribe without difficulty. And then a system of dredging, carried out on a magnificent and original scale, was introduced. Machines were contrived on the elevator principle, which dredged the stuff from the bottom and landed it on the banks direct. Finally, on August 15th, the brilliant scene of the opening took place in presence of the Empress, who had traveled from Paris for the purpose. The waters were admitted, and the red in the Mediterranean seas mingled together. A glorious day for our adventurer. The cost of this scheme corresponded to its splendor, amounting to nearly 19 million sterling, including the charge of interest during the construction. It was a good deal more than double the estimate. But as we have seen, the expense of paid-for labor had not been included. The time spent had been about sixteen years. Everything had come out as the projector had prophesied, even to the prophets, which, as the great Samuel said on another occasion, were rich beyond the dreams of avarice. All the prophecies of the ill-wishers and the critics were falsified in the most ludicrous degree. The silting up, the impossibility of keeping the mouths open, the washing away of the banks, and above all, the grave statement of the Edinburgh Review that goods could be unloaded at one side, dispatched across the isthmus by rail, and shipped again at the other side, on just as convenient and rapid a system. All these fine-spun scientific arguments have been confuted by the event. The work remains a magnificent success. End of Section 42 Read by The Story Girl This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by Chris Fields. How General Gordon Outwitted the King of Abyssinia, between 1873 and 1880, by Alfred Egmont Hake. Charles George Gordon was one of the most picturesque figures of the 19th century. Born in 1833, he served with distinction in the Crimean War and in the English expedition to China. At 30, he was appointed by the Chinese government to the command of the Imperial Army, and within a year had stamped out the Taiping Rebellion that had long desolated the richest provinces of southern China. He held various missions in India, Mauritius, and South Africa, and served with remarkable success as governor of the Sudan and equatorial provinces of Egypt. His method of dealing with the natives is well illustrated by the following story. The Editor when Gordon Pasha was taken prisoner by the Abyssinians, he completely checkmated King John. Footnote, Pasha is a Turkish title, equivalent to lord or general. End of footnote. The king received his prisoner sitting on his throne, or whatever piece of furniture did duty for that exalted seat, a chair being placed for the prisoner considerably lower than the seat on which the king sat. The first thing the Pasha did was to seize this chair and place it alongside that of his majesty and sit down on it the next to inform him that he met him as an equal, and would only treat him as such. This somewhat disconcerted his sable majesty, but on recovering himself, he said, Do you know, Gordon Pasha, that I could kill you on the spot if I liked? I am perfectly aware of it, your majesty, said the Pasha. Do so at once if it is your royal pleasure. I am ready. This disconcerted the king still more, and he exclaimed, What? Ready to be killed? Certainly, replied the Pasha. I am always ready to die, and so far from fearing your putting me to death, you would confer a favor on me by so doing, for you would be doing for me that which I am precluded by my religious scruples from doing myself. You would relieve me from all the troubles and misfortunes which the future may have in store for me. This completely staggered King John, who gasped out in despair. Then my power has no terrors for you? None whatsoever was the Pasha's laconic reply. His Majesty, it is needless to add, instantly collapsed. End of section 43. This recording is in the public domain.
Section 44 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Scott, Cheltenham, England. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 44. The Death of General Gordon at Khartoum, 1885, by Anonymous. Note. In 1882, there arose in the Sudan, a province of Upper Egypt, one Mohammed Ahmed, who called himself the Mahdi, or Messiah, and invited all true believers to join in a holy war against the Christians. Thousands of wild tribesmen flocked to his banner, and in the following year he annihilated an army of 11,000 English and Egyptians that had attempted to subdue the revolt. Rather than send more soldiers to die in the deserts of the Upper Nile, England decided to abandon the province. But first the thousands of whites who had taken refuge in Khartoum and other towns of the Sudan must be rescued from their perilous position. In this crisis the government turned to the one man who could effect the withdrawal if it was still possible, and in January 1884 appointed General Gordon to superintend the evacuation of the Sudan. The Editor General Gordon arrived at Khartoum on February 18, and spent his time between that date and the investment on March 12 in sending down women and children, 2,000 of whom were sent safely through to Egypt, in addition to 600 soldiers. It was stated by Sir Evelyn Baring, English Consul General in Egypt, that there were 15,000 persons in Khartoum who ought to be brought back to Egypt. Europeans, civil servants, widows and orphans, and a garrison of 1,000 men, one-third of whom were disaffected. To get these people out of Khartoum was General Gordon's first duty, and the first condition of evacuation was the establishment of a stable government in the Sudan. The only man who could establish that government was Zabair. Gordon demanded Zabair with ever-increasing emphasis, and his request was decisively refused. He had then two alternatives, either to surrender absolutely to the Mahdi, or to hold on to Khartoum at all hazards. While Gordon was strengthening his position, the Mahdi settled the question by suddenly assuming the offensive. The first step in this memorable siege was the daring march of 4,000 Arabs to the Nile, by which, on March 12, they cut off the 800 men at Halfaya, a village to the north of Khartoum from the city. A steamer was sent down to reconnoitre, and the moment she reached the front of the Arab position, a volley was fired into her, wounding an officer and a soldier. The steamer returned the fire, killing five. Thus hostilities began. Our only justification for assuming the offensive, wrote General Gordon on March 13, is the extrication of the Halfaya garrison. The Arabs, however, did not give him the chance. They cut off three companies of his troops who had gone out to cut wood, capturing eight of their boats and killing or dispersing 100 to 150 men. They entrenched themselves along the Nile and kept up a heavy rifle fire. Retreat for the garrison was obviously impossible when the Arab force covered the river, the only line of retreat, with their fire. 1,200 men were put on board two grain barges, towed by three steamers defended with boiler plates, and carrying mountain guns protected by wooden mantlets, and, with the loss of only two killed, they succeeded in extricating the 500 men left of the garrison of Halfaya and capturing 70 camels and 18 horses with which they returned to Khartoum. The Arabs, however, held Halfaya, and on March 16 Gordon tried to drive them away. Advancing from a stockaded position covering the north front of the town, 2,000 troops advanced across the open in square, supported by the fire of the guns of two steamers. The Arabs were retreating when Hassan and Said Pashas, Gordon's black generals, rode into the wood and called back the enemy. The Egyptians, betrayed by their officers, broke and fled after firing a single volley, 
and were pursued to within a mile of the stockade abandoning two mountain guns with their ammunition sixty horsemen defeated two thousand men and leaving two hundred of their number on the field after this affair he was convinced that he could not take the offensive but must remain quiet at khartoum and wait till the nile rose six days later the black pashas were tried by court-martial found guilty and shot a very determined attack upon one of the steamers coming up from berber at the salboka pass was beaten off with great slaughter gordon's men firing no fewer than fifteen thousand rounds of remington ammunition meanwhile his efforts to negotiate with the mahdi failed i will make you sultan of kordofan he had said on arrival to the mahdi i am the mahdi replied mahomet achmet by emissaries who were exceedingly cheeky keeping their hands upon their swords and laying a filthy patched dervish's coat before him will you become a mussulman gordon flung the bundle across the room cancelled the mahdi's sultanship and the war was renewed from that day to the day of the betrayal no day passed without bullets dropping into khartoum gordon now set to work in earnest to place khartoum in a defensible position ten thousand of the mahdi's sympathizers left khartoum and joined the enemy the steamers kept up a skirmishing fight on both niles all the houses on the north side of khartoum were loopholed a sixteen-pounder krupp was mounted on a barge and wire was stretched across the front of the stockade the houses on the northern bank of the blue nile were fortified and garrisoned by bashi bazooks omdurman was held and fortified on the west and buri on the east on march twenty five gordon had to disarm and disband two hundred and fifty bashi bazooks who refused to occupy stockaded houses in a village on the south bank of the blue nile the rebels advanced on haji ali a village to the north of the nile and fired into the palace they were shelled out of their position but constantly returned to harass the garrison they seemed to gordon more ragtag and bobtail but he dared not go out to meet them for fear of the town. Five hundred brave men could have cleared out the lot, but he had not a hundred. The fighting was confined to artillery fire on one side and desultory rifle shooting on the other. This went on till the end of March. The Arabs clustered more closely round the town. On April 19, Gordon telegraphed that he had provisions for five months, and if he only had 2,000 to 3,000 Turkish troops, he could soon settle the rebels. Unfortunately, he received not one fighting man. Shendi fell into the hands of the Mahdi. Berber followed, and then for months no word whatever reached this country from Khartoum. On September 29, Mr. Power's telegram, dated July 31, was received by the Times. From that, we gathered a tolerably clear notion of the way in which the war went on. Anything more utterly absurd than the accusation that Gordon forced fighting on the Mahdi cannot be conceived. He acted uniformly on the defensive, merely trying to clear his road of an attacking force and failing because he had no fighting men to take the offensive. He found himself in a trap out of which he could not cut his way, if he had possessed a single regiment the front of khartoum might have been cleared with ease but his impotence encouraged the arabs and they clustered round in ever-increasing numbers until at last they crushed his resistance after the middle of april the rebels began to attack the palace in force having apparently established themselves on the north bank the loss of life was chiefly occasioned by the explosion of mines devised by general gordon and so placed as to explode when trodden on by the enemy of all his expedients these mines were the most successful and the least open to any accusation of offensive operations the arabs closed in all round towards the end of april and general gordon surrounded himself with a formidable triple barrier of land torpedoes over which wire entanglement and a formidable chevaux de frise enabled the garrison to feel somewhat secure on april twenty seven valet bay surrendered at messalima a disaster by which general gordon lost one steamer seventy shiploads of provisions and two thousand rifles General Gordon was now entirely cut off from the outside world, 
and compelled to rely entirely upon his own resources he sent out negroes to entice the slaves of the arabs to come over promising them freedom and rations this he thought would frighten the arabs more than bullets on april twenty six he made his first issue of paper money to the extent of two thousand five hundred pounds redeemable in six months by july thirty it had risen to twenty six thousand pounds besides the fifty thousand pounds borrowed from merchants on the same day he struck decorations for the defence of khartoum for officers in silver silver gilt and pewter for the private soldiers these medals bear a crescent and a star with words from the koran and the date with an inscription siege of khartoum and a hand grenade in the centre school children and women he wrote also received medals consequently i am very popular with the black ladies of khartoum the repeated attacks of the Mahdi's forces on Khartoum cost the Arabs many lives. On May 25, Colonel Stewart was slightly wounded in the arm when working a mitrailleuse near the palace. All through May and June, his steamers made foraging expeditions up and down the Nile, shelling the rebels when they showed in force and bringing back much cattle to the city. On Midsummer Day, Mr. Cousy, formerly Gordon's agent at Berber, but now prisoner of the Mahdi's, was sent to the wells to announce the capture of Berber. It was sad news for the three Englishmen alone in the midst of a hostile Sudan. Undaunted, they continued to stand at bay, rejoicing greatly that in one, Sati Bey, they had at least a brave and capable officer. Sati had charge of the steamers, and for two months he had uninterrupted success, in spite of the twisted telegraph wires which the rebels stretched across the river. Unfortunately, on July 10, Sati, with Colonel Stewart and 200 men, after burning Kalaka and three villages, attacked Gatarnulb. Eight Arab horsemen rode at the 200 Egyptians. The 200 fled at once, not caring to fire their Remingtons, and poor Sati was killed. Colonel Stewart narrowly escaped a similar fate. After July 31, there is a sudden cessation of regular communications. Power's journal breaks off then, and we are left to more or less meagre references in Gordon's dispatches. On August 23, he sent a characteristic message in which he announces that, the Nile having risen, he has sent Colonel Stewart mr power and the french consul to take berber occupy it for fifteen days burn it and then return to khartoum all the late messages from gordon except a long dispatch of november four which has never been published were written on tissue paper no bigger than a postage stamp and either concealed in a quill thrust into the hair or sewn in the waistband of the natives employed Gordon seems to have been the most active in August and September when the Nile was high. He had 8,000 men at Khartoum and Sana'a. He sent Colonel Stewart and the troops with the steamers to recapture Berber. A steamer which bore a rough effigy of Gordon at the prow was said to be particularly dreaded by the rebels. On August 26, he reported that he had provisions for five months, but in the forays made by his steamer on the southern Niles, he enormously replenished his stores. On one of these raids, he took with him 6,000 men in 34 boats towed by nine steamers. After his defeat before Omdurman, the Mahdi is said to have made a very remarkable prophecy. He retired into a cave for three days, and on his return he told his followers that Allah had revealed that for 60 days there would be a rest, and after that blood would flow like water. The Mahdi was right. Almost exactly sixty days after that prophecy, there was fought the Battle of Abu Kli. Stuart had by this time been treacherously killed on his way down from Berber to Dongola. Gordon was all alone. The old men and women who had friends in the neighbouring villages left the town. The uninhabited part was destroyed. The remainder was enclosed by a wall. In the centre of Khartoum, he had built himself a tower from the roof of which he kept a sharp lookout with his field glasses in the daytime. At night, he went the rounds of the fortifications, cheering his men and keeping them on the alert against attacks. Treachery was always his greatest dread. Many of the townsfolk sympathised with the Mahdi. He could not depend on all his troops, and he could only rely on one of his pashas, Mehmet Ali. 
he rejoiced exceedingly in the news of the approach of the british relieving force he illuminated khartoum and fired salutes in honour of the news and he doubled his exertions to fill his granaries with grain on december fourteen a letter was received by one of his friends in cairo from general gordon saying farewell you will never hear from me again i fear that there will be treachery in the garrison and all will be over by christmas it was this melancholy warning that led lord wolseley to order the dash across the desert on december sixteen came news that the mahdi had again failed in his attack on omdurman gordon had blown up the fort which he had built over against the town and inflicted great loss on his assailants who however invested the city closely on all sides the mahdi had returned to omdurman where he had concentrated his troops thence he sent fourteen thousand men to berber to recruit the forces of osman digma and it was these men probably that fought the english relief army at abu Kli. after this nothing was heard beyond the rumour that omdurman was captured and two brief messages from gordon sent probably to hoodwink the enemy by whom most of his letters were captured the first which arrived january one was as follows khartoum all right c g gordon december fourteen eighteen eighty four the second was brought by the steamers which met general stuart at mentemna on january twenty first khartoum all right could hold out for years c g gordon december twenty nine on january twenty six faraz pasha opened the gates of the city to the enemy and one of the most famous sieges in the world's history came to a close it had lasted from march twelve to january twenty six exactly three hundred and twenty days Note when gordon awoke to find that through the treachery of his egyptian lieutenant khartoum was in the hands of the mahdi he set out with a few followers for the austrian consulate recognized by a party of rebels he was shot dead on the street and his head carried through the town at the end of a pike amid the wild rejoicings of the mahdi's followers two days later the english army of relief reached khartoum the Mahdi and his followers ruled the Sudan until 1898, when their army was destroyed at Omdurman by an English force under General Kitchener, the editor. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scotty. The World Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 45. Up the Cataracts of the Nile, 1875. By Charles Dudley Warner. At twelve o'clock we are ready to push off. The wind is strong from the north. The cataract men swarm on board, two or three sheiks and thirty or forty men. They take command and possession of the vessel, and our rays and crew give way. We have carefully closed the windows and blinds of our boat, for the cataract men are reputed to have long arms and fingers that crook easily. The Nubians run about like cats. Four are at the helm, some are at the bow all are talking and giving orders there is an indescribable bustle and whirl as our boat is shoved off from the sand with the chorus of ha yalasa ha yalasa and takes the current the great sail shaped like a bird's wing and a hundred feet long is shaken out forward and we pass swiftly on our way between the granite walls the excited hawaji are on deck feeling to their finger ends the thrill of expectancy the first thing the Nubians want is something to eat, a chronic complaint here in this land of romance. Squatting in circles all over the boat, they dip their hands into the bowls of softened bread, cramming the food down their throats, and swallow all the coffee that can be made for them with the gusto and appetite of simple men who have a stomach and no conscience. While the Nubians are chattering and eating, we are gliding up the swift stream, the granite rocks opening the passage for us. But at the end of it, our way seems to be barred. The only visible opening is on the extreme left, 
where a small stream struggles through the boulders. While we are wondering if that can be our course, the helm is suddenly put hard about, and we are then shoot to the right, finding our way amid whirlpools and boulders of granite, past the head of Elephantine Island, and before we have recovered from this surprise, we turn sharply to the left into a narrow passage, and the cataract is before us. It is not at all what we have expected. In appearance, this is a cataract without any falls and scarcely any rapids. A person brought up on Niagara or Montmorency feels himself trifled with here. The fisherman in the mountain streams of America has come upon many a scene that resembles this, a riverbed strewn with boulders. Only this is on a grand scale. We have been led to expect at least high precipices, walls of lofty rock, between which we should sail in the midst of raging rapids and falls, and that there would be hundreds of savages on the rocks above, dragging our boat with cables, and occasionally plunging into the torrent in order to carry a lifeline to the top of some sea-girt rock. All of this we did not see, but yet we have more respect for the cataract before we get through it than when it first came in sight. What we see immediately before us is a basin, it may be a quarter of a mile, it may be half a mile broad, and two miles long. A wild expanse of broken granite rocks and boulders strewn haphazard, some of them showing the red of the cyanite, and others black and polished and shining in the sun. A field of rocks, none of them high, of fantastic shapes, and through this field the river breaks in a hundred twisting passages and chutes, all apparently small, but the water in them is foaming and leaping and flashing white, and the air begins to be pervaded by the multitudinous roar of rapids. On the east, the side of the land passage between Aswan and Philae, were high and jagged rocks in odd forms, now and then a palm tree, and here and there a mud village. On the west, the basin of the cataract is hemmed in by the desert hills, and the yellow Libyan sand drifts over them in shining waves and rifts, which in some lights have the almost maroon color that we see in Jerome's pictures. To the south is an impassable barrier of granite and sand, mountains of them, beyond the glistening fields of rocks and water through which we are to find our way. The difficulty of this navigation is not one cataract to be overcome by one heroic effort, but a hundred little cataracts or swift, torturous sluiceways which are much more formidable when we get into them than they are when seen at a distance. The dahabias which attempt to wind through them are in constant danger of having holes knocked in their hulls by the rocks. The wind is strong and we are sailing swiftly on. It is impossible to tell which one of the half-dozen equally uninviting channels we are to take. We guess and of course point out the wrong one. We approach with sails still set a narrow passage through which the water pours in what is a very respectable torrent, but it is not a straight passage. It has a bend in it. If we get through it, we must make a sharp turn to the left or run upon a ridge of rocks, and even then we shall be in a boiling surge, and if we fail to make head against the current, we shall go whirling down the cauldron, bumping on the rocks. Not a pleasant thing for a dahabia one hundred and twenty feet long with a cabin in it as large as a hotel. The passage of a boat this size is evidently an event of some interest to the cataract people, for we see groups of them watching us from the rocks and following along the shore. And we think that seeing our boat go up from the shore might be the best way of seeing it. We draw slowly in, the boat trembling at the entrance of the swift water, it enters, nosing the current, feeling the tug of the sail, and hesitates. Oh, for a strong puff of wind! There are five watchful men at the helm, there is a moment's silence, and the boat still hesitates. At this critical instant, while we are holding our breath, a naked man, whose name I am sorry I cannot give to an admiring American public, appears on the bow with a rope in his teeth. He plunges in and makes for the nearest rock, he swims hand over hand, swinging his arms from the shoulders out of water and striking them forward, splashing along like a side-wheeler, the common way of swimming in the heavy water of the Nile. Two other black figures follow him, and the rope is made fast to the point of the rock. We have something to hold us against the stream. 
and now a terrible tumult arises on board the boat which is seen to be covered with men one gang is hauling on the rope to draw the great sail close to its work another gang is hauling on the rope attached to the rock and both are singing that wild chanting chorus without which no egyptian sailors pull an ounce or lift a pound the men who are not pulling are shouting and giving orders the sheiks on the upper deck where we sit with american serenity exaggerated amid the babel are jumping up and down in a frenzy of excitement screaming and gesticulating we hold our own we gain a little we pull forward where the danger of a smash against the rocks is increased more men appear on the rocks whom we take to be spectators of our passage no they lay hold of the rope with the additional help we still tremble in the jaws of the pass i walk aft and the stern is almost upon the rocks it grazes them but in the nick of time the bow swings round we turn short off into an eddy the great wing of a sail is let go and our cat-like sailors are aloft crawling along the slender yard which is a hundred feet in length and furling the tugging canvas we breathe more freely for the first danger is over the first gate is passed in this lull there is a confab with the sheiks we are at the island of sahail and have accomplished what is usually the first day's journey of boats it would be in harmony with the oriental habit to stop here for the remainder of the day and the night but our dragoman has in mind to accomplish if not the impossible what is synonymous with it in the east the unusual the result of the inflammatory stump speeches on both sides is that two or three gold pieces are passed into the pliant hand of the head sheik and he sends for another sheik and more men for some time we have been attended by the increasing procession of men and boys on shore they cheered us as we passed the first rapid they came out from the villages from the crevices of the rocks their blue and white gowns flowing in the wind and making a sort of holiday of our passage less conspicuous at first are those without gowns they are hardly distinguishable from the black rocks amid which they move as we lie here with the rising roar of the rapids in our ears we can see no further opening for our passage but we are preparing to go on ropes are carried out forward over the rocks more men appear to aid us we said there were fifty we count seventy we count eighty there are at least ninety they come up by a sort of magic from whence are they these black forms they seem to grow out of the rocks at the wave of the sheik's hand they are of the same color shining men of granite the swimmers and the divers are simply smooth statues hewn out of the cyanide or the basalt they are not unbaked clay like the rest of us one expects to see them disappear like stones when they jump into the water the mode of our navigation is to draw the boat along hugged close to the shore rocks so closely that the current cannot get full hold of it and thus to work it round the bends we are crawling along slowly in this manner clinging to the rocks when unexpectedly a passage opens to the left the water before us runs like a mill-race if we enter it nothing would seem to be able to hold the boat from dashing down amidst the breakers but the bow is hardly let to feel the current before it is pulled short round and we are swinging in the swift stream before we know it we are in the anxiety of another tug suppose the rope should break in an instant the black swimmers are overboard striking out for the rocks two ropes are sent out and secured and the gangs hauling on them we are working inch by inch through everybody on board trembling with excitement we look at our watches it seems only fifteen minutes since we left aswan it's an hour and a quarter do we gain in the chute it's difficult to say the boat hangs back and strains at the cables but just as we are in the pinch of doubt the big sail unfurls its wing with exciting suddenness a strong gust catches it we feel the lift and creep upward amid an infernal din of singing and shouting and calling on the prophet from the gangs who haul in the sail rope who tug at the cables attached to the rocks who are pulling at the hawsers on the shore we forge ahead and are about to dash into a boiling cauldron before us from which there appears to be no escape 
when a skillful turn of the great creaking helm once more throws us to the left and we are again in an eddy with the stream whirling by us and the sail is let go and is furled the place where we lie is barely long enough to admit our boat its stern just clears the rocks its bow is aground on hard sand the number of men and boys on the rocks has increased it is over one hundred it is one hundred and thirty on a recount it is one hundred and fifty an anchor is now carried out to hold us in position when we make a new start more ropes are taken to the shore two hitched to the bow and one to the stern straight before us is a narrow passage through which the water comes in foaming ridges with extraordinary rapidity it seems to be our way but of course it is not we are to turn the corner sharply before reaching it what will happen then we shall see there is a slight lull in the excitement while the extra hawsers are got out and preparations are made for the next struggle the sheiks light their long pipes and squatting on deck gravely wait the men who have tobacco roll up cigarettes and smoke them the swimmers come on board for reinforcement the poor fellows are shivering as if they had an ague fit the nile may be friendly though it does not offer a warm bath at this time of the year but when they come out of it naked on the rocks the cold north wind sets their white teeth chattering the dragoman brings out a bottle of brandy it's none of your ordinary brandy but must have cost over a dollar a gallon and would burn a hole in a new piece of cotton cloth he pours out a tumblerful of it and offers it to one of the granite men the granite man pours it down his throat in one flow without moving an eye winker and holds the glass out for another his throat must be lined with zinc a second tumblerful follows the first it's like pouring liquor into a brazen image i said there was a lull but this is only in contrast to the preceding fury there is still noise enough over and above the roar of the waters in the preparations going forward the din of a hundred people screaming together each one giving orders and elaborating his opinion by a rhetorical use of his hands the waiting crowd scattered over the rocks disposes itself picturesquely as an arab crowd always does and probably cannot help doing in its blue and white gowns and white turbans in the midst of these preparations and unmindful of any excitement or confusion a sheik standing upon a little square of sand amid the rocks and so close to the deck of the boat that we can hear his allahu akbar god is most great begins his kneelings and prostrations towards mecca and continues at his prayers as undisturbed and as unregarded as if he were in a mosque and wholly oblivious of the babel around him so common has religion become in this land of its origin here is a half-clad sheik of the desert stopping in the midst of his contract to take the hawaji up the cataract to raise his forefinger and say i testify that there is no deity but god and i testify that mohammed is his servant and his apostle judging by the eye the double turn we have next to make is too short to admit our long hull it does not seem possible that we can squeeze through but we try we first swing out and take the current as if we were going straight up the rapids we are held by two ropes from the stern while by four ropes from the bow three on the left shore and one on the islet to the right the cataract people are tugging to draw us up as we watch almost breathless the strain on the ropes look there is a man in the tumultuous rapid before us swiftly coming down as if to his destruction another one follows and then another till there are half dozen men and boys in this jeopardy the situation of certain death to anybody not made of cork and the singular thing about it is that the men are seated upright sliding down the shining water like a boy who has no respect for his trousers down a snowbank as they dash past us we see that each man is seated on a round log about five feet long some of them sit upright with their legs on the log displaying the soles of their feet keeping the equilibrium with their hands these are smooth slimy logs that a white man would find it difficult to sit on if they were on shore and in this water they would turn with him only once the log would go one way and the man another but these fellows are in no fear of the rocks below 
they easily guide their barks out of the rushing floods through the whirlpools and eddies into the slack shore water in the rear of the boat and stand up like men and demand back sheesh these logs are popular ferry boats in the upper nile i have seen a woman crossing the river on one her clothes in a basket and the basket on her head and the nile is nowhere an easy stream to swim far ahead of us the cataract people are seen in lines and groups half hidden by the rocks pulling and stumbling along black figures are scattered along lifting the ropes over the jagged stones and freeing them so that we shall not be drawn back as we slowly advance and severe as their toil is it is not enough to keep them warm when the chilly wind strikes them they get bruised on the rocks also and have time to show us their barked shins and request bakshish an egyptian is never too busy or too much in peril to forget to prefer that request at the sight of a traveller when we turn into the double twist i spoke of above the bow goes sideways upon a rock and the stern is not yet free the punt poles are brought into requisition half the men are in the water there is poling and pushing and grunting heaving and ya mohammed ya mohammed with all which noise and outlay of brute strength the boat moves a little on and still is held close in hand the current runs very swiftly we have to turn almost by a right angle to the left and then by the same angle to the right and the question is whether the boat is not too long to turn in the space we just scrape along the rocks the current growing every moment stronger and at length get far enough to let the stern swing i run back to see if it will go free it is a close fit the stern is clear but if our boat had been four or five feet longer her voyage would have ended then and there there is now before us a straight pull up the swiftest and narrowest rapid we have thus far encountered our sandal the rowboat belonging to the dahabia that becomes a felucca when a mast is stepped into it which has accompanied us fitfully during the passage appearing here and there tossing about amid the rocks and aiding occasionally in the transport of ropes and men to one rock and another now turns away to seek a less difficult passage the rocks all about us are low from three feet to ten feet high we have one rope out ahead fastened to a rock upon which a gang of men pulling there is a row of men in the water under the left side of the boat heaving at her with their broad backs to prevent her smashing on the rocks but our main dragging force is the two long lines of men attached to the ropes on the left shore they stretch out ahead of us so far that it needs an opera glass to discover whether the leaders are pulling or only soldiering these two long struggling lines are led and directed by a new figure who appears upon this operatic scene it is a comical sheik who stands upon a high rock at one side and lines out the catch lines of a working refrain while the gangs howl and haul in surging chorus nothing could be wilder or more ludicrous in the midst of this roar of rapids and strain of cordage the sheik holds a long staff which he swings like the baton of the leader of an orchestra quite unconscious of the odd figure he cuts against the blue sky he grows more and more excited he swings his arms he shrieks but always in tune and in time with the hauling and the wilder chorus of the cataract men he lifts up his right leg he lifts up his left leg he is in the very ecstasy of the musical conductor displaying his white teeth and raising first one leg and then the other in a delirious swinging motion all the more picturesque on account of his flowing blue robe and his loose white cotton drawers he lifts his leg with a gigantic pull which is enough in itself to draw the boat onward and every time he lifts it the boat gains on the current surely such an orchestra and such a leader was never seen before for the orchestra is scattered over half an acre of ground swaying and pulling and singing in rhythmic show and there is a high wind and a blue sky and rocks and foaming torrents and an african village with palms in the background amid the debris of the great convulsion of nature which has resulted in this chaos slowly we creep up against the stiff boiling stream 
the good Moslems on deck muttering prayers and telling their beads, and finally make the turn and pass the worst eddies, and as we swing around into an oxbow channel to the right, the big sail is again let out and hauled in, and with cheers we float on some rods and come into a quiet shelter, a stage beyond the journey usually made the first day. It is now three o'clock. We have come to the real cataract, to the stiffest pool and the most dangerous passage. The small freight Dahabia obstructs the way, and while this is being hauled ahead, we prepare for the final struggle. The chief cataract is called Bab, Gate, Abu Rabia, from one of Muhammad Ali's captains who some years ago vowed that he would take his Dahabia up it with his own crew and without aid from the cataract people. He lost his boat. It is also sometimes called Bob Inglés, from a young Englishman named Cave, who attempted to swim down it early one morning in imitation of the Nubian swimmers, and was drawn into the whirlpools and not found for days after. For this last struggle, in addition to the other ropes, an enormous cable is bent on, not tied to the bow, but twisted round the cross beams of the forward deck and carried out over the rocks. From the shelter where we lie, we are to push out and take the current at a sharp angle. The water of this main cataract sucks down from both sides above, through a channel perhaps one hundred feet wide, very rapid and with considerable fall, and with such force as to raise a ridge in the middle. To pull up this hill of water is the tug. If the ropes let go, we shall be dashed into a hundred pieces on the rocks below and be swallowed in the whirlpools. It would not be a sufficient compensation for this fate to have this rapid hereafter take our name. The preparations are leisurely made, the lines are laid along the rocks, and the men are distributed. The fastenings are carefully examined. Then we begin to move. There are now four conductors of this gigantic orchestra, the employment of which, as a musical novelty, I respectfully recommend to the next Boston Jubilee each posted on a high rock and waving a stick with a white rag tied to it. It is now four o'clock. An hour has been consumed in raising the curtain for our last act. We are now carefully under way along the rocks which are almost within reach, held tight by the side ropes, but pushed off and slowly urged along by a line of half-naked fellows under the left side, whose backs are against the boat and whose feet walk along the perpendicular ledge. It would take only a sag of the boat, apparently, to crush them. It does not need our eyes to tell us when the bow of the boat noses the swift water. Our sandal, meantime, has carried a line to a rock on the opposite side of the channel, and our sailors haul on this and draw us ahead. But we are held firmly by the shorelines. The boat is never suffered, as I said, to get an inch the advantage, but is always held tight in hand. As we appear at the foot of the rapid, men come riding down it on logs as before, a sort of horseback feed in the boiling water, steering themselves round the eddies and landing below us. One of them swims round to the rock where the line is tied, and looses it as we pass. Another, sitting on the slippery stick and showing the white soles of his black feet, paddles himself about amid the whirling pools. We move so slowly that we have time to enjoy all these details, to admire the deep yellow of the Libyan sand drifted over the rocks at the right, and to cheer a sandal bearing the American flag, which is at this moment shooting the rapids in another channel beyond us, tossed about like a cork. We see the meteor flag flashing out, we lose it behind the rocks, and catch it again appearing below. O oh, star spang! But our own orchestra is in full swing again, the comical sheik begins to swing his arms and his stick back and forth in an increasing measure until his whole body is drawn into the vortex of his enthusiasm, and one leg after the other, by a sort of rhythmic hitch, goes up displaying the white and baggy cotton drawers. The other three conductors join in, and a deafening chorus from two hundred men goes up along the ropes, while we creep slowly or amid the suppressed excitement of those on board who anxiously watch the straining cables and with a running fire of bakshish bakshish from the boys on the rocks close at hand the cable holds the boat nags and jerks at it in vain 
through all the roar and rush we go in, lifted, I think, perceptibly every time the sheik lifts his legs. At the right moment the sail is again shaken down, and the boat at once feels it. It is worth five hundred men. The rope slackened. We are going by the wind against the current. Haste is made to unbend the cable. Line after line is let go until we are held by one alone. The crowd thins out, dropping away with no warning, and before we know that the play is played out, the cataract people have lost all interest in it and are scattering over the black rocks to their homes. A few stop to cheer. The chief conductor is last seen on a rock, swinging the white rag, hurrahing and salaaming and grinning exultation. The last line is cast off, and we round the point and come into smooth but swift water and glide into a calm mind. The noise, the struggle, the tense strain, the uproar of men and waves for four hours are all behind, and hours of keener excitement and enjoyment we have rarely known. At 12.20 we left Aswan. At 4.45 we swung around the rocky bend above the last and greatest rapid. I write these figures, for they will be not without a melancholy interest to those who have spent two or three days or a week in making this passage. End of section 45. This recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org. Northern Africa, Part 1. Legendary History and the Story of Carthage. Historical Note. According to legend, one Pygmalion of Tyre murdered the husband of his sister, Dido. By this crime he had expected to become master of the vast wealth of his brother-in-law. But Dido, seizing her husband's treasure, fled with many followers to northern Africa, near where Tunis now stands. She asked the natives for as much land as a bursa, that is, a bull's hide, would enclose. They agreed, and the wily Phoenicians cut the hide into strips, and upon the ground which these could be stretched to enclose, they built a citadel and named it Bursa in memory of the act. This was the beginning of Carthage, which became the greatest city of northern Africa. It is thought to have been founded about 826 B.C. While the city was yet young, Aeneas and his companions, refugees from the downfall of Troy, landed on the Carthaginian coast and were received by Queen Dito with all honor. When, after enjoying her hospitality for many months, Aeneas refused her hand and sailed away in search of the Hesperian kingdom which had been promised him by the gods, Dito threw herself upon a funeral pile and there met her death. Such is the early story of Carthage, a mingling of fact and legend. The wonderful growth of the city is not legend, however, for it not only extended its dominions in northern Africa, but also won holdings in Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, and Spain. Its greatness aroused the jealousy of Rome, and in 146 BC, after three bitter wars, it was leveled with the ground. Julius Caesar planned to restore it, and this plan was carried out by Augustus in 29 BC. The new city became large and prosperous. In 439 A.D. it was made the capital of the kingdom of the Vandals, but was conquered by Belisarius a century later. In 647 the Arabs destroyed it. And now only a few ruins remain. End of section 46 This recording is in the public domain. Section 47 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Ulysses in the Land of the Lotus Eaters. Tripoli by Homer. Thence for nine days I drifted before the deadly winds along the swarming sea. But on the tenth we touched the land of lotus eaters, men who made food of flowers. So here we went ashore and drew us water, and soon by the swift ships my men prepared their dinner. Then, after we had tasted food and drink, I sent some sailors forth 
to go and learn what men who live by bread dwelt in this land selecting two and joining with them a herald as a third these straightway went and mingled with the lotus eaters and yet the lotus eaters had no thought of harm against our men indeed they gave them lotus to taste but whosoever of them ate the lotus's honeyed fruits wished to bring tidings back no more and never to leave the place but with the lotus eaters there desired to stay to feed on lotus and forget his going home these men i brought back weeping to the ships by force and dragging them under the benches of our hollow ships i bound them fast and bade my other trusty men to hasten and embark on the swift ships that none of them might eat the lotus and forget his going home quickly they came aboard took places at the pins and sitting in order smote the flaming water with their oars end of section 47 this recording is in the public domain section 48 of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dave lance the world story volume 3 egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan Section 48. Aeneas at Carthage. By Virgil. After Troy and Asia Minor had been overthrown by the Greeks, Aeneas, a Trojan prince, led a company of refugees over the Mediterranean Sea in search of a new home. They were driven by a storm upon the shores of northern Africa, where Queen Dido reigned. She had fled from Tyre and from a wicked brother who had slain her husband and she was now making for herself a new kingdom. Aeneas, by favor of his goddess mother Venus, was hidden, together with his companion Achates, in a mist which veiled them from the eyes of others. So says the ancient story. The Editor But therewithal they speed their way, as led the road along, and now they scale a spreading hill that o'er the town is hung, and looking downward thereupon, hath all the burg in face. Aeneas marvels how that world was once a peasant's place. He marvels at the gates, the roar and rattle of the waves. Hot heart, the Tyrians speed the work, and some the ramparts raise. Some pile the burg high, some with hand roll stones up o'er the ground. Some choose a place for dwelling house, and draw a trench around. Some choose the laws and lords of doom, the holy senate choose. These thereaway the havens dig, and deep adown sink those the founding of the theatre walls, or cleave the living stone in pillars huge, one day to show full fair the scene upon. As in new summer, neath the sun, the bees are wont to speed their labour in the flowery fields, wherever now they lead the well-grown offspring of their race, or when the cells they store with flowing honey, till fulfilled of sweets they hold no more, or take the loads of newcomers, or, as a watch well set, drive off the lazy herd of drones that they no dwelling get, well speeds the work, and timey sweet the honey's odor is. Well favored of the fates are ye, whose walls arise in bliss, Aeneas cries, a looking o'er the housetop spread below, and wonderful to tell in tale, hedged round with cloud doth go. The two men come to a grove within the town, and behold, on the walls of a temple standing in the grove are representations of the Trojan battles and the heroic deeds of Trojan heroes. The Editor But while Aeneas, Dardan Lord, beholds the marvels there, and all amazed, stands moving naught with eyes in one set stare, lo, cometh Dido, very queen of fairest fashion wrought, by youths close thronging all about, unto the temple brought. Yea, e'en as on Eurotus' rim, or Synthus' ridges high, Diana leadeth dance about. A thousandfold an eye the following oreads gather round, with shoulder quiver hung, 
she overbears the goddesses her swift feet fair among, and great Latona's silent breast the joys of Godhead touch. Lo, such was Dido. Joyously she bore herself in such amidst them, eager for the work, and ordered rule to come. Then through the goddess's door she passed, and midmost, neath the dome, high raised upon a throne she sat, with weapons hedged about, and doomed, and fashioned laws for men, and fairly sifted out, and dealt their share of toil to them, or drew the lot as happed. There suddenly Aeneas sees amidst the concourse wrapped Antheus, Sergestus, and the strong Cloanthus draw an eye, and other Teucrians, whom the whirl, wild, black, all utterly, had scattered into other lands afar across the sea. Amazed he stood, nor stricken was Achates less than he. By joy, by fear, they hungered sore hand unto hand to set, but doubts of dealings that might be stirred in their hearts as yet. So, lurking, cloaked in hollow cloud, they note what things betide their fellows there, and on what shore the ships they manned may bide, and whence they come, for chosen out of all the ships they bear bidding of peace, and crying out, thus templeward they fare. But now, when they were entered in, and gained the grace of speech, from placid heart Ileonus the elder gan beseech. O queen, to whom hath Jove here given a city new to raise, and with thy justice to draw rein on men of willful ways, we wretched Trojans, tossed about by winds o'er every main, pray thee, forbid it from our ships the dreadful fiery bane. Spare, pious folk, and look on us with favoring, kindly eyes. We are not come with sword to waste the Libyan families nor drive adown unto the strand the plunder of the strong. No such high hearts, such might of mind, to vanquished folk belong. There is a place, Hesperia called of Greeks in days that are, an ancient land, a fruitful soil, a mighty land in war. Enotrian folk first tilled the land, whose sons, as rumors run, now call it naught but Italy, from him who led them on. And thitherward our course was turned, when sudden, stormy, tumbling seas Orion rose on us, and wholly scattered us abroad with fierce blasts from the south, drave us, wind-swept, by shallows blind, to straits with wayless mouth. But to thy shores we few have swum, and so betake us here. What men among men are ye then? What country soil may bear such savage ways? Ye grudge us, then, the welcome of your sand, and fall to arms, and gainsay us a tide-washed strip of strand? But if men-folk, and wars of men, ye wholly said it not, yet deem the gods bear memory still of good and evil wrought. Aeneas was the king of us, no juster was there one, no better lover of the gods, none more in battle shone. And if the fates have saved that man, if earthly air he drink, nor neath the cruel deadly shades his fallen body shrink, naught need we fear, nor ye repent us drive in kindly deed with us. We have in Sicily fair cities to our need, and fields we have, Acestes high of Trojan blood is come. Now suffer us our shattered ships in haven to bring home, to cut us timber in thy woods, and shave us oars anew. And if the Italian crews to us, if friends and king are due, to Italy and Latium then, full merry when we on. But if, dear father of our folk, hope of thy health be gone, and thee the Libyan waters have, nor hope Eulus give, then the Sicanian shores at least, and seats wherein to live, whence hither came we, and the king Acestes let us seek. So spake he, and the others made, as they the same would speak, the Dardan folk with murmuring mouth. But Dido, with her head hung down, in few words answer gave, Let fear fall from you, Teucrian men, and set your cares aside. Hard fortune yet constraineth me in this my realm untried to hold such heed with guard to watch my marches up and down. Who knoweth not Aeneas folk? Who knoweth not Troy town, the valor? and the men, and all the flame of such a war. Nay, surely not so dull as this the souls within us are. Nor turns the sun from Tyrian town, so far off yoking steed. 
So whether ye Hesperia great, and Saturn's acres need, or rather unto Eric's turn, and King Acestes' shore, safe, holpen, will I send you forth, and speed you with my store. Yea, and moreover, have ye will in this my land to bide, this city that I build is yours. Here leave your ships to ride. Trojan and Tyrian no two wise at hands of me shall fare, and would indeed the self-same king himself, Aeneas, with us were, driven by that self-same southern gale. But sure, men will I send, and bid them search through Libya, from end to utmost end, lest cast forth anywhere he stray by town or forest part. Father Aeneas thereupon high lifted up his heart, nor stout Achates less, and both were fain the cloud to break, and to Aeneas first of all the leal Achates spake. O goddess-born, what thought hereof ariseth in thy mind? All safe thou seest thy ships, thy folk fair welcomed dost thou find. One is away, whom we ourselves saw sunken in the deep, but all things else the promised word thy mother gave us keep. Lo, even as he spake the word, the cloud that wrapped them cleaves, and in the open space of heaven no dusk behind it leaves. And there Aeneas stood, and shone among the daylight clear, with face and shoulders of a god, for loveliness of hair his mother breathed upon her son, and purple light of youth, and joyful glory of the eyes, e'en as in very sooth the hand gives ivory goodliness, or when the parian stone or silver with the handicraft of yellow gold is done. And therewithal unto the queen doth he begin to speak, unlooked for of all men. Lo, here the very man ye seek, Trojan Aeneas, caught away from Libyan seas of late. Thou, who alone of toils of Troy hath been compassionate, who takest us, the leavings poor of Danaean sword, outworn with every hap of earth and sea, of every good forlorn, to city and to house of thine, to thank thee for thy worth, Dido, my might may compass not. Nay, scattered o'er the earth, the Darden folk, for what thou dost, may never give thee need. But if somewhere a godhead is the righteous man to heed, if justice is, or any soul to note the right it wrought, may gods give thee due reward. What joyful ages brought thy days to birth? What mighty ones gave such a one to-day? Now while the rivers seaward run, and while the shadows stray o'er hollow hills, and while the pole the stars is pasturing wide, still shall thine honour and thy name, still shall thy praise abide, what land soever calleth me. Therewith his right hand sought his very friend Ileonus, his left Serestus caught, and then the others, Gyas strong, Cloanthus strong in fight. Sidonian Dido marvelled much, first at the hero's sight, then marvelled at the haps he had, and so such word did say. O goddess-born, what fate is this that ever dogs thy way with such great perils? What hath yoked thy life to this wild shore? And art thou that Aeneas then, whom holy Venus bore unto Anchises, Trojan lord, by Phrygian Simois wave? Of Teucer unto Sidon come a memory yet I have, who, driven from out his fatherland, was seeking new abode by Belus' help. But Belus then, my father, overrode Cyprus the rich, and held the same as very conquering lord. So from that tide I knew of Troy, and bitter fate's award. I knew of those Pelasgian kings, yea, and I knew thy name. He, then a foeman, added praise to swell the Teucrian fame, and oft was glad to deem himself of ancient Teucer's line. So hasten now to enter in neath roofs of me and mine, me, too, a fortune such as yours, me, tossed by many a toil, hath pleased to give a biding place at last upon this soil. Learned in ill haps, full wise am I, unhappy men to aid. Such tale she told, and therewith led to house full kingly maid Aeneas, bidding therewithal the gods with gifts to grace. Nor yet their fellows she forgot upon the sea-beat place, but sendeth them a twenty bulls, an hundred bristling backs of swine, an hundred fatted lambs, whereof his ewe none lacks, and gifts and gladness of the god. Meanwhile the gleaming house within with kingly pomp is dight, and in the midmost of the hall a banquet they prepare. Cloths labored o'er with handicraft, and purple proud is there, 
Great is the silver on the board, and carven out of gold the mighty deeds of father folk. A long-drawn tale is told. End of section 48 This recording is in the public domain. Section 49 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Aeneas at the Court of Dido by Pierre Narcisse Guerin, France, 1774-1833 to Painting, page 276 The scene here pictured is that in which Queen Dido bids Aeneas tell her the story of the fall of Troy and his seven years of wandering over land and sea. All are silent and gaze upon him eagerly. O oh, queen, he said, you are bidding me revive sorrows that cannot be fully expressed. You bid me rehearse how the Greeks overwhelmed the Trojan kingdom. I saw this, I was part of the conflict, but no Greek, not even one of the ferocious followers of Odysseus, could tell such a tale without tears. And yet, if you wish so earnestly to know my misfortune and the last struggle of Troy, then, even though I shudder to relate them and would fain escape the suffering, I will begin. From the terrace on which they sit may be seen the sea and the harbour of Carthage, its promontory crowned with a lighthouse, while in front is the temple of Neptune with a statue of the god bearing his trident. Dido reclines upon a couch, her arm about the young Ascanius, son of Aeneas. Her sister Anna leans upon the arm of the couch, and Aeneas begins his tale. End of section 49 this recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Chapin, Section 50, The Cutting of the Aqueduct, by Gustav Flaubert. In 241 BC, the First Punic War came to an end, but Carthage was by no means free from her troubles. The greater part of her soldiers were barbarians, lured from distant lands by the promise of pay and of pillage. As her treasury was exhausted, she proposed to the troops that only a part of what was due them should be paid. Naturally, the mercenaries or hired soldiers rebelled. They chose Spendius and Matho for their commanders, and induced some of the native African tribes to join them. For a time Carthage was in extreme danger, and it was not until after three years of warfare that Himilcar succeeded in overpowering them. The Editor the Carthaginians rejoined their lines and entered the enormous gate that resoundingly reclosed behind them. It did not yield. The barbarians plunged and battered against it, and during the lapse of some minutes the entire length of the army presented an oscillation that became gentler and gentler, and at last entirely subsided. The Carthaginians, having stationed soldiers on the aqueduct, commenced hurling stones, balls, and beams. Spendius averred that it was useless to persist. Therefore they pitched their encampment at a greater distance from the walls, fully resolved to besiege Carthage. Meanwhile the rumor of the war had traveled beyond the confines of the Punic dominion, and from the pillars of Hercules, as far as the other side of Cyrene, the herdsmen guarding their herds dreamed of it, and the caravans talked about it at night in the starlight. This grand Carthage, mistress of the sea, splendid as the sun, awful as a god, had found men who dared to attack her. Even her downfall had frequently been reported, 
and all had believed it probable, as all were longing for it. The subject peoples, tributary villages, allied provinces, and independent tribes, those who cursed her for her tyranny, or who were jealous of her power, or who coveted her wealth, the bravest had very quickly joined themselves to the mercenaries. The defeat at the Makar, however, prevented all the others. Finally, they regained confidence, and gradually making advances, had come nearer. And now the inhabitants of the eastern regions had posted themselves in the sand hills of Hypia, on the other side of the gulf. As soon as the barbarians appeared, they showed themselves. These were not the Libyans from the environs of Carthage, who had for a long time constituted the third army, but the nomads from the plateau of Barca, bandits of the Cape of Fiscus, and the promontory of Dern, and those from Fazania and from Marmarica. They had crossed the desert, sustaining themselves by drinking from the brackish wells built of camel's bones. The Zuises, covered with ostrich plumes, had come in their quadrigia, the Garamantes, masked with black veils, riding far back on their painted mares, others mounted on asses, on onagers, on zebras, or on buffaloes, and some dragged the roofs of their cabins, shaped like a shallop, with their families and idols. There were also Ammonians, whose limbs were wrinkled by the hot water of the fountains, the Atrontes, who cursed the sun, the Troglodytes, who laughingly interred their dead, under branches of trees, and the hideous Ozians, who ate locusts, the Acrimacades, who ate lice, and the Gysantes, painted over with vermilion, and who ate monkeys, all were ranged on the seacoast in a great, straight line. They advanced in succession, like whirlwinds of sand raised by the wind. In the middle of the isthmus their crowd stopped. The mercenaries established before them near the walls did not wish to move. Then from the direction of Ariana appeared men from the west, the people of Numidia, for, in fact, Nar Havas only governed the Massilians and furthermore, a custom permitting them, after a reverse, to abandon their king. They had reassembled on the Zanius. Then at their first movement Hamilcar had made, they had crossed it. First were seen running all the hunters of the Maelthet Ball, and of the Garafos, clothed in lions' skins and driving with the shafts of their spikes, little, thin horses with long manes. Following these came the Gaetulians, encased in breastplates made of serpents' skin, in the Ferugians wearing tall crowns made of wax and resin. These were followed by the Conians, Macars, and Tilibares, each holding two javelins and a round buckler of hippopotamus hide. They halted at the base of the catacombs, near the first pools of the lagoon. But when the Libyans had moved off, on the ground that they had occupied, there appeared, like a cloud, lying flat on the earth, a multitude of negroes. They had come from White Harush and Black Harush, from the desert of Agula, and even from the vast country of Gazimba, which was four months' journey to the south of the Garamantes, and even more distant. In spite of their redwood ornaments, the filth on their black skins made them resemble mulberries that had been rolled a long time in the dust. They wore breeches made from the fibers of bark, tunics of dried grass, and on their heads the muzzles of wild animals. They howled like wolves, shaking triangles ornamented with dangling rings, and brandished cowtails on the end of a pole by way of banners. Behind the Numidians, the Marusians, and the Gatulians thronged the yellow men who were scattered over the country beyond Tagir in the cedar forest. Catskin quivers beat over their shoulders and they led in leashes enormous dogs as tall as asses, which never barked. In short, as if Africa had not sufficiently emptied itself, and in order to gather up more furies, they had even recruited the lowest races. In the rear of all the others could be seen men with profiles of animals, who laughed in an idiotic manner. Wretches ravaged by hideous diseases, deformed pygmies, mulattoes of doubtful sex, albinos blinking their pink eyes in the sunlight, all stammering unintelligible sounds, and putting a finger in their mouths to signify their hunger. The medley of weapons was not less confused than the people, or their apparel. Not a deadly invention that could not be found here, from wooden poignards, stone battle-axes, ivory tridents, two long sabres toothed like saws, slender and made of a pliable sheet of copper. 
they wielded cutlasses divided in many branches like antelopes' horns they carried bill hooks attached to cords iron triangles clubs and stilettos the ethiopians of bombotus hid in their hair tiny poisoned darts many had brought stones and sacks others who were empty-handed gnashed their teeth a continual surging swayed this multitude dromedaries daubed with tar like the hulls of ships upset the women who carried their children on their hips provisions were spilled out of their baskets and in walking one stepped on morsels of rock salt packages of gum rotten dates and guru nuts sometimes on a bosom alive with burman could be seen suspended from a fine cord a diamond a fabulous gem worth an entire empire which satraps had coveted the majority of these people did not know what they desired a fascination a curiosity impelled them the nomads who had never seen a city were frightened by the vast shadows cast by the massive walls now the isthmus was obscured by this multitude of men and the long span of tents resembling cabins during an inundation spread out to the first lines of the other barbarians who were streaming with metal and symmetrically established on the two flanks of the aqueduct the carthaginians were still in terror of those who had already arrived when they perceived coming straight towards the city like monsters and like edifices with their shafts weapons cordage articulations capitals and carapaces the engines sent for the siege by the tyrian cities sixty carabalistas eighty onjers thirty scorpions fifty tolentones twelve rams and three gigantic catapults with the capacity of throwing rocks weighing fifteen talents masses of men clutched at their base pushed pulled and toiled to propel the engines that quivered and shook at each step thus they came in front of the walls but it would still require many days to complete the preparations for the siege the mercenaries forewarned by their previous defeats did not wish to risk themselves in fruitless engagements and on neither one side nor the other was there any hurry as all knew that a terrible action was about to ensue which would result either in victory or complete extermination carthage could hold out for a long time her broad walls offered a series of salient and re-entering angles an arrangement full of advantages for repelling an assault however on the side of the catacombs a portion of the wall had crumbled and during obscure nights between the disjointed blocks could be seen the lights in the dens of malqua in certain places they overlooked the top of the ramparts and here lived those who had taken for new wives the women of the mercenaries chased by matho out of the camp when the women saw again their own people their hearts melted and they waved from afar long scarves then they came in the darkness to chat with the soldiers through the rift in the walls and the grand council was apprised one morning that they had all taken flight some had crawled between the stones others more intrepid had descended by ropes spendius finally resolved to accomplish his cherished project the war by keeping him at a distance had up to the present debarred him from it and since they had returned before carthage it seemed to him that the townsmen suspected his enterprise but soon they diminished the sentinels on the aqueduct as they did not possess too many guards for the defence of the ensante during many days the former slave practised aiming arrows at the flamingos standing on the lake shore then one evening when the moon shone bright he entreated matho to have lighted during the middle of the night a huge bonfire of straw and cause all his men simultaneously to utter shrieks then taking Xarxes, he went off by the shore of the gulf in the direction of tunis when abreast of the last arches they turned back going straight towards the aqueduct as the road was exposed they advanced creeping along up to the base of the pillars the sentinels on the platform patrolled tranquilly high flames darted up clarions were sounded the soldiers in the watch-towers believing that it was an assault rushed toward carthage one man remained he appeared as a black figure against the dome of the sky the moonlight was behind him and his disproportionate shadow fell afar on the plain like a moving obelisk they waited until he was exactly in front of them Xarxes seized his sling but spendius stayed him actuated by prudence 
or ferocity and whispered no the whirring of the ball will make a noise i will do it then he strung his bow with all his might and supporting the end against his left instep took aim and the fatal arrow flew the man did not fall he disappeared if he were wounded we should hear him said spendius and he sprang fleetly up story after story as he had done the first time by the aid of the harpoon and cord and when he reached the top beside the corpse he let the cord fall the balearian fastened to it a pick and mallet and returned the trumpets no longer sounded all had subsided into perfect quiet spendius had lifted one of the stones entered the water and replaced the stone over himself estimating the distance by paces he came exactly to the spot where he had previously noticed a slanting fissure and for three hours in fact till morning he worked in a continuous furious way breathing with great difficulty through the interstices of the superior stones assailed with violent pains twenty times he believed he was dying at last a cracking was heard an enormous stone bounded on the inferior arches and rolled down to the bottom and all at once a cataract an entire river of great volume fell as from the sky into the plain the aqueduct cut in the middle was emptying itself this was the death of carthage and the victory of the barbarians in an instant the carthaginians aroused in terror appeared on the walls the house tops and all the temples the barbarians gave vent to joyous shouts danced around the vast waterfall in delirium and in the extravagance of their delight wetted their heads in the rushing water at the summit of the aqueduct a man was perceived wearing a torn brown tunic leaning over the edge his hands upon his hips gazing beneath him to the very bottom as though astonished at his own work then he stood erect traversing the horizon with a proud impressive air which seemed to say behold this is all my work applause burst from the barbarians at last the carthaginians comprehended the cause of their disaster and howled in despair spendius ran from end to end of the platform distracted by pride raising his arms like the driver of a victorious chariot in the olympian games End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Section 51 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 51. The Fall of Carthage. By Rev. Alfred J. Church. 146 B.C. According to legend, Carthage was founded by Queen Dido in the 9th century B.C. The city prospered, and by the middle of the 4th century before Christ, the Carthaginians ruled the northern coast of Africa from the Pillars of Hercules, or the Straits of Gibraltar, to what is now Tripoli. Their commercial settlements stretched along this whole coast, but their special domain was that part of the shore which is nearest Sicily. Here were numerous towns and also their capital city. For many years the Romans had been jealous of the rising greatness of Carthage, and in 264 B.C. war broke out between the two countries. After more than a century of warfare, broken twice by some years of peace, Carthage was utterly destroyed. The Editor the actual fortifications of the upper city did not offer any serious resistance to the assailants. They were of extreme antiquity and were not only greatly decayed, but were inadequate to meet, even had they been in the best condition, the improved methods of attack which had been introduced since the time of their erection. Some attempt had been made to put them into repair within the last few months, but to very little purpose. Nothing short of a complete reconstruction would have been of any practical use. The Roman battering rams had not been at work for a day before it became evident that several breaches would speedily be made in the walls. In fact, so many weak spots had been revealed that even the most determined and powerful garrison could not have hoped to make them all good. In the course of the night the whole line was evacuated. Still, Carthage was not to be taken without a desperate struggle. Twice already had her mother city Tyre defended herself with fury against assailants of overwhelming strength. Footnote. 
against Nebuchadnezzar in 598 B.C., and against Alexander in 331. End footnote. And the world was to see a still more terrible scene of rage and madness some two centuries later, when the Hebrew people defended its last stronghold, Jerusalem, against the legions of Rome. The Carthaginians were now to show themselves not unworthy of these famous kinsfolk. The upper city was penetrated by three streets, all of them built on steep inclines and converging on the summit of the hill. On this the citadel stood, itself crowned by the famous temple of Esculapius. This was built on a rock, three sides of which displayed a sheer descent of some sixty feet, while the fourth was ascended by a long flight of steps. The three streets were built to suit the oriental taste, perhaps we should rather say the oriental need, which prefers shade to the circulation of air and light. They were so narrow that the inhabitants of opposite houses, the houses commonly inclined outward, could almost shake hands from their windows. The houses were not of equal height, but they were all lofty, sometimes having as many as seven or eight stories. At the back of these main thoroughfares was a wilderness of lanes and alleys, consisting for the most part of smaller houses, with now and then a paved yard or small garden. Up these streets the Romans had to force their way. Almost every house was a fortress which had to be separately attacked and separately taken. The first danger that had to be encountered was a shower of tiles and bricks from the roofs and upper stories. These missiles, heavy themselves and falling with tremendous force from the lofty buildings, would have been terribly destructive, had not the assailants protected themselves by the formation of the testudo, or tortoise. This was made by the men ranging their shields over their heads in a close impenetrable array, under cover of which they broke down the doors of house after house. Sometimes even the testudo reeled under the shock of some more than usually heavy mass. More than once it was actually broken when the defending party contrived to detach and send down upon it the whole of a parapet. Whenever this happened, no small loss of life was the result. When an entrance had been forced into the house, every story became the scene of a fresh conflict. Driven at last to the roof, the defenders would sometimes prefer to hurl themselves down to the street below, rather than fall into the hands of the enemy. Some would take a desperate leap across the space that separated them from the houses opposite. Others crossed on bridges of planks or doors which they hastily made, or in some cases had prepared in anticipation. It is needless to say that a conflict of such a kind was fought with the greatest ferocity. It was a struggle for the most part between a people and an army. The inhabitants, seldom if ever protected by armor, and furnished with the weapons that chance supplied, often indeed reduced to nothing more effective than sticks or household implements, fought desperately against well-protected, well-armed, well-disciplined men. The women were even more frenzied than the men. Driven to bay, they flew like wildcats at the Romans, and bit and scratched till they were slain or disabled. There was no question of quarter. It was not even asked. The assailants, as they slowly advanced, winning their way yard by yard, left a lifeless desolation behind them, with the dead lying as they had fallen, on every staircase, and in every chamber. This battle of the streets lasted with unabated fury for six days. The besiegers, of course, fought in relays. There were three detachments, and each had its regular time of service, four hours twice in the day, for, of course, no cessation of the attack was possible. One man allowed himself no rest, and this one man was Scipio. During the whole of the six days he never slept, or at least never composed himself to sleep, for nature would sometimes assert itself untiring as was the spirit which dominated his physical frame and he could not help a brief slumber as he sat at his meals. These he took as chance gave him the opportunity. They were hurried repasts of the simplest kind, a piece of dried flesh, a crust of bread or a biscuit, with now and then a bunch of raisins. His drink was rigidly limited to water, for in battle he always acted on the principle which made Hector refuse the wine cup which his mother proffered him in an interval of battle. Footnote. Far hence be Bacchus' gifts, the chief rejoined. Inflaming wine, pernicious to mankind, unnerves the limbs, and dulls the noble mind. Iliad, Pope, 6. In footnote. At sunset on the sixth day the upper city was practically held by the Romans. 
nothing but the citadel remained to be taken, and that was so arduous an undertaking that the attack was necessarily postponed till the troops had had some rest. But the spirit of the Carthaginians was at last broken. Just as the troops told off for the first assault had finished mustering, and before the trumpets had sounded the signal for the advance, a procession, headed by a herald who carried a flag of truce in his hand, was seen to be descending the steps that led from the temple of Esculapius. Lost to sight for a short time as it came under cover of the outer wall of the citadel, it next became visible as it issued from one of the gates. Scipio, who was about to address his troops, went forward to meet the newcomers. Their leader, whose style and title were given by the herald as chief priest of the temple of Esculapius, addressed him, his words being interpreted by a Roman prisoner. Leader of the armies of Rome, so ran the speech, the gods have given thy country the final victory over her rival. Four centuries ago Rome felt it to be an honor to be acknowledged by Carthage as an ally on equal terms. Footnote. A treaty was made between Rome and Carthage in the year 509 B.C. End footnote. Since then there has been continued rivalry and frequent war between the two nations. More than once it has seemed likely that the fates had decreed that the seat of empire should be in Africa rather than in Italy. But this was not their will. We have long been convinced that we were not to rule. Now we perceive that we are not even to be permitted to exist. But though it is necessary for the honor, if not for the safety of Rome, that Carthage should be destroyed, it is not necessary that a multitude of innocent persons whose sole offense is to have been born within the walls of a doomed city should also perish. There are some, a few thousands out of many, who have, it is true, committed the offense of defending their country. These also implore your mercy. That they can resist your attack they acknowledge to be impossible. But they can at least claim this merit, that by a prompt surrender they will save the lives of some of your soldiers. Your nation, man of Rome, has been ready beyond all others to show mercy to the conquered. And your family, Scipio, has been conspicuous in this as in all other virtues. Be worthy, we beseech you, of your country, your house, and yourself. It was without a moment's hesitation that Scipio replied to this harangue, nor had he to use the services of an interpreter. With that indefatigable energy which distinguished him, he had employed the scanty leisure allowed by his duties to learn the Carthaginian language, of which at the beginning of the siege he had been as ignorant as were the rest of his countrymen. I will not use many words, for time presses and there is much to be done. The multitude of unarmed persons may come forth without fear. Their lives are assured to them. Nor do we bear any enmity against brave men who have fought against us. They shall not be harmed. I accept only from my offer of mercy those who have betrayed their country by deserting it. The answer had scarcely been spoken before a huge multitude to whom its purport had probably been communicated by some preconcerted signal poured out from the gates. Seldom has a more piteous sight been seen. With faces wan with famine, and clothed for the most part in squalid rags, the long lines of old men, women, and children defiled before the Roman general, as he stood surrounded by his staff. True to his gentle and kindly nature, he busied himself in making provision for their immediate wants. The whole number, there were fifty thousand in all, a great crowd, it is true, but pitiably small in comparison with the supposed total of non-combatants, when the siege began, was divided into companies, each of which was assigned to the commissariat department of one or other of the legions. At the same time instructions were given to the officers in charge of the stores that their immediate necessities, and many of them were actually starving, should be relieved. The non-combatants thus disposed of, the soldiers that had surrendered followed. There may have been some six thousand in all, of whom five-sixths were mercenaries, one-sixth only native Carthaginians. They were in much better case than the rest of the population. In fact, as far as provisions were concerned, they had not been subjected to any hardship. The mercenaries had, for the most part, an indifferent look. It was depressing, doubtless, to have been serving for now three years an unsuccessful master, and to have missed the good pay which they might have earned elsewhere. But this was one of the chances of their profession, and they might hope to recoup themselves for their loss by another and more fortunate speculation. The Carthaginian minority were in a different temper. There was no future for them. 
their country was gone and if the love of life which asserts itself even over the fiercest and bitterest pride had bent their haughty temper to supplicate for mercy it could do nothing more each man as he passed in front of the general laid down his arms upon the ground these again were piled in heaps to be carried off in due time to the stores in the roman camp this business was just completed when a solitary figure was seen to issue from one of the gates in the citadel walls and hurriedly to approach the roman lines as he ran he was struck by a missile from the walls the blow leveled him to the ground but he regained his feet in the course of one or two minutes and hastened on though with a somewhat limping gait it was observed that he was dressed as a slave and as he came nearer that his face was so closely muffled that his features could not be recognized Nevertheless, his figure, which was short and corpulent, seemed to many to be familiar. Reaching the Roman lines, he threw himself at Scipio's feet, caught him by the knees, and in broken Greek begged for his life. The general, stretching forth his hand, raised him from the ground. It was Hasdrubal, the commander-in-chief of the armies of Carthage. A murmur of disgust at his poltroonery ran through the ranks here and there the kinsmen or comrades of the unhappy prisoners whom he had done to death in so barbarous a fashion a few months before gave vent to more menacing expressions of anger scipio silenced these manifestations of feeling by an imperative gesture of command your life is spared he said see that you make a due return for the boon it must not be supposed that the roman general was disposed to regard with any kind of leniency asdrubal's baseness and barbarity it was from policy that he spared the miserable creature's life. In the first place it was the custom from which it would be injudicious to depart, to make the king or chief general of a conquered people an essential part of the triumph which would celebrate the victory. Secondly, he was aware that the prisoner would be useful in many ways, that there were important matters about which he could give the best, or it might be the only available information. As to the boon of life, it seemed to his own noble nature to be a very small thing indeed, for himself he felt that had such a situation been possible he would far sooner have died than survive to face such shame and ignominy the craven clinging to life which dominates such mean natures as asdrubal's was simply incomprehensible to scipio but if he despised asdrubal while he spared him there were others among the carthaginian leaders for whom he felt a genuine admiration and respect and to whom he was willing to offer honourable terms of surrender where he asked hasdrubal are your colleagues in command and the chief magistrates they are in the temple of asculapius replied the carthaginian think you that they will be willing to surrender they are brave men and have done their best and they shall be honourably treated i know not what they intend muttered the fugitive with as much shame as it was in his nature to feel i will at least try them said scipio and he advanced towards the citadel followed by some of his staff Hasdrubal, much against his will, was constrained to accompany them. A number of figures could be seen on the roof of the temple, which, as has been explained, formed the summit of the citadel. As soon as he came within earshot of the place, he bade one of the prisoners step forward and communicate his ultimatum to what may be called the garrison of the temple. Scipio offers to all free-born Carthaginian citizens life on honorable terms. To all those who have deserted he promises a fair trial, so that if they can show any just cause for having left their country, even they may not despair of safety. To this appeal no answer was made. After a while, as Scipio and his attendants waited for reply, thin curls of smoke were seen to rise from the temple. Next a woman, leading a young boy by either hand, approached the edge of the roof she was clothed in a flowing robe of crimson confined at the waist by a broad golden girdle her long hair which streamed far below her waist was bound round her temples by a circlet of diamonds that flashed splendidly in the sun by baal cried the carthaginian prisoner who delivered scipio's message it is the lady salamo herself who is it say you asked scipio the lady salamo answered the man the wife of my lord the general. It was indeed the wife of Hasdrubal. Man of Rome, she began in a clear penetrating voice which made itself heard far and wide addressing herself to Scipio, who was conspicuous in the scarlet cloak worn by generals commanding armies. Man of Rome, 
to thee there comes no blame from gods or men carthage was the enemy of your country and thou hast conquered it but on this hasdrubal this traitor who hath been false to his fatherland to his gods to me whose shame it is to have been his wife and to his children may the gods of carthage wreak their vengeance and thou scipio i charge thee fail not to be their instrument she then turned to hasdrubal villain she cried and liar and coward as for me and these children we shall find a fit burial in this fire and as she spoke a great flame sprung up for a moment among the gathering clouds of smoke but thou that wast the chiefest man in carthage what dishonourable grave wilt thou find this only i know that neither thy children nor i will live to see thy disgrace turning from the wretched man with a gesture of contempt she drew a dagger from her girdle and plunged it into the heart first of one and then of the other of the two children who stood at her side then flinging the bloody weapon from her she leaped into the midst of the flames by which this time were rapidly gaining the mastery over the whole building all her companions shared her fate the carthaginian nobles were too proud to live under the sway of rome the deserters were conscious of their guilt or distrusted the justice of a roman tribunal anyhow not a single individual out of the desperate band to which scipio had addressed his appeal availed himself of the opportunity end of section fifty one this recording is in the public domain recording by philip gould section fifty two of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org northern africa part two life and customs in northern africa historical note Christianity was promptly introduced into northern Africa, and for some years the country was a stronghold of the church. Tertullian, Cyprian, and Augustine, bishop of Hippo, were among the Christian leaders of those centuries. Here, too, it was that the first translation of the Bible into Latin was made. In the seventh century, however, the Mohammedans overran the land, and in less than a hundred years they had made converts of the greater part of the native tribes. Early in the 8th century, the Moors crossed from Africa into Spain and soon conquered that country. When finally driven out, they withdrew to northern Africa and took up the business of piracy, first in revenge against the Christians, but later as a lucrative profession. Vessels passing through the Mediterranean Sea were in imminent danger of being seized and having their crews held for ransom in most revolting slavery it had become the custom to pay tribute or redemption money, and this the United States was forced to do for some years for lack of a navy. In 1815, however, a navy had been prepared. Decatur was sent against the day, and soon brought him to terms and put an end to the piracy. During the 19th century and the early part of the 20th, control of Algeria and Tunis was gradually assumed by France, and a protectorship over Morocco jointly established by France and Spain. Tripoli was a vilayet, or province of the Ottoman Empire, until 1911, when it was seized by Italy. End of section 52. This recording is in the public domain. Section 53 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Scott, Cheltenham, England. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tapan. Section 53. How the Barbary Pirates Learned to Respect the American Flag, 1815, by John Back McMaster. During 17 years, the United States had been paying an annual tribute to the day, but as the Moors computed time by the moon, while all Christian people reckoned it by the sun, the Moorish year was the shorter, and this difference in the course of the 17 years amounted to some six months in favour of the day. 
According to his mode of measuring time, he was therefore entitled to $27,000 more than he had received, and for this sum a demand was made and instantly complied with by Mr. Tobias Lear, the American consul. It now became necessary to find a new cause of complaint, which the day accordingly did. The stores, he said, sent by the United States in place of money were bad in quality, and notified Mr. Lear to depart at once. The consul might possibly have quieted the day even at this point, but unhappily two ships loaded with cables and anchors, powder and shot and naval stores, a present from Great Britain, reached Algiers, and the day sent forth his corsairs armed and equipped by England to prey on American commerce in the Mediterranean. There was little to be destroyed, yet they made prize of the brig Edwin of Salem, sold the crew of ten men into slavery, and dragged an American citizen from the deck of a Spanish vessel. While the war with England lasted, these outrages had to be endured, but five days after peace was proclaimed, Madison asked that war be declared against Algiers. Congress willingly complied, and two fine squadrons in charge of two gallant seamen was soon assembled at Boston and New York. Captain William Bainbridge commanded that in the port of Boston. Captain Stephen Decatur commanded the fleet at New York. He was first to get under way, and with ten vessels mounting 210 guns, put to sea on May 20. A short run across the Atlantic by way of the Azores brought the squadron off the coast of Portugal, where a sharp lookout was kept for the enemy. The foe was indeed not to be despised, for the Algerine fleet consisted of five frigates, six sloops of war, and a schooner, carrying, all told, 360 guns. The crews were well drilled and thoroughly trained. The vessels were well equipped with every appliance of modern naval warfare and, what was quite as important, were commanded by Rice Hamida, the terror of the Mediterranean. Though every ship fell in with was spoken, nothing was heard of the enemy till June 15, when Tangier was reached, and Decatur learned from the American consul that the Algerian admiral had passed the straits two days before in the 46-gun frigate Mashuda. Not a moment was lost in giving chase, and that same day the fleet anchored off Gibraltar, where Decatur was told that the vessels he sought were to be found off Cape Gata. As one dispatch boat had been detected making for the Cape to notify Rice Amida of the presence of the American squadron, and another had been seen making all sail toward Algiers, Decatur again weighed anchor without loss of time and, standing up the Mediterranean before a good breeze, sighted the Mashuda in the early dawn of June 17. She was lying too off the coast and as everything about her showed that her commander had no suspicion of the character of the squadron, Decatur gave the order, Do nothing to excite suspicion, and bore steadily down upon her. But the order was misunderstood by the officers on the constellation, who, when about a mile from the enemy, hoisted the American flag. Every other ship instantly displayed the English colours, but the Moor was not deceived, and crowding on all sail he made for Algiers, till the constellation, which happened to be the nearest, opened fire at long range and placed several of her shot upon his deck when he came about and headed for Cartagena. Decatur in the Guerriere then bore down to close with him, and, reserving fire till his ship just cleared the yard arms of the Mashuda, he poured in two broadsides in quick succession. The slaughter was dreadful. Rice Amida was killed and the deck covered with dead and wounded. Yet the Moors would not surrender, but, putting up the helm, made every effort to escape. In doing so, they crossed the path of the gun brig Apervier, which, though vastly inferior in size and armament, fired broadside after broadside till the Mashuda struck her flag. She was sent to Cartagena while the fleet sailed on in search of the remainder of the Algerian squadron supposed to be near at hand. No enemy was seen, however, till June 19 when a sail was descried not far from Cape Palos, and chased. A hard run of three hours' duration brought the stranger into water so shallow that none but the torch, the spark, the spitfire, and the epivier could follow, and as these kept in hot pursuit, 
the moors ran their brig aground and took to their boats the prize which was floated off and sent to cartagena proved to be the estido of twenty-two guns and a crew of one hundred and eighty men of whom eighty-three were taken prisoners as enough had now been done to make the day listen to reason decatur led his squadron toward africa and on the twenty eighth of june sighted the glittering pile of houses which formed the city of algiers by the little fleet which approached it the place would have seemed to an onlooker to be impregnable the artificial mole which made the harbour bristled with two hundred and twenty heavy guns almost three hundred more were mounted on a wall of immense thickness which surrounded the city decatur however paid no attention to the dangers of the task he had to perform but marched boldly in with a white flag at the foremast and a swedish flag at the main and in a few hours had the swedish consul and the captain of the port on board where said decatur addressing the algerian is your squadron by this time was the answer it is safe in some neutral port not at all was the reply for we have captured the mashuda and the estido at first the captain of the port would not believe it but when the lieutenant of the mashuda stepped forward and confirmed the news he asked what were the terms of peace and proposed that those charged with the duty of concluding it should land and begin negotiations his purpose was so plainly to gain time that decatur stoutly declared that peace must be made on the deck of the guerriere or not at all and the moor went back to consult his master next day he returned with full powers to negotiate and was informed of the terms the day must renounce all claims to future tribute must set free all american prisoners without ransom must repay in money the value of the goods and property taken from them must pay ten thousand dollars to the owners of the edwin and guarantee that the commerce of the united states should never again be molested by algerian corsairs the agent of the day protested that the terms were too hard declared that it was the late day haji ali and not his master omar pasha who began the war and claimed now that haji ali was dead that omar was not to blame his protests and his arguments were of no avail and finding that decatur would abate nothing he asked for three hours delay not a minute said decatur not a minute and the captain of the port hurried ashore with the understanding that if the day accepted the terms he would return with a white flag in his boat when he had been gone about an hour an algerian ship of war loaded with turkish soldiers was seen approaching the harbour at the sight of the ship the guerriere was cleared for action and was on the point of getting under way when the boat of the captain of the port was descried coming rapidly toward the guerriere with a white flag in her bow and in a few minutes the treaty and the ten liberated prisoners doomed to a yet more terrible fate were on board with as little delay as possible the men rejoicing in their new-found liberty were transferred to the epervier which with a copy of the treaty sailed for the united states lieutenant john templer shubrick was in command and on july twelfth passed the straits of gibraltar never to be seen again the british west indian fleet reported having seen a brig of her description during a very heavy gale in which it is believed she foundered but when and how she met her fate is still a mystery after the departure of the epervier decatur sailed for tunis and dropped anchor before the town on july twenty six during the war the american privateer abellino had sent prizes into tunis a neutral port but the bay had suffered the british cruiser lion to retake them and for this decatur demanded the payment of forty six thousand dollars within twelve hours the terms were accepted the money was paid and decatur went on to tripoli which he reached on august five tripoli had doubly offended the bashaw had suffered the british cruiser paulina to take out two prizes sent in by the abellino and had forced the american consul to lower his flag decatur therefore demanded thirty thousand dollars for the lost prizes and a salute of thirty-one guns to the flag the bashaw blustered refused gathered an army of twenty thousand men manned the batteries and threatened to declare war but when he saw decatur taking soundings he recalled the bombardment of eighteen o four and made peace the money indemnity was reduced to twenty five thousand dollars 
and in consideration of this the bashaw released ten christians held as slaves two were danes and the others sicilians as all differences with the barbary powers now seemed honourably settled decatur repaired to gibraltar and joined the squadron under bainbridge lest the withdrawal of all the ships should be followed by a renewal of the war while the day the bay and the bashaw were still smarting under their punishment the squadron was divided part returned with bainbridge and decatur to the united states part wintered at port Mahon. the precaution proved to be a wise one during the winter and early spring of eighteen sixteen the day of algiers saw many reasons for disliking the treaty flatterers and agents of all sorts were very busy persuading him that it was disgraceful to so humble himself before christian dogs the brig Estido, which decatur had promised should be returned to him and which was actually delivered to his officers had been seized by the spanish authorities as a ship captured within their waters and for this the day blamed the united states but more than all was the treaty made with lord exmouth by which great britain was forced to pay four hundred thousand dollars for the liberation of twelve thousand neapolitans and sardinians held in captivity decatur had secured the release of captives without paying a dollar when therefore the squadron left port Mahon in april and anchored off the mole at algiers and the american consul presented the treaty duly ratified by the senate it was returned by the vizier with such insolence that the consul hauled down his flag and took up his abode on the java captain john shaw who commanded the fleet instantly put his ships in position to bombard the mole arranging his boats in two flotillas to attack the land and water batteries selected the night for the attack and was about to move when the commander of a french frigate discovered his preparations and sent word to the day who at once submitted a visit to the bay of tunis ended the naval operations on the mediterranean and in october all the ships save four sailed for home the task was thoroughly done at last our flag was respected not merely by the barbary powers but by the nations whose dominions lay along the north shore of the mediterranean sea end of section fifty three this recording is in the public domain Section 54 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. The World's Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tapham. Section 54 traditions of the sheikhs of morocco 16th century by t h wire the sheikhs or mystics were those who sought to know god directly and not through a third person or through a book the editor one the miracle of the palm tree the sheikh of ibn mubarak was a worker of miracles on one occasion a number of tribesmen arrived at his abode so it is related and he ordered gruel to be cooked for them all in baskets made of palm boughs which they placed upon the fire for all the world as though they had been pots of iron when fighting broke out between the tribes and civil wars arose Ibn Mubarak would send to them, bidding them desist and lay down their arms, and condign punishment overtook all who ventured to set at naught his commands. Moreover, he set apart three days in every month in which the carrying of arms was prohibited altogether, and a man was forbidden on them to quarrel with his neighbor. The people called these days the days of Ibn Mubarak and on them a man would foregather with the murderer of his father and with the murderer of his child and not be able to speak with them this was the recognized custom both amongst the arab and amongst the berber tribes of the Sioux and the country towards the south during these peaceful days even the beasts of the forest 
were safe from the hunter. It is said that an Arab found a jerboa on one of these days, and his companion bade him, Let it go, for this is the day of the days of the peace of our Lord Ibn Mubarak. The Arabs, however, could not desist, and shooting at the jerboa wounded it in the foot. But at the same moment the Arab shrieked with pain, for his own foot was broken, and he never walked upon it more. One of the sheikhs who belonged to the great Berber tribes of the Mesmuda, to which Ibn Mubarak also belonged, used to relate the following instance of his wonder-working skill. He told it to his son, who in turn recounted it to Ibn Askar. I was once, said he, encamped in the grove of palm trees along with thy mother, and I went aside to perform the legal ablution, leaving thy mother where she was amid the palms. As she sat there, her eye fell upon a cluster of dates at the top of a lofty palm, far beyond her reach, so tall and straight was the palm tree trunk. Thereupon she said aloud, By thy leave, O my lord of Nabobarak, I would to God he would send me one who would cut off for me yonder bunch of dates. And thereupon she turned herself, and behold, behind her a man who stretched forth his hand towards the head of the palm tree, and the palm tree bowed down its head toward him, and he cut off the bunch of dates, and cast it towards the spot where the woman was sitting. Eat, said he, thank God and honor thy husband. He then vanished from her sight like a glance of the eye and the palm tree returned as it had been before, erect and tall. The mother, continued the narrator, remained speechless with astonishment. This is a miracle which I have witnessed. At once she exclaimed, and when she had related to me the adventure, I asked her what manner of man he was that had appeared to her. And when she had described him, it was Master Ibn Mubarak, I said, by the Lord of the Kaaba, for I knew him. 2. The Sheikh Who Was As Good As A Timepiece The fame of more than one of the saints and sheikhs rested upon the sweet tones of the voice in the reciting of the Quran. One such was the Sheikh Abu Hafs Omar, who belonged to one of the Arab tribes of the country but who had taken up his abode in the city of Meknes, and there also he died about the year 1540. He was a man much given to ascetism and to seclusion from the world. Every night he spent the interval between the two evening prayers in the recitation of the Quran, opening and closing the recital with a prayer. He would begin immediately after the sunset prayer and complete the prescribed portion immediately before the night prayer. And so accurately did he gauge the interval that the moment he ceased reading, people knew that the hour for the night prayer had come, and the next instant the call to that prayer would ring out from the minarets. This happened not occasionally, but night after night. He never came to the end of the prescribed portion a moment too soon, nor a moment too late. For all that the call to prayers in that city of Meknes is sounded with extreme of punctuality. 3. The Sheikh Who Must Be Obeyed The Sheikh Abu Ravian was one of the wonders of the age and the marvel of his generation. After the way of the school of the Malamatiya, or cynics. His words were the words of the covetous, and his talk the talk of the miser. Yet he would rise in the morning rich and go to bed a beggar. All he had he gave to the poor and distributed his goods to the needy. He passed his days in ecstasy and walked the world as in a dream. If he chanced to meet a prince or happened upon any of the great ones of the earth, by thine office of me, he would say to him, for so much, and if the prince gave heed to his words, and paid the price he asked, 
thou art secure he would tell him but if he disregarded his demand and refused his prize he would tell him thou art deposed and his word would come to pass as if by the predestination of god now when the sultan muhammad the sheikh had conquered the town of meknes and was making persistent efforts to take by storm the city of fez one day abu rawiyan appeared before him and stood in his presence buy fez of me for five hundred dinars said abu rawiyan to the sultan but the sultan scorned his demand and refused his price god has never laid such a condition upon any sultan quoth he neither is there anything like it in the law by allah swore abu ravian thou shalt not enter first this year weeks passed and months slipped by and the sultan made no progress with the siege of fez nor any advance except into deeper despair of ever taking the town at last the prince abdul kadir gave good counsel to his father and spoke before him wise words oh my father said he do as the sheikh abu ravian has with thee and pay him the price he has asked for he is indeed a mighty sheikh and a holy one of the saints of god and he slacked not to urge his father nor ceased to goad him on until he yielded to his importunity and gave him leave to make terms with the sheikh pay the money was all the sheikh would say and he abated not a dirham of his price so the prince abdul kadir yielded him the bargain and paid him the money by the end of the year said abu rabian as he received the money and closed the transaction by the end of the year god will finish the matter and my affair is in the hand of god exalted be his name and forthwith the sheikh scattered the money amongst the poor and distributed it to all who were in want and did not keep for himself so much as a dirham and from that very day the sultan began to have the upper and not the underhand until when the year had passed and its months had come to an end he took possession of fez and entered the city in triumph many are the anecdotes related of abu ravian and the tales told concerning him to pick one berry from the cluster and choose one grain out of the bushel it is related by more than one of the fakis of al how when the government of that town was in the hand of the Kaid abdul wahid the arusi and he shared it with a company of his relatives of the beni hamid then abu ravian arrived in the town and abode in it one night but no sooner had he entered its gates and set his foot within its walls then he went to straightway into the mosque and get him up to the top of the minaret there he stood looking down upon the town and the people in the streets could see him standing then he called at the pitch of his voice and cried aloud so that all could hear o beni hamid buy of me al cast or get you gone from it this very year and the people heard the sheikh's words and spoke them in the ears of the kaid abdul wahid if al cast belonged to him said the kaid when he heard them and if the town were in his hand he might deprive us of it or drive us forth from it when we have no other matter to think of no rot better to distract our attention we will attend to the words of an imbecile and obey the commands of a madman the next day the sheikh left the country and as he left he said the kaid abdul wahid will go out of this town and the beni hamid will be driven forth from it and they will not return to it again for ever and the event befell as the sheikh foretold even so it came to pass in the providence of god whose name be exalted
There was in Meknes a famous fakih and preacher, Harzus by name, and to him the Sheikh Abu Rabian one day sent a message by a messenger. By thy soul of me, wrote Abu Rabian. But the fakih Harzus closed his ears and steeled his heart, and the Sheikh's messenger returned to his master and told him. Go back to him once more, said Abu Rabian and say to him thou wilt be slaughtered like a beast thou and thy son and ye both will be hanged over the door of your own house in the garb when the fakir heard these words he was seized with panic and his heart became like wax he girded up his skirts and ran forth going like an ostrich and he neither stayed to rest nor stopped to drink until he came to the sheikh's house and stood before abu Rabian oh my master said he what is this that thou sayest and what are these ill-boding words some error hath occurred quoth abu Rabian. but he spake in bitter jest and the fakir knew it oh sir cried he we will do all that thou layest upon us there will not be but what has been answered abu Rabian. time went on until three months had passed and the matter delayed and the sheikh's words had not come to pass but when three months had come and gone the prophecy was fulfilled and the threat was executed as we shall show when we come to the story of the faki and preacher harsus of the meknes if god will exalted be his name to the son also of this faki and preacher harsus did the sheikh abu rabian foretell their dreadful end for as he sat one day at the door of his house, and the street before it ran with mud and mire, Abu Ravian passed by, clad in his finest clothes, and decked in his best attire, for he was on his way to the mosque, and was proceeding to the place of prayer. Then the soul of the son of Harsus was smitten with envy, and he thought to spoil the sheikh's fine raiment. If thou love God, quoth he, roll in this mud and he pointed to the street before him and indicated the flowing mire and abu ravian rolled in that mud even as a mule rolls in the sand and all because the other had adjured him by the name of god art content now asked abu ravian content returned the son of the faki harzus then said the sheikh abu ravian even thus shalt thou roll thou and thy father in chains and the thing fell out as he had said and the event occurred as he had predicted many a similar story is told of the sheikh abu Rabian, and many a like tale is handed down concerning him four the sheikh zituni and the bees the sheikh zituni was a great traveler and a worker of miracles he was black of color and blind and one whose prayers were always answered some of the mystics indeed used to call him the blind serpent which does not bite those whom it stings on account of the rapidity with which the answers to his prayers came he it was who escorted the caravans from the west in the pilgrimages to the holy house of god in mecca and to the grace of his prophet and even the arabs of Engad, and zab and of tunis for all their courage and rebellious spirit dared not attack the caravans led by the sheikh zaytuni for they saw the wonderful things which god brought to pass at his hands and experienced the extent of his power one of the excellent among those who traveled with him a man of worth and veracity gives the following description of an incident which befell their caravan an adventure which they met with in one of the sheikh zaytuni's journeys with the pilgrims he says no sooner had we alighted on one occasion in the zab than we found ourselves surrounded by the horsemen of the wild arabs on every side intent on plunder bent on spoil in our distress we begged the sheikh for aid and told him what had befallen us and from which side did they come he asked from every side we replied 
The sheikh thereupon took up a handful of dust and threw it towards his right side, and then another which he threw to his left, then a third handful which he threw before him, and a fourth which he threw behind his back, and immediately there came forth from that dust, as it had been an inundation of bees, which scared the horses of the Arabs, and they vanished from our sight as a mist vanishes before the sun. And the people were astonished and marveled greatly. When the day was over, the Arabs appeared once more on foot, bringing with them their wives and children, and driving before them herds of cattle and flocks of sheep and goats, being desirous to be reconciled to the sheikh and to obtain of him his blessing, such was the terror of those bees. And the Arabs of those parts relate how, on coming for plunder to a caravan in which the Sheikh Zaytuni was, they would find it surrounded by a wall which none could scale nor any dig through. The following is the Sheikh Zaytuni's recipe for rendering an encampment impregnable, as it is given by his pupil Ahmed Zarouk. He would commence by saying, I take refuge in God from Satan accursed. Next he would begin to march round the encampment, reciting as he did so the 97th chapter of the Quran, until he sealed the circuit at the point where he had begun. Then verily the camp would be safe and secure from robber and thief, and God would indeed build around the encampment a wall which no thief could either scale nor dig through. This is of the things as to which there is no doubt, and a fact which is beyond question. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Farnud Jahangiri. Section 55 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelique Campbell. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 55, Morocco Law, 16th Century, by Edmondo de Amicis. I have discovered that one of the soldiers of the palace guard has lost his right ear, and they tell me that it was cut off legally, and in the presence of witnesses, by another soldier whom he had deprived the corresponding ear some time before. Such is the law of retaliation as it is interpreted in Morocco. Not only may any of the relatives of a murdered man kill the murderer on the same day of the week, at the same hour, on the spot where the crime was committed, and with the same weapon, but whoever loses one of his members by violence can inflict a similar injury upon him who did the deed. In this connection, I was told by an attaché of the French legation at Mogador of a very curious incident that occurred at that place some years ago, one of the persons concerned being personally known to him. An English merchant of Mogador was returning to the city on the evening of a market day and arrived at the gate just when a crowd of peasants was pouring through, leading their asses and camels. Although he shouted, Balak, Balak, make room, make room, until he was tired, an old Moorish woman was thrown down by his horse, striking her face against a stone. As ill luck would have it, she knocked out the last two remaining teeth in her underjaw. For a moment she seemed dazed, but recovered herself quickly, and rose to her feet in a furious rage. Bursting into a torrent of abuse and curses, she followed the Englishman to his house, and then went off in search of the cave to demand, in accordance with the law of retaliation, that the Nazarene's two corresponding teeth should be knocked out. The cave endeavored to pacify her and advised forgiveness, but finding that he could do nothing, he finally dismissed her, promising to see that justice was done, hoping that little by little she would calm down and abandon her project. But at the end of three days, back she came, angrier than ever, to demand her rights, and insisting that a formal sentence should be pronounced then and there upon the Christian. Remember, said she, you have promised. Eh, <laughs> cried the Cade, you take me for a Christian too, if you suppose that I am the slave of my word. For three months did that old woman continue to present herself daily at the entrance to the citadel, crying out, threatening, and making such a noise generally 
that the cade at last to get rid of her was forced to give in sending for the merchant he set the matter before him the old woman's grievance her rights under the law and the duty required of him by his promise ending by begging him to put a stop to the affair by consenting to have two of his teeth drawn out any two it made no difference which as long as in accordance with the law they were incisors but the merchant declined not only as regarded his incisors but his eye teeth and his molars as well and there was nothing for the cave to do but send the old woman off and tell the guards not to allow her to set foot in the casbah again very well said she since there are only degenerate Muslims left here and Muslim women the mothers of the sharifs can no longer get justice done them against dogs of infidels i shall go to the sultan and we shall soon see if the prince of the faithful abjures the law of the prophet as well true to her word she set forth on her journey entirely alone with an amulet in her breast a staff in her hand and a knapsack strapped across her shoulders and succeeded in walking the entire hundred leagues which divide Magadur from the sacred city of the empire on reaching fez she demanded an interview with the sultan and proceeded to state her case demanding in accordance with her rights as laid down in the koran an application of the law of retaliation the sultan exhorted her to show forgiveness but she persisted he then explained to her the grave difficulties that stood in the way of satisfying her demands how the english consul would never give his consent and the government would consequently find itself in a serious lawsuit how impossible it was for so trifling a cause to jeopardize the peace of the entire empire and disturb the good understanding which then existed between the government of the sharifs and powerful england the old moor remained inexorable she was now offered on condition that she would abandon the matter a sum of money large enough to support her in comfort for the rest of her life she refused what do i want with your money said she i am old and accustomed to poverty what i want is two of that christian's teeth i want them i have a right to them and i demand them in the name of the koran and the sultan prince of the faithful head of islamism father of his people cannot refuse to render justice to a muslim woman this obstinacy placed the sultan in a very awkward position the law was precise and her rights under it incontestable while the popular excitement had been wrought to such a pitch by her inflammatory speeches that it would be dangerous to refuse her demands the sultan it was abderrahman wrote to the english consul asking him as a favor to try to persuade his fellow countrymen to allow two of his teeth to be knocked out to which the merchant replied that he would never agree then the sultan wrote again promising to concede any mercantile privileges that he might wish in return for his consent and this time having been approached through his pocket the merchant gave in the old woman left fez blessing the name of the pious abdurrahman and returned to mogador where in the presence of herself and a large gathering of witnesses two of the nazarene's teeth were knocked out when she saw them fall to the ground she gave a howl of triumph and seized them with savage joy the merchant however thanks to the special privileges he enjoyed made a large fortune in less than two years and returned to england toothless but happy end of section fifty five this recording is in the public domain section fifty six of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox dot org by april six zero nine zero california united states of america hawking in algeria painting page three hundred and twenty two by eugene fromentin french painter eighteen twenty to eighteen seventy six for hawking or falconry falcons are so trained that after making a capture they will surrender it to their masters this is one of the most ancient sports and has been practiced for many centuries in the days of the norman kings in england hawking was treated as seriously as a science and a man's rank was indicated by the character of the falcon which he bore on his wrist falconry has its own language a mature hawk is a haggard 
a young one taken in its migration is a passage hawk to train these birds is called reclaiming to flutter is to bait to fight with one another is to crab to sleep is to joke the prey is the quarry in northern africa falconry is as much delighted in as it ever was in the earlier days the best hunter is the female or the peregrine falcon the fiercest of all birds of prey the birds are always loosed with the cry in the name of allah god the great allah as no animal may be lawfully eaten by mohammedans over which these words have not been pronounced before its slaughter the illustration presents a characteristic hawking scene in algeria the arab hunters are pausing at the foot of a rocky precipice their falcons held aloft on their wrists they are mounted on superb horses the white one in the front of the picture where every curve of his perfectly molded figure stands out against the dark background the two riders and also their steeds are giving close attention to the attendants at the left who are caring for some small animal that has already been captured end of section 56 this recording is in the public domain Section 57 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fano Jahangiri. The World's Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva Marsh Tapham. Section 57. One Day in Morocco, 19th Century, by Edmondo du Amisis. We made an early start for Zakota, inspired by the thought that on that day we should behold the mountains of Fez in the distance. There was an autumnal freshness in the air, and a light mist obscured the surrounding country. A crowd of Arabs wrapped in their cloaks formed two wings at the entrance to the camp. The soldiers of the escort were huddled together in a close chilly group behind us, and the children of the neighboring dwarves gazed out with sleepy eyes from behind the tents and hedges. Ere long, however, all this changed. The sun came out, the spectators crowded around us, the horsemen scattered in all directions, the air resounded with shouts and the rapid reports of firearms, and everything became suddenly bright, animated, full of life and color, while the autumnal cold was succeeded, as is always the case in that climate, by the burning heat of summer. Among my notes of that morning I find one which says laconically, Grasshoppers, sample of Salam's eloquence. I remember, in fact, to have noticed a field, some distance off, that seemed to be in motion, an effect produced by an enormous number of green grasshoppers coming towards us in leaps. Salam, who happened to be riding beside me just then, gave me an admirably picturesque description of the incursions of those terrible insects, which I remember word by word. But how can I possibly render the effect of his gestures, his expression, and the tones of his voice, which really told more than the words themselves? It is frightful, signor. They come from over there, pointing to the south, like a black cloud. The noise is heard from afar. They come, they come, and at their head, their sultan, their sultan Gerard, who leads them on. They cover the roads, the fields, house, dwarfs, forests. The cloud grows larger and larger, on and on and on, dying and consuming. Over rivers, over ditches, over walls, through fire, the grass is destroyed, the flowers, the leaves, the fruit, the grain, the bark of the trees, on and on. No one can stop them, not flaming tribes, not the sultan with his army, not all the people of Morocco assembled together, heaps of dead grasshoppers. For what go the living? Do ten die? A hundred are born. Do a hundred die? A thousand are born. Such size at ten years? The streets covered, gardens covered, seashores covered, sea covered, everything green, everything in motion, living, dead, decayed, offensive, a plague, a pestilence, a curse from God. And this is really so. The fetid odor arising from myriads of dead grasshoppers sometimes reduced the contagious form of fever. And to cite one instance, the terrible plague which in 1799 fairly depopulated both the towns and country of Bombay, broke out just after one of these visitations. When the advance guard of the invading army appears, the Arabs go forward to meet it, in parties of four or five hundred, with sticks, clubs, 
and firebrands but only succeed in forcing the enemy to deviate somewhat from its course and it occasionally happens that when one tribe drives them back thus from their own into the district of a neighboring tribe the grasshopper war is converted into a civil war the only thing that frees the country from this curse is a favorable wind this blows them into the sea where they drown and are swept up on the beach for days afterwards in great heaps when the favorable wind still delays the only possible consolation left the inhabitants is to eat their enemies this they do before they have laid their eggs boiling them and adding a seasoning of salt pepper and vinegar they taste a little like sea crabs and as many as four hundred can be eaten in a single day about two miles from camp we overtook that part of the caravan which was bearing victor emmanuel's presence to fez white camels were harnessed together two by two in tandem fashion by long poles attached to either side of the saddle from which swung the cases they were in charge of some arabs on foot and some mounted soldiers and at their head was a wagon drawn by two oxen the only wagon we had seen in morocco it had been especially made at el araish upon the model i should say of the first vehicle that ever appeared on the earth's surface squat heavy ill-formed with wheels composed of solid blocks of wood and the most curious and absurd looking harness that could possibly be imagined but to the inhabitants of the dwarfs most of whom had in all probability never seen a wheeled vehicle before it was a marvel they ran to behold it from all directions pointed it out to each other followed behind and walked in front of it with visible excitement even our mules unaccustomed to the sight of such objects showed great reluctance to pass it some planting themselves stubbornly on their forefeet and others wheeling completely around salam himself regarded it with a certain complacency as though saying that was made in our country and this was excusable seeing that in all morocco there are very likely no more wagons than pianos which if the estimate of a french consul is correct would reduce the number to about a dozen there seems indeed to be a certain antipathy to vehicles of every kind the tangier authorities for example forbade prince frederick of hesse darmstadt when he was there in eighteen thirty nine to ride out in a carriage the prince wrote to the sultan offering to have the principal streets paved at his own expense provided the permission refused by the authorities were granted him i will grant it most willingly replied the sultan but upon one condition that the carriage shall have no wheels since as protectors of the faithful i cannot permit my subjects to be exposed to the risk of being run over by the christian whereupon the prince to turn the whole thing into ridicule took him at his word and there are people in tangiers now who remember seeing him going about the town in a carriage without wheels suspended between two mules at last we reached that blessed hill for which for three days past the caravan had been looking with such longing impatience after making a tedious ascent we passed through a narrow gorge called in arabic bentinja which we were obliged to take single file and came out above a charming valley flowery and solitary into which the caravan descended in festive style filling the air with shouts and bursts of song at the foot of the valley we came upon another body of soldiers belonging to the military colonies come to relieve the first there were a hundred of them very old and very young dark long-haired some of them mounted on enormous horses with housings of unusual splendor their kaid abu ben jilali was a sturdy old man of severe aspect and curt manner of whom and of his soldiers one might have said as don abodonio did of the anonymous leader and the assassins i can well understand that to control such faces as those nothing less is needed than such a face as that without so much as a glance as the fields of ripening wheat and barley that lined the road on either side the soldiers urged their horses forward and scattering in all directions on a full gallop began the powder play 
five and ten firing at a time into the air, wheeling to left and right, turning about in their saddles in every conceivable manner, and yelling all the while like demons. One of them whirled his gun around with such rapidity that it could hardly be seen. Another, as he flew by, shouted in a tremendous voice, here comes the thunderbolt a third whose horse had swerved a little came within a hair's breadth of landing in our midst and throwing us all to the ground with our heels in the air at a certain point the ambassador and captain accompanied by helmet ben Carson, and a few soldiers separated from the rest of the caravan and went off to make the ascent of a mountain a few miles away while we continued our route a few minutes later an incident occurred which i am not likely ever to forget a half-naked arab boy about sixteen or eighteen years old came towards us driving two recalled citrons oxen by the aid of a heavy stick the kate abu ben jalali stopped his horse and caught him we learned afterwards that the oxen were to have been attached to the wagon which we had passed not long before and that they were several hours behind time the unfortunate boy approached trembling and stood before the kate who put some question to him i did not understand the lad stammered the reply and went white as death fifty lashes said the kate curtly turning to his men three powerful fellows at once leaped from their horses and the poor wretch without waiting for them to lay hold of him without uttering a single word or so much as raising his eyes to the countenance of his judge threw himself flat on his face and as the custom is with arms and legs extended all of this had transpired in an instant but the stick had not been lifted in the air before the commander and some of the others dashing into the midst of the group had made the kate understand that they could not think of permitting such a brutal punishment to be inflicted abu ben jalali inclined he said and the boy rose pale with convulsed features gazing alternately at his deliverers and the kate with an expression of mingled fear and astonishment go said the interpreter you are free ah he cried with an intonation that cannot be conveyed and quick as lightning disappeared we proceeded in on our way but i must say that although i had seen a man killed i have never experienced such feelings of profound horror as when i beheld that half-naked boy stretched out on the ground to receive his fifty lashes and after the horror of the thing my blood began to boil and, and i denounced the kate the sultan morocco and its inhumanity in the most violent terms it is however undoubtedly better to wait for second thoughts but how about ourselves i presently reflected how many years is it since we abolished whipping and how many since it was abolished in austria and in prussia and throughout the rest of europe these thoughts had the effect of somewhat curbing my righteous indignation and i was left with only a strong feeling of bitterness if any one cares to know how whipping is conducted in morocco suffice it to say that when the operation is completed it sometimes happens that the victim is carried to the cemetery during the remainder of the ride to zakota the caravan passed over a succession of hills and valleys the road running between fields of wheat and barley and bright green pasture bordered with aloes indian figs wild olives dwarf oaks ivy strawberry trees myrtles and flowery shrubs not a tent was in sight not a living soul to be seen the country was as luxuriant silent and deserted as an enchanted garden once on reaching the top of a certain hill we descried the blue summits of the fez mountains which however immediately disappeared again as though they had merely raised their heads a moment to see us pass in the hottest part of the day we arrived at zakota this was one of the most exquisite spots we saw throughout the entire trip the camp was pitched on the mountain side in a great rocky cavity shaped like an amphitheater and worn by the successive passage back and forth of man and beast into innumerable paths one above the other whose more or less regular lines had the effect of graduated seats and as a matter of fact these tires were at that very moment crowded with arabs who sat on the ground in semicircles like spectators in some actual amphitheater below us lay a wide basin-shaped plain 
whose cultivated fields made it look like a huge checkerboard with squares of green yellow white red and purple silk and velvet looking through field glasses we could see on the more distant hills here a row of tents there a koba half hidden among the aloes in one place a camel beyond it an arab lying on the ground a herd of cattle a group of women a sluggish in frequent signs of life that made one feel more forcibly than their entire absence would have done the profound peacefulness of the scene above all this loveliness a white blazing blinding sky forcing one to bow his head and half close his eyes but it is not so much the beauties of nature that make Zagota an undying memory with me as a certain experiment I made there with Kif. Kif, let me say, for the benefit of those who are unfamiliar with it, is the leaf of a sort of hemp called hashish, celebrated throughout the East for its narcotic qualities. It is much used in Morocco, and it may generally be taken for granted that those Arabs and Moors, so frequently to be seen in the towns, gazing at the passers-by by, with dull, unseeing eyes, or dragging themselves along like persons stunned by a blow on the head, are victims of this pernicious plant. Most people smoke the kif, mixed with a little tobacco, in tiny clay pipes, or it may be eaten in the form of confectionery, called majun made of butter honey nuts musk and cloves the effects are very peculiar dr migores who had tried it had often told me of his experience recounting among other things how he was seized with an irresistible desire to laugh and how he seemed to be lifted off the ground so that in passing through a doorway about twice his own height he had bent his head for fear of striking it against the lintel all of these so aroused my curiosity that I several times begged him to give me a little piece of majun, just enough to make me see and feel some of these curious things without absolutely losing control of myself. The worthy doctor at first excused himself, saying that it would be better to make the experiment at Fez, where we would be more conveniently situated. But on my persisting, he at length, a little unwillingly, handed me at Zakota, a plate on which lay the much-desired sweetmeat. We were seated at table. If I mistake not, both Usi and Beseo took a little at the same time, but of its effect on them, I have no recollection. The majun was like a bit of paste, violet colored and smelling like pomatum. For about half an hour, from the soup that is to the fruit, I felt nothing at all and began to chaff the doctor about his fears, but he only smiled and said, wait wait and sure enough as the fruit was put on the table the first symptoms of intoxication did begin to manifest themselves at first they took the form of great hilarity and rapid talking and then i began to laugh heartily at everything i or anyone else said every word that was uttered seemed to me the most exquisite witticism i laughed at the servants at the looks of my companions at my chair as it tilted over at the design on the china at the shapes of certain bottles, at the color of the cheese I was eating, until all at once, becoming conscious that I no longer had command of myself, I endeavored to think of something serious in order to regain my self-control. Remembering the boy who was to have been whipped that morning, I felt the greatest interest in him. I would have liked to take him back with me to Italy, to have him educated, to give him a career. I loved him like a son, and the Kaid Abu bin Jalali, poor old man. Kaid Abu bin Jalali? Why? I loved him too, like a father, and the soldiers of the escort, they were all good fellows ready to defend us, to risk their lives in our behalf. I loved them like brothers. And then the Algerians, I loved them as well. Why not? I thought. They are of the same race as the Moroccans. And after all, what race is that? Are we not all brothers made after one pattern? We should love one another. I love people and I am happy. And I threw one arm around the doctor's neck whereupon he burst out laughing. From this cheerful mood, I fell all at once into a state of profound melancholy. All the people whom I had ever offended rose up before me. I recalled every pang I had caused those who loved me, was oppressed by feelings of remorse and unavailing regret, 
voices seemed to whisper in my ear in accents of affectionate reproach i repented begged for pardon furtively brushed away the great tear which i felt trembling in the corner of one eye then a succession of a strange disconnected memories began to course wildly through my brain long forgotten friends of my childhood certain words of a dialect i had not spoken for twenty years women's faces my old regiment william the silent paris the editor barbara a beaver hat that i had worn as a child the acropolis at athens my bill at an inn in seville a thousand queer fancies i have a vague recollection of seeing the company look at me smilingly from time to time i would close my eyes and reopen them without knowing whether i had been asleep or no whether minutes or hours had elapsed in the interval then a clear idea came into my head at last and i began to speak once i said i went to where was it i went who went hmm it had all escaped me thoughts sparkled for an instant and expired like fireflies crowded mixed confused at one moment i saw usi with his head elongated like the reflection in a bad mirror the vice consul with a face two feet wide and the others tapered off swelled out contorted like extravagant creatures making grimaces at me that were inexpressibly comic and i laughed and wagged my head and dozed and thought that they were all crazy that we were in another world that nothing i saw was real that i was not very well that i did not know where i was that it was getting strangely dark and silent when i came to myself i was lying on my own bed in our tent with the doctor seated beside me holding a lighted candle and regarding me attentively there <laughs> said he smiling it is over but this must be the first and last time end of section 57 this recording is in the public domain recording by fano jahangiri section 58 of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story 3 Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 58 The Great Market of Tripoli. Latter part of the 19th century. By George E. Thompson. It is early morning, as I walk on the wide expanse of sand, extending along the shore outside the white walls of Tripoli. The sun already shines with the fervent heat from a sky of cloudless blue. It shines on a busy scene. The usually quiet shore is tenanted by hundreds of Arabs, Negroes, and their animals, camels, donkeys, and cattle. They still pour in by the various lanes leading through the orange groves and palm forest from the distant oasis of the desert and as they arrive they settle down on the shore in groups some close to the water's edge for there is scarcely any tide here others farther in their place being regulated according to the nature of the produce they have for sale a refreshing breeze blows in over the clear waters of the bay renewing the life of the tired travellers of the night everything is conducted with precision and in perfect order by this ancient people whose manners and customs change not, who are the same now as they were centuries ago. There may be directors or policemen about, and they may have their eye upon me, but if so, I know them not. I wander down the long lines of Arabs, watching and marveling as the market grows up rapidly, here and there staying to take a photograph with my hand camera. Finding the folk pleasant and interested rather than otherwise, I rush back to my hotel, for the tripod camera, and am soon at work among the various groups. By this time, the vast market has assumed the air of an industrial exhibition. It is now in full swing, and booths are erected in long rows to shelter the occupants from the sun's rays. Beginning at the far end, we find a fine herd of camels for sale. Then come cattle, cows, sheep, and goats. Here on the golden sands, 
are pictures of Arcadian, pastoral, or Old Testament life. Brilliant with delicious coloring, calm, reposeful, and beautiful. Long-bearded, fine-looking Arabs, squatting in their barakans, or blankets amidst a few clean sheep and goats, quietly awaiting purchasers. No push, no hurry, no noise. We leave these groups with their delicate coloring, lights, and shadows, and pass down a narrow avenue between the booths of the fruit sellers. Here are heaps of oranges, bananas, melons, and many a strange product, of which we know nothing, laid out in long rows on the sand. No tables. The owners squat behind their goods under a small tent. The buyers swarm down the narrow path, sometimes seated on a donkey, shouting, Balik! Make way! And so we move on. There are the blacksmiths at work, and on the sand, too. In the center of each group a small charcoal fire burns. An Arab boy works a pair of bellows, looking like two concertinas, which he moves alternately. A small anvil stands in the sand, and filing is done on a large ox bone, used as a bench. A double row of shoemakers' is tents follows. The occupants are all at work. Highly colored red and yellow slippers, some of them embroidered, are being turned out by the dozen. The meat stalls are the only unpleasant feature of this fascinating market. For on erections of bamboo canes there are hung up, alongside good joints of meat, the most loathsome-looking entrails. Yes, and it all sells, too. Let us pass on and see what is in the center of the crowd yonder. Another picture from Arcadia. Pan with his pipes. Arab musicians playing on double reeds. Not high-class music, but ancient and pleasing to native ears. Close by is the pot market, water coolers, wine jars, oil cisterns, large and small, mostly with pointed bottoms for placing in the sand. Then there are the basket makers, many of them Negroes, of the blackest hue. There are large, basin-shaped baskets for fruit round, conical-shaped dish covers, and small wicker baskets closely made and interwoven with bits of colored cloth. The Negro women make the latter, and so closely that some of them will hold water. One woman has two little babies, ebony with ivory teeth and eyes, fat, black, merry, India rubber sort of babies, with little woolly heads and a bracelet or string of red coral for clothing. One of these was frightened by the white man and hid its face while I bought a basket from its mother. I coaxed it with a copper, and left it thinking that the white man was not so bad after all as a white man. They were touching sights, too, on the sand that day. I saw one poor negro woman and her baby, both tired out. They lay sleeping in each other's arms in the sunshine. There were the donkeys, poor things, that had traveled many a mile in the early hours of the morning from distant hamlets. Numbers of these lay on their sides stretched out and fast asleep. Ropes are pegged into the sand, forming square enclosures, and the donkeys' feet are tied there to row, so that they may not stray. For the most part, they looked well kept and tended. Next we come to the oil merchants with their long-pointed earthenware jars stuck in the sand, and there are charcoal fires, where food is being prepared for the evening meal. All goes on in a quiet and orderly fashion, no drunkenness, no unseemly rows, for these people are barbarians on the barren burning sands of Africa, not Christians in the slums of London or Liverpool. I passed on among that dense cloud of Arabs, Negroes and Turks, camera in hand, and they made way, nay, helped me. Balik, Balik, polite and kindly, for are they not barbarians and children of the desert? End of section 58 this recording is in the public domain. Section 59 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org Northern Africa, Part 3 The Mystery of the Desert Historical Note According to the notions of the early geographies, the Sahara was a broad, low-lying expanse of sand silent save for the soft footfalls of camels bearing loads of the treasures of the east. Even within the last forty years it was supposed to be so far below the sea level that there was serious talk of flooding the western part and changing the climate by digging a canal south of Morocco and letting in the waters of the Atlantic. 
Fortunately, before the shovels were set to work, it was learned that the Sahara is a tableland lying from 1,300 to 1,600 feet above the ocean, and that the lowest part of the region which was to be covered by the waters of the Atlantic is 500 feet from sea level. Numerous streams flow into the desert from the Atlas Mountains through deep valleys, but generally the water sinks until it reaches a stratum which it cannot penetrate. There it remains, in mighty underground lakes, and wherever this water is brought to the surface, an oasis is produced. Many caravan routes run through the desert. The camels carrying manufactured articles to the oases of the desert and returning loaded with gold, ostrich feathers, ivory, iron, and salt. This trade is made possible by the lines of wells that have been supplied with water from the underground lakes. The desert is by no means uninhabited. In the west are the Moors and Arabs, dwellers in tents, hospitable to their friends, but with no compassion upon their enemies. In the middle of the wilderness are the Tuaregs, who in the fashion of the Barbary pirates demand toll from all caravans crossing their country. In the east are the Tibus, who live in fixed abodes, raise flocks and herds, and cultivate the ground. More than half of the Sahara belongs to France. The rest is held by Egypt, Morocco, Tripoli, and Spain. End of section 52 This recording is in the public domain. Section 60 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farnu Jahangiri. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 60. The Hour of Prayer in the Desert. Latter part of 19th century. By Gilbert Watson. Lightly Biskra shook off the dreams of the tropical night. The white walls of her houses showed like blanched faces in the dawn, silent as fire worshippers awaiting the sun. The fringe of palms facing the east stole on the sight, pale as phantoms, motionless, their drooping leaves awash with silver. Behind the town, the oasis massed itself in impenetrable obscurity. Far off, a neutral tinted line spoke of the desert. Day after day, had this line beckoned to me, decking itself in elemental jewels, like a siren seeking to please. And it was not only to the material eye that it appealed, but to that infinitely more subtle sense, the eye of imagination. That pencil line known as the horizon had been to me a daily source of wonder and speculation. Could I but reach it? Could I but see beyond it? What golden lands lost in sunlight might I not discover? A sense of mystery, almost of awe, as though one stood within the doors of some great cathedral, held anticipation breathless. It is not that which we see in life, but that which we hope to see, that causes the heart to beat and the eyes to sparkle. To my ears the word desert sounded magical, as did fairyland when I was a child. A name to conjure with, picturing forth a land full of delightful possibilities, a world of wonder shining in a heaven of dreams, and I was to see it at last. Athman had proved himself an efficient organizer. I found myself master of three camels, two as mounts for my guide and myself, the third to be used exclusively for baggage. I beamed upon them with an air of happy proprietorship. To possess camels was to my mind a fall of fortune almost too good to be true. To be able to say come and have three camels coming, and to be able to say go and have three camels going, appeared to me the height of human bliss. Envy itself could not reach higher. The only crumbled rose leaf in my bed of satisfaction lay in the fact that Abdullah, the real owner of my preambulating property, trudged in our rear, and also that the camels themselves appeared to regard me with considerable suspicion. As we moved away, my thoughts reverted to my introduction to this new world, when, on a beautiful afternoon, scarce a week ago, I had caught my first glimpse of the desert. It was an experience I was little likely to forget, and now that I was actually embarked on the high sea of sand, my memory rested on that salient moment with conscious pleasure. 
El Kantara, the gateway to the desert, lay before me, the beautiful golden gate which many a traveler had delighted to extol. Behind in the desolate valley the hot metal of the gauge winks defiance to the African sun, a sterile and unproductive land bearing its nakedness to the day, but in front the semicircle of cliffs is rent in twain as though a titan's axe had cleft their granite bones, leaving the wound a subject of marvel to all eternity. And gazing through this giant gate over a blur of sunlit oasis, one sees the desert. Another scene, too, connected inseparably with that radiant afternoon returned to me. Standing in the riverbed of the Oued Biskra, with my back towards the desert, I had looked northwards. Among the boulders that mirrored themselves in the stream were two Arab boys. Overhead, a palm tree bent above the water as it gazed at itself in the little pools that lay rested among the rocks. In the background, the scene opened not with the sheer abruptness, the brusque violence of the cleft as seen from El Cantara, but with the gentle suavity of introduction, leading the eye along shining waterways between lines of palms onwards, upwards to where, in the blue of the distance, the hills slept in a mantle of sunbeams. Slowly, we left Biskra behind us. Life was beginning to awake in the drowsy streets. A dog crept from under a clump of aloes. A child watched us from behind a cactus hedge, while overhead in the clear spaces of the sky, a band of swallows wheeled ceaselessly. As we passed a negro village, we met an Arab mounted on a diminutive donkey, driving two other donkeys before him as the twelve tiny hoofs pattered along the mane. The dust rose in dense clouds. It obscured the distance, it veiled the bamboo hedge, it shrouded the little party in a diaphanous mist of silver. There was something extremely dainty in the diminutive animals and their dusky owner, seen thus in the dim light they resembled silver point drawings, mere indications of life, silhouettes sketched with a wet and speedy brush on a background of pearl. Silently we stalked forward, the sponge-like feet of the camels and the sandals of the Arab passed inaudibly over the dusty ground. Gradually the desert opened out before us. It dawned upon the sight from between faint headlands of verdure. To the right, Aelia and Philia, two small oases, showed like islands of misty greenery floating in a sea of pale grey light. Volcanic rocks suggesting the action of primeval fires lay tossed around interspersed with dwarf bushes powdered with silver dust. The camels avoided these obstacles with the leisurely grace of movement peculiar to them, swaying their long necks pendulously and placing their feet with care on the level ground between the ruts. The air was exquisitely cool and clear, its purity, freshness, and faint odor as of time breathed of infinite space. A sense of solemn expectancy pervaded the scene. In the far distance a herd of camels was to be observed. At times they appeared but as a slowly moving dots, and at others they stood out hard and sharp against the skyline. Once we met a family proceeding with scrub wards. They attracted the eye from afar on account of the glint of color that focused attention. I gazed at them as we approached, gazed as we passed, turned in my saddle and gazed again as they receded into the distance. It seemed to me that I could not gaze my fill, that the time taken in the encounter was all too short to sear them upon my memory, so picturesquely did they stand out in trenchant contrast to their surroundings. Foremost came an Arab mounted on a donkey. He was clad in a bareness of a dirty grey color, the hood of which partially concealed his face. His long and naked legs dangled but a couple of inches above the dust of the road. He returned my stare with a look of utter indifference. Behind him paced a camel laden with sacks, cooking utensils, and baskets. Perched high upon these family gods were two semi-naked children clutching a couple of fowls. Over the camel's body, in lieu of a saddle cloth, trailed a party colored sheet of alternate red and yellow stripes. In the rear plodded a woman dressed in an orange robe, a baby bound upon her back. When we were come within a few yards of her, she raised her head. Her eyes fell on us with a dull, unmeaning stare, as though she had long since ceased to take interest in objects beyond the pale of her sad and sordid life. 
She gave us but a fleeting glance to enable her to avoid us, then her eyes dropped again to the dust. She was unveiled and of pitiable plainness. A face old before its time seemed with many wrinkles. She walked with a limp, one naked foot partially covered with a bandage, showed signs of blood, and her air was the air of one both despondent and weary. The child upon her back wailed, but she had no time to steal its cries, for already the steady advance of the animals had left her many yards behind. Slowly they crept into the distance, the donkey picking its way daintily among the ruts, the camel with a stately motion and outstretched neck, the woman limping with bent back and downcast eyes. The sun rose and deluged the plains with light. Barely had his upper rim showed in a line of fire above the horizon. Then, at a cry from their master, the camels came to a standstill. The man strode forward, and hanging on to the neck of Atman's mount, brought the animal to its knees. It is out of prayer, said Atman. I watched them as my camel cropped the terebinth shrubs by the wayside. Watch them with a feeling of alienation, conscious that from their spiritual world, from their inner life, I was indeed an outcast, destined to remain forever in an atmosphere of semi-comprehension. Atma's love of finery revealed itself even in his devotions. He unfastened the parcel from behind his saddle, which when unrolled proved to be a small praying rod. This he spread on the ground, not on the track where the dust lay deep, but on the higher and firmer ground among the shrubs. Discarding his burners and kicking off his yellow slippers, he stepped in his white socks on the mat and stood erect. At the distance of a couple of yards, with naked feet, stood Abdullah. The contrast between them was striking. The one with dark, rough-hewn face and splendid figure, the other with fine Arab features, his weather-worn frame gone to emaciation. The one in a pale mauve costume, lined with crimson, his jacket stiff with embroidery and bright with rows of glass buttons, the other covered only with a grey burnous, ragged and dirty beyond words. <sighs> I watched them, prostrating themselves until their foreheads touched the ground, rising to their full height, prostrating themselves anew, and gave ear to the subdued sounds of prayer flowing ceaselessly from their lips. The sun circled even higher. His beams fell full on the two men and flung their shadows far across the dust of the track. The red lining of Atman's jacket glowed like a thing of flame. Nearby the camels waited in attitudes of inimitable patience. There was something singularly impressive in the simplicity of their devotions. The absence of self-consciousness, the unfeigned earnestness, the force of long habit that concentrated attention upon a set form of words accompanied by a set form of movements, all were calculated to strike the least observant. These men, insignificant in themselves, were yet part of a spiritual power so mighty as to ring the wall with prayer. Al Islam was awake at that self same hour far beyond our vision, over leagues of untraversed space. Countless voices were raised in supplication, countless eyes were turned with longing to the radiant east. The sight of the holy city, symbolized perchance within simple minds by the invariable brightness and majesty of the rising sun. From populous cities, from obscure villages, from oases lost in the Sahara, from caravans far out in the desert, the cry was still the same, Allah. Allah, it rose and fell. The melodiousness of the word lulled the mind, it soothed the soul, it whispered of divine protection. Was it not the angel of hope fluttering her rainbow wings even within the sanctuary of the spirit? Allah, it came again stealing through the sunlight vibrating around us in waves of sound we were no longer alone all the little voices of the desert awoke into praise it was as if a thrill of gladness ran through the weary earth there was a joyous presence in the morning that made itself felt that stirred the hearty worship of their own accord my lips to frame the universal prayer allah i murmured allah akbar allah allah Yes, truly, God is great. End of section 60 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Farno Jahangiri Section 61 
of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fana Jahangiri. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 61. The Oasis of the Great Grandfather. Latter part of 19th century by Gilbert Watson. Athman was in a state of high excitement. We were due to arrive at the oasis of his great-grandfather in the course of an hour. It was the second day after our departure from Maghir. We had camped on the preceding night at Netza ben Rezik, which being interpreted signifies the place where ben Rezik died, who the temporary possessor of this name had been or what he had done to merit renown. Athman was unable to inform me. My charitable guide, however, was fully convinced that the deceased gentleman had passed a life of the greatest sanctity and was in every way worthy of the candle which we presented to his tomb. The ground over which we passed was sacred soil in the eyes of Athman. Not a hill heaving itself out of the dun monotony, but held memories for him. Not a village or clump of palms shimmering in the glare, but whispered to him of the past. A tiny oasis called the Mother of the Falcons was pointed out to me with great pride as belonging to a distant relative, a place where he, Othman, had spent many happy days. A well in the desert known as Ain Karna, or the Well of the Fig Tree, was hailed with ejaculations of affection, which, be it confessed, came perilously near to tears when he discovered that the familiar fig tree was no more. It was, however, upon his home, the oasis of Zawiyet, Riba, that Othman lavished the pent-up tenderness of his heart. O oh, Sidi, he cried, to think that in one little hour I shall see it again, the dear oasis that I remember so well. Oh, it is beautiful, but so beautiful. Uh, imagine to yourself the dome of the holy tomb, as it were a bubble of camel's milk floating in the air, and behind the fresh green of the palms. Oh, my great-grandfather's palms. You call them his steel, Othman. But certainly, said he, since they belong to him. But he has been dead so long. It matters not, he gesticulated with animation. They are still his. Listen, I will tell you the story of them. When my great-grandfather died, he left many palms, for he was rich, and this was what he said. I leave all my palm trees, firstly, to the upkeep of my tomb, secondly, to give hospitality to strangers. See, the, these were his very words. Oh, it is a very beautiful idea. Uh, although that he still feels hungry. How kind that is. How like my great-grandfather. Athman's face glowed. His voice rang with enthusiasm. In a little while he spied the oasis. Unrest seized him. Nothing would do but that he must dismount and assist Abdullah to urge on the baggage camel, who, it must be confessed, was inconsiderately lazy that morning. When that unaccountable animal utterly refused to quicken her steps, having no such incentive to exertion as an expectant tomb, he was all for mounting again, being convinced that where he but perched aloft as before, he could effectively spur the progress of the party. Then as though to pass the lazy pacing time, he took to feverishly counting on his fingers. On du trois, etc. But every time he reached the number five, he stopped and scratched his head. In answer to an inquiry, he replied, My presence, Sidi, my presence. Oh, I hope I have enough. Presence, I ejaculated. What presence? He turned on me a reproachful eye. For my relations, of course. I hope I have forgotten no one. It would be sad to forget even a little one of whose birth I knew nothing. Hmm. Groped in the hood of his burnous and drew from thence a parcel. Opening this, he submitted the contents to my inspection. Isn't that pretty? He held a tiny looking glass at arm's length. It was circular, set in red leather. A flap covered the glass. I expressed unqualified approval. Athman was delighted. It is for my aunt. He chuckled with gusto. How she will cry out with joy when she raises the slap and sees her own face and this and this and this. One after another he dangled before my eyes a variety of articles, a bag of camel's skin covered with cheerful embroidery, a chain of beads that absolutely winked in the morning sun, a charm for the cure of a stomach ache, wrapped in emerald green silk of so delightfully mysterious a nature that even to see it was to be seized with longing to explore its philanthropical contents. 
Magnificent, I cried. I should think so, he assented, nodding his head gravely. I know they are beautiful, because I am sorry to part with them. We were by this time come to within a short distance of the oasis. Among the palm trees, the dome of a marabout's tomb was to be seen, covered with the usual whitewash. It shone conspicuous in the sunshine. Athman had become silent, but his parted lips and active eyes told of the feelings that glowed within him. They are perhaps working in the fields, he said at length, his voice scarce raised above a whisper. Even as he spoke, I caught sight of a man engaged in irrigation. A primitive who was in his hand. His hake was kilted round his waist. His naked feet splashed in the muddy water. Athman, shielding his eyes from the sun, gazed at him intently. It is uh, Omer, he cried in delight. Hello, Omer. Omer. The man, quitting the little patch below the palms, sprang to the pathway. The hoe fell from his hand. He stared at us open mouths like one who sees a ghost. Aloui, he screamed, and without another word he wheeled where he stood and set off running toward the village. Othman laughed aloud. <laughs> he is my cousin, he explained in a voice tremulous with satisfaction. He has gone to tell them that I am here, but how he has grown, I, I, would, I would not have believed it. Did you see his beard? Oh, he, he is a fine fellow. That is his garden. What healthy trees, yes. He was always a worker, all silly. Is it not all beautiful? Did not all tell you true? Mind you, how slow these camels are. I long to be there. Quicker, quicker. And leaning down, he beat the animal's neck with his open palm. Gently we swayed along the narrow pathway. On either hand we were shot in by mud walls topped with the prickly points of palm leaves. Before we had gone far, the village came into sight. At the same time, cries were heard, and a crowd of men came racing to meet us. Othman was out of his saddle in a twinkling. The crowd surrounded him with glad shouts of welcome. They caught at his hands, at his burnous, and when that fell off, at his hike. Not a soul but clamored for his attention. All spoke at once, no one waited for a reply, the noise was deafening. Othman was tossed among them like a cork on an agitated sea. But he enjoyed it, his black face turned this way and that, radiating happiness. He kissed one, embraced another, reached an enthusiastic arm over three intervening shoulders and clasped hands with a third. Joy was universal. It was indeed a red-letter day for the tribe of Ben Salah. At length we turned our steps villagewards. Othman, surrounded by relatives, walked in front. An old man leaned upon his shoulder. Omar still retained possession of his hand. Hemming him in, marched others, listening open-mouthed to his words, and replying in chorus to his eager questions. Hovering upon the outskirts of the procession were children in a state of excitement and nudity. These little people listened for the sound of his voice, which, when heard, so filled them with joy that they felt themselves forced to turn somersaults in the dust. Even Abdullah joined the ranks of admirers. The camels and I followed modestly in the rear. My tent had been pitched as usual beneath palm trees on the outskirts of the village. Seated within it, I waited the return of Athman. Zawiyat Riba had received him unto itself. The narrow lane that plunged into the labyrinth of mud huts had swallowed not only my popular guide but the entire crowd as well. The camels and I were forgotten. These patient animals, hobbled for the night, stood disconsolately each on three legs, more than ever persuaded that times were out of joints and that the terrestrial globe was by no means a planet fitted for the habitation of camels. The scene was deeply penetrated with the sentiment that haunts the approach of night. Across the tender spaces of the sky flew flocks of little birds. They came from the desert in search of the water that lay beneath the palm trees. As they passed overhead, I could hear their glad twittering and the rhythmic beating of their wings. Other sounds, too, broke upon the ear. From somewhere deep within the oasis came the noise of a camel's roar. The weird melancholy cry stirred into consciousness the strange feelings connected with faraway lands. It voiced all that was unfamiliar in my surroundings. Suddenly the beating of a drum attracted my attention. It came from the direction of the village. Feverishly it throbbed, seized and throbbed again. 
As I listened to it, a laborer passed silently on naked feet. His coarse hike Tilted to his knees, revealed the naked brown of his limbs. The level sunlight splashed him with stains of fugitive color. For a time, the scene before me was radiant with luminous green and gold steeped in transient glory in which the stems of the many palm trees glowed like flames in a dark sanctuary of shadow. Then all at once, everything grew wan and gray. A veil of mystery fell from the sky, only on the far horizon over dim spaces of desert, a thin line of light told of the sun. The sound of flying footsteps aroused me. It was Othman. Breathlessly, he burst into the tent. Oh, Sidi, he panted. Come quickly. Where, Othman? To the village, of course. There is a feast tonight in my honor. His manner was full of self-importance. Come, Sidi, come, he entreated, holding the tent flap open to its widest. I have told of your great kindness to me. My uncle desires to thank you himself. All my relations will be present. Also many friends. I wish to present them to you. I have told them that you are a prince in your own country. A prince? I cried aghast. Osman chuckled at my surprise. Oh, but certainly, Sidi, they are ignorant people. It is necessary to impress them. They will do you much honor. Besides, if they think you are a prince, they will be very pleased that I am your guide. And moreover, the feast. Oh, would you... That is worth seeing. The women and children are making cuckoo now. Many fowls are to be killed. Then, city, there is a negro from the south, a black man, with a droll turban and a drum. It is most fortunate that he is here today. He will make you die of laughing, for when he beats his drum, he dances and sings all at the same time. He's doing it now. We were all looking at him in the streets in front of my uncle's house. Oh, please come, city. He may have finished by the time we got back. I shook my head. Despite the heartiness of the invitation, I made up my mind to refuse. The presence of a stranger, however well-intentioned, could not but impart a touch of restraint to, to so purely domestic gathering. They would, I felt assured, enjoy themselves better without me. For long, Othman combated my resolution, but I was not to be persuaded. At last he desisted and reluctantly bade me good night. You have everything that you wish for, city. His eyes roamed round the tent. The firewood stood ready. My saddlebags lay open to my hand. Everything, Athman. Good night, and enjoy yourself. His impatience to rejoin the merrymakers was very visible. But still for a moment he lingered. I wish much that you would come, Sidi. The Negro is really very funny. And I shall not be able to return here when the feast is over. You sleep in the village tonight, then? No, no, tonight I do not sleep at all. Tonight I watch and break. Watch and breathe, he repeated the word solemnly, eyeing me at the same time as though he hoped that I was duly impressed. Yes, Sidi, tonight I burn many candles at the holy tomb of my great-grandfather. It is an occasion I have looked forward to for many years. It may be that God will forgive my sins on account of his great holiness. His voice sank to a whisper of veneration. His open palm pressed his forehead, then recovering his wonted manner, he bade me good night and ran at full speed towards the village. End of section 61. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fano Jahangiri. Section 62 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T.J. Burns. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Toppin. Section 62. The Music of the Desert, Latter Part of the Nineteenth Century, by Gilbert Watson. The long afternoon was drawing to a close. The sun was on the point of leaving us. In half an hour, it would be dark. For in these lands of the South, there is but little afterglow. No lingering twilight drains the lifeblood, drop by crimson drop, from out the veins of day. She is radiant, smiling to the last golden moment. Then, of a sudden, she swoons. The sun god has her in his clutches. His burning arms are around her. In fiery haste, he plunges with her behind the dark horizon. For a minute, 
there is an agony of dying color. Far continents leap into flame. Then, peace. For lo, a star already twinkles in the sky. And what is even more remarkable is the silence. In northern lands, there are so many audible indications of approaching night. But in the desert, nothing. The tyrant's son has killed all sound, beaten it down with fierce, reiterated blows until it lies as lifeless as the sand. The silence is deep, unbroken. It enters into your bones. It weighs upon your spirits. It becomes a living presence, a power to be reckoned with. Slowly we climbed, rise after rise and wound our way into the intervening valleys. The track had ceased to be a road. The ruts of wheels had stopped at Sidi Okapa, and only a stony channel, such as might well be mistaken for a watercourse, remained to indicate our line of march. The monotony was unbroken, yet it was full of fascination. The sun, sinking slowly, still deluged the world with light. The wind still swept over the wide expanse. The sand still drifted like golden smoke across our track. Suddenly, I was awakened out of a brown study by the sound of Uthman's flute. The dying sunlight streaming past me fell full upon him. His blue burnous, fallen from his shoulders, draped the hind quarters of his camel. The scarlet lining of his jacket and the warm red of his fez glowed hot in the sun. His eyelids, semi-closed, revealed the dreaming blackness of his eyes. Mechanically, his fingers moved over the stops. The air which he played fascinated me. It was wild, barbaric, unfamiliar, full of unexpected turns and sudden inexplicable changes. Heard thus, as we swayed through the sunset, it unconsciously associated itself in the listener's mind, not only with the forms of things visible, but also with the influence of things unseen. There were notes of invitation, low, inarticulate calls, that were the voice of the horizon. There were breathless gasps, sound beaten down by exhaustion that suggested weary marches over desert sands. There were passages full of dreams that whispered of longing for that which always lay beyond. And through it all, linking sound to sound, ran a thrill of emotion, a soft but imperative call that reminded one of spring. With a smile at my too vivid fancy, I essayed to curb my imagination to think of the music but as an assemblage of unmeaning sounds. The effort was unsuccessful. What music is that? I asked in a low voice. It is the music of the dancing girl, Sidi, but not of Biskara. No, of the far south. Dans le désert du Grand Sahara. His words chimed well with the melody. Instinctively, I strained my eyes toward the south. There, where sky and desert met in a golden haze, my thoughts flew like homing birds into the unknown. How full of fascination it seemed! How impregnated with mystery! How alluring! How barbaric! Might it not be, as Othman suggested, the birthplace of passion? hot and unrestrained as its sun. I learned it long ago, Sidi. He paused to jerk his camel from a bush. I have never forgotten it. I love it for its own sake, not because it reminds me of dancing girls. They bore me. You are surprised, Sidi? You think an Arab and not to love dancing girls? But it is true. My friend Hamel who is dead, mocked me often. But you understand, I am a poet. He drew himself up with a gesture of much dignity. Fatma, for example, was beautiful. 
but there was no imagination in her dancing, no grace, only contortions. Now this. He played a bar with expression that was all but passionate. This is altogether different. This excites me. Did Fatma dance to that air? I asked. No, Sidi, never. Her music was quite ordinary. What one may hear any day in the cafes. I have never seen any one dance to this music. I sometimes think it is lost. Lost? I cried. But yes, perhaps I am the only one who can play it now. Who knows? An aged man taught it to me under the palms of Zayoyat Riba. He came from the south. Unexpectedly, he came out of the desert, and unexpectedly, he went back to it. No one knew aught of him. He told me that this music was an old, old air, born in the sun, but long ago when the world was young. Beautiful women have danced to it, but they are all dead. To dance as one should to this music, one should have feet light as moonbeams, and a soul full of melody. And voyez-vous? Such a woman is difficult to find. The old man feared that it would die. It was so very old. So, finding that I could play on the flute, he taught it to me. Then, one morning, he went away towards the south. I watched him go with tears in my eyes. He never came back. No. I looked for him often when the sun sunk behind the palms, but I never saw him again. Never. Othman sighed. A small brown bird flew unexpectedly from under a bush. His camel raised a startled head and snarled faintly. Again, Othman turned to me. Sidi, he cried in a voice of enthusiasm. How I wish you had heard him. He played. Ah, yes, he played. It was like water running in the moonlight. Your soul ran with it. I, do you see, I play. I amuse myself with the flute, but it is a bagatelle, a nothing. Poof! He blew on his bunched fingertips as though he were blowing a feather into the air. Then, becoming serious, he waved an arm towards the south. It is strange, he murmured, half to himself. This music. One would say that it has a soul. The soul of the desert. Not here, but there, far away. Le bas, au sud. Yes, that is it. To me, it is the voice of the south. I started. How strange it seemed to hear my unspoken thoughts returning to me from Othman's lips. His words awoke memories. I, too, had felt something of the feelings that swayed him. I, too, had heard the self-same voice luring me ever farther towards the south as though it were a living presence, a something tangible, a hand drawing one irresistibly sunwards. I had all but forgotten my surroundings when they snatched me back from dreamland by a strain of music. I started in amazement, yet there was no mistaking the sounds. It was the music of the southern dancing girls, the music that Othman loved. I listened, wondering... How often had I heard it, on the march, in the camp beneath the palms, in the night watches. It seemed strange to hear it in this café, played by other fingers, for I associated it with Othman and had come to look upon it as peculiarly his own. His hand clutched my arm. Sidi, he cried, you hear, you hear my music. His face shone with excitement. His eyes expressed wonder and pleasure. With his disengaged hand, he kept time to the melody. 
I turned to the orchestra. The tom-tom players were still there, but the Negro had given place to an old man. He was seated cross-legged on the dais, a little in advance of the other musicians. He had the air of a wizard. His turban and robes were black and presented a striking contrast to his silvery hair and thin white beard. Age had set her seal on him in many wrinkles, in shrunken frame and toothless gums. But the fire of enthusiasm burned still within his eyes, deep sunken though they were, and overshadowed by eyebrows coarse and white as frosted thatch. His hands twitching on the stops of the flute resembled vultures' claws. It was plain to the least observant that his whole being lived and breathed in the music. At times he swayed violently in sudden jerks, as though shaken by strong, invisible hands. Mon Dieu, it is he, exclaimed Othman. Who? I demanded, but even as I spoke, I remembered. This could be none other than the old man who had taught Othman the melody under the palms of Zawiyat Rabah long ago the old man who he had fancied dead because he had lost sight of him during the busy days at biskra how strange that they should meet here at taugurt after the lapse of so many years i was about to speak again when a woman appeared in the doorway and in the interest which she created the words died upon my lips she stood framed between the palm tree logs, motionless, the light of the torches flashing upon her, the starlight seen above and beyond encircling her head in a faint white radiance. Then, as the flute screamed a wild and imperious note of invitation, she moved slowly forward. The Arabs, seated in dusky rows, turned to watch her. Their faces betrayed deep but dignified interest. Two chess players ceased their game. One of them pushed the board away with his naked toes, resettled his turban upon his head, and leaned against the wall. His eyes were semi-closed, but singularly alert. They resembled the eyes of a cat watching a mouse. A spahi, seated on a bench at a little distance, paused in the act of raising his coffee cup to his lips and drew his comrade's attention to her with a gesture. One man alone spoke to her. He was standing within the shadow margin of the door, but as she passed, he stepped into the light, and I knew him for a Bedouin, a wild-looking figure, clad in rags. In spite of the dissimilarity of costume, there was that in the general characteristics of both man and woman that told of a common origin, and I found myself wondering if they were members of the same desert tribe. As she passed, he spoke to her rapidly, almost with ferocity. I caught the glitter of his teeth. She answered with a gesture of little moment, for her expression did not alter. Neither did she pause. The man stood for a second motionless, petrified, gazing after her with the eyes of a dumb animal quivering under a blow. Then, tossing his arms over his head, he sunk once more into shadow. The old man seated on the dais caught sight of her. His eyes glowed with extraordinary fire. His meager body swayed violently. His music sprang to fresh life. A number of wild notes made themselves heard, cried out, screamed with insistent clamor, passed and repassed, as it were, before our eyes, now singly, now together, uneasy, restless, hungering, impatient, as caged animals waiting to be fed. The tom-toms throbbed in unison, monotonous and muffled, yet quick and breathless, as though the wild music had a heart whose beating could not be stilled by the passion in its voice. The stir of expectation increased. It passed over the spectators as a gasp of desert wind passes over sultry sand. Conversations ceased. Coffee cups were set down. 
and two of the dancing girls whose voices had been raised in altercation were admonished angrily by the negro proprietor the woman paused at the far end of the hall turned to the vacant space across which she had but that moment moved and raised her arms above her head in the attitude of one who listens her appearance evaded description yet though her wild beauty baffled words it remained in the watcher's mind an imperishable memory one trait alone more definite than the others occurs to me now gracefulness every movement told of physical perfection of faultless balance of beautiful limbs obedient to an unerring sense of rhythm to watch her was a pleasure akin to watching wind-blown grass or waves dancing in the sunlight she wore many ornaments her slender wrists and ankles were encircled with bands of massive silver upon her head there rested a small golden crown and depending from her neck were chains of golden coins her costume was savage in its lust for bright colors in its scarlet and green and gold yet seen thus in the yellow light against the dusky background and surrounded on all sides by silent sheeted figures it struck home to a sense of appropriateness not otherwise could one imagine her the effect was barbaric but it was africa the flute cried to her with angry impatience she began to dance her movements were sinuous and slow the flexibility of her body was remarkable the performance was full of beauty yet it was a beauty that verged upon the uncanny one felt as though this gliding undulating figure were half snake half woman holding her audience spellbound by the force of supernatural charms her dancing differed wholly from that of the dancer who had preceded her here were no contortions no jerking of the muscles no posturing that offended the taste and yet in the very refinement of her attitudes lay danger a danger more subtle in that it was more cunningly veiled than that of her companion and yet with all her powers of seduction she was no free agent for one saw clearly that she was thrall to the music like the aged musician she too lived but in this song of the south this soul of the sun made audible it dominated her completely now sending her forth now summoning her back enmeshing her in melody whispering to her in breathless notes calling to her in low seductive tones irresponsible as the first echoes of desire her naked feet passed inaudibly over the mud floor her hands riveted attention they were small with tapering fingers the nails dyed bright red with henna she held them before her at arm's length on a level with her eyes they were never at rest but turned and twisted ceaselessly almost as though they were the hands of a swimmer cleaving deep water at times they trembled the fingers opening and closing convulsively and again becoming rigid they resumed their former monotonous movements the dancer followed them with an air of one walking in her sleep or like one blinded by the excess of light her face heightened the illusion the eyes were open but were sphinx-like in their arrested expression the features composed the mouth quiet it was impossible to tell her thoughts while she danced the cafe was very still the arabs sat like dead men save for the gleaming of their eyes the place was animated only by the lights the music and the dreaming figure that came and went silent as the shadow at its feet a sudden movement at my side drew my attention to Othman. He was leaning forward, his clasped hands pinned between his knees. The torchlight fell upon his face. It was strangely moved. His lips, slightly parted, revealed the glitter of white teeth. 
His eyes followed the dancer's every movement with an expression that was half wonder, half fear, yet wholly fascination. Every line of his body bespoke tense, absorbing interest. He sat like a man under a spell. One would say that he had ceased to breathe. Our companions conversed, but he heard them not. By the prophet, she dances well, murmured Si Abdel Muammen languidly. Ugh, grunted Mabarka, sucking at her cigarette. Her voice grated on the ear like the cry of an angry jay. Ugh, call you that well? That is no dancing. A child could do better. Now I... Silence, cried a voice, and a stout Arab, seated near a pillar, turned a reproving face in our direction. Mabarka grunted again, tossed her head in defiance, then, bidding us an ostentatious farewell, waddled through the inner doorway. Again, I turned to the dancer. The music had undergone a change. More than ever before, it breathed of sunlit space of freedom, of wandering lives, of the love of the desert winds and desert suns, the indelible birthmark, seared deep within the heart of desert children. And as the music beat its invisible wings against the doors of imagination, there dawned within the listener's mind the possibility of understanding all, of becoming one for a time with the soul of mystery, of loneliness, and of light that lies far within the heart of the African sun. The dancer responded to the change. Her movements became languid. Her hands, held ever at arm's length, yearned towards this mirage of sound. Her naked feet essayed to follow. Her eyes were fixed on the mud and plaster walls, but she did not see them. She gazed beyond. For her, this café, with its sordid entertainment, its scuttering lights, its atmosphere of unwashed humanity, was as though it were not. Her eyes, her wonderful dark eyes, coal-encircled, inscrutable wells of sultry light, depths of dreaming shadow, rested on something which we could not see which we could only surmise to be one with the music, something far off, lost in the great quiet night that hemmed us in with its silence and its stars. And as the eyes followed her, one idea, vague, elusive, yet becoming every moment clearer, more insistent, grew within the watcher's mind. The desert. Ay, that was it. This woman was the personification of the desert. Her dance was its mystery made visible. She suggested to the imagination all that one loved and feared in its illimitable spaces. In her, one realized the existence of the same beauty, the same impassivity, the same sinister possibilities. Abruptly, the music ceased. A wave of relaxed attention, as of a taut bowstring suddenly released, passed over the café. The Arabs resettled themselves in postures of greater ease. Some called for coffee, some resumed interrupted conversations, and the two chess players turned again to their game. From the dancing girl's bench came the sound of giggling, a shrill, inane noise. The old musician seated on the dais stared round him with wide, unseen eyes. He had the helpless air of one snatched suddenly from dreamland. All at once, he sprang to his feet, hobbled rapidly towards the door, and disappeared into the moonlight of the court. The voice of the negro made itself heard above the buzz of conversation. Its tones were angry and loud. He was apparently scolding a servant. The light splashed the ugly walls with great gouts of uncertain color. It gave birth to a yellow haze, through which the café and its crowd of occupants wavered like the world in a drunkard's eye. The atmosphere reeked with the fumes of torches and the fetid odor of perspiration, mingling with the subtle scent of musk that carried the imagination captive with its suggestions of far-off land. 
How like you, Aisha? inquired the soft, languid voice of Si Abdel Muammin. I turned to him. He had addressed the question to Uthman. Aisha, said my guide. He spoke in a wondering whisper. Between his lips, the southern name sounded soft as a caress. His eyes were still riveted on the dancer, who had now begun to collect money from the Arabs. But certainly, continued his friend, still speaking in the French language, she is a novelty. I have seen many dancers, as thou knowest, but never one like her. She has not been here long. They tell me she comes from far south, from the great Sahara. No one knows whence she comes, or what is the name of her tribe. She came here unexpectedly one night with a caravan of Bedouins, accompanied by an old man. But did you say you liked her? Othman muttered something under his breath. I did not catch the words, but his tone sounded full of suppressed impatience, as though he were annoyed with this soft, self-satisfied voice for breaking the engrossing current of his thoughts. The dancer came nearer. Already several pieces of silver adhered to her forehead, attached thereto, as is the Arab custom, by the saliva of the donors. The white metal glittered like stars against the warm brown of her skin. Her movements were still suggestive of the gliding sinuosities of a snake, or the stealthy grace of a panther. As she walked, she swayed slightly from the hips. An air of voluptuous indolence surrounded her like an atmosphere. The long chains of golden coins, depending from her neck, swung to her every movement. The crown surmounting her black hair flashed in the torchlight. It gave her a regal appearance, as though she were some desert queen, exacting tribute from her subjects. Against the dirty plaster of the walls and the nondescript greys of the Arabs, her bright costume glowed like a tropical flower, a thing of hot color and intoxicating perfume. She reached Othman. Slowly she bent her head and looked him full in the eyes. With a hand that trembled visibly, my guide added his offering to those already attached to her forehead. Her face held me breathless. The music spell had fallen from it like a discarded mask and had given place to an alert, appraising vigilance that caused her eyes to gleam bright yet hard as sunlit steel. It was difficult to judge this woman dispassionately. Her beauty and marvelous grace unconsciously influenced the mind in her favor. Yet... As I looked into her face, admiration gave place to a feeling that was almost aversion. Vague, uneasy, unaccountable, caused perchance by the utter callousness of her expression and the absence of all the softer qualities that make for feminine charm. We sat silent, watching her as she glided between the rows of Arabs. The scarlet and gold of her draperies receded into the yellow haze, paused an instant where the torchlight fell upon the vacant space by the doorway, then passed out into the night. End of section 62. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by T.J. Burns. Section 63 of Egypt Africa and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org. Western and Central Africa, Part 1. Unveiling the Dark Continent. Historical Note. There have been three distinct periods of interest in the exploration of Africa. The first began with the efforts of Prince Henry the Navigator of Portugal. He sent one expedition after another down the western coast, and in 1448 a Portuguese company was formed for trading in slaves and gold on the coast of Guinea. Just fifty years later, Vasco da Gama doubled the Cape of Good Hope, sailed up the eastern coast of the great continent, then went across to India and anchored off Calicut. In the second half of the 18th century, a Scotchman named James Bruce, who had been British consul at Algiers, 
set out to look for the source of the Nile. On reaching the head of the Blue Nile, he concluded that his quest had been successful and returned to Cairo in 1773. His story aroused much interest, and 15 years later an association to explore Africa was formed. By this association, Mungo Park was sent out to find the Niger. He succeeded, but on a second trip, he was drowned. During the third period, beginning about the middle of the 19th century, the exploration of Africa has been undertaken not so much for adventure or to carry on trade as to gain scientific knowledge of the land. The most famous of the explorers of this time was Livingstone, though the names of Barth, Speke, Sir Samuel Baker, Du Chelieu, and others are well known. After making numerous discoveries, Livingstone disappeared, and no one knew whether he was living or dead. The New York Herald sent Henry M. Stanley to search for him. The search was successful, and in 1871 the two men met. Stanley went on several other expeditions to Africa, at one time remaining five years. Since then, the interior has been thoroughly explored in all directions, and a Cape to Cairo railroad crossing Africa from north to south is now under construction. End of section 63. This recording is in the public domain. Section 64 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Writing a Charm, about 1795, by Mungo Park. I travelled by the side of the river until sunset, when I came to Kulekuru, a considerable town and a great market for salt. Here I took up my lodging at the house of a Bambaran. Who had formerly been the slave of a moor, and in that character had travelled to Aron, Taudini, and many other places in the great desert. But turning Mussulman, and his master dying at Jeanne, he obtained his freedom, and settled at this place, where he carries on a considerable trade in salt, cotton cloth, etc. His knowledge of the world had not lessened that superstitious confidence in safis, amulets, and charms which he had imbibed in his earlier years. For when he heard that I was a Christian, he immediately thought of procuring a safi, and for this purpose brought out his walla, or writing-board, assuring me that he would dress me a supper of rice if I would write him a safi to protect him from wicked men. The proposal was of too great consequence to me to be refused. I therefore wrote the board full, from top to bottom, on both sides, and my landlord, to be certain of having the whole force of the charm, washed the writing from the board into a calabash with a little water, and having said a few prayers over it, drank this powerful draught. After which, lest a single word should escape, he licked the board until it was quite dry. A Safi writer was a man of too great consequence to be long concealed. The important information was carried to the duty, who sent his son with half a sheet of writing paper, desiring me to write him a nephula safi, a charm to procure wealth. He brought me as a present some bread and milk, and when I had finished the safi, and read it to him with an audible voice, he seemed highly satisfied with his bargain, and promised to bring me in the morning some milk for my breakfast. End of section 64. This recording is in the public domain. Section 65 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 65. A Zealous Missionary. About 1795. By Mungo Park. The King of Futatora inflamed with a zeal for propagating his religion, had sent an embassy to Demel. The ambassador on the present occasion was accompanied by two of the principal Bushreens, who carried each a large knife, fixed on the top of a long pole. As soon as he had procured admission into the presence of Demel, and announced the pleasure of his sovereign, he ordered the Bushreens to present the emblems of his mission. The two knives were accordingly laid before Demel, and the ambassador explained himself as follows. 
With this knife, said he, Abdul Qadar will condescend to shave the head of Demel, if Demel will embrace the Mohammedan faith. And with this other knife, Abdul Qadar will cut the throat of Demel, if Demel refuses to embrace it. Take your choice. Demel coolly told the ambassador that he had no choice to make. He neither chose to have his head shaved nor his throat cut. And with this answer the ambassador was civilly dismissed. Abdul Qadar took his measures accordingly, and with a powerful army invaded Demel's country. The inhabitants of the towns and villages filled up their wells, destroyed their provisions, carried off their effects, and abandoned their dwellings as he approached. By this means he was led on from place to place, until he had advanced three days' journey into the country of the Jalofs. He had indeed met with no opposition, but his army had suffered so much from the scarcity of water that several of his men had died by the way. This induced him to direct his march towards a watering place in the woods, where his men, having quenched their thirst and being overcome with fatigue, lay down carelessly to sleep among the bushes. In this situation they were attacked by Demel before daybreak and completely routed. Many of them were trampled to death as they lay asleep by the Jalof horses. Others were killed in attempting to make their escape, and a still greater number were taken prisoners. Among the latter was Abdul Qadar himself. This ambitious, or rather frantic, prince, who but a month before had sent the threatening message to Demel, was now himself led into his presence as a miserable captive. The behavior of Demel on this occasion is never mentioned by the singing men, but in terms of the highest approbation. And it was indeed so extraordinary in an African prince, that the reader may find it difficult to give credit to the recital. When his royal prisoner was brought before him in irons and thrown upon the ground, the magnanimous Demel, instead of setting his foot upon his neck and stabbing him with his spear according to custom in such cases, addressed him as follows. Abdul Qadar, answer me this question. If the chance of war had placed me in your situation and you in mine, how would you have treated me? I would have thrust my spear into your heart, returned Abdul Qadar with great firmness, and I know that a similar fate awaits me. Not so, said Demel. My spear is indeed red with the blood of your subjects slain in battle, and I could now give it a deeper stain by dipping it in your own. But this would not build up my towns, nor bring to life the thousands who fell in the woods. I will not, therefore, kill you in cold blood, but I will retain you as my slave until I perceive that your presence in your own kingdom will be no longer dangerous to your neighbors, and then I will consider of the proper way of disposing of you. Abdul Qadar was accordingly retained and worked as a slave for three months, at the end of which period Demel listened to the solicitations of the inhabitants of Fudatora and restored to them their king. Strange as this story may appear, I have no doubt of the truth of it. It was told to me at Malakata by the Negroes. It was afterwards related to me by the Europeans on the Gambia, by some of the French at Goree, and confirmed by nine slaves who were taken prisoners along with Abdul Qadar by the watering place in the woods and carried in the same ship with me to the West Indies. End of section sixty five. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 66 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 66. A Visit to King Mosele 1829, by Anne Manning Rathbone. One day, towards the end of 1829, Moffat received two very unexpected visitors. Footnote. Robert Moffat, the well-known missionary. End footnote. They were chiefs from the court of a mighty king in the Far East, whose name was Moselekatse. He was quite beyond the range of ordinary travelers, but the rumor of his dark and terrible deeds has extended far beyond the precincts of the countries immediately surrounding his dominions, and he had heard somewhat of the white men and wanted to know more about them. These visitors were entirely destitute of clothing, and were surprised to find it considered necessary. 
but with the good breeding that is a true mark of high birth and real politeness, were immediately willing to adopt whatever was thought seemly for them. They were shown every mark of attention which they received with a graceful ease that showed they were the nobles of the nation to which they belonged, though they dropped no hint of it themselves. Everything calculated to interest them was shown to them. The dwellings, the walls of the folds and gardens, the water-ditch conveying a large stream of water from the river, and the smith's forge filled them with admiration and astonishment, not of a vulgar, unintelligent kind, but of minds capable of appreciating what was shown and explained to them for the first time. "'You are men. We are but children to you,' said they. "'Mosele Katze must be told of these things.' While standing in the hall of Moffat's house, looking at the strange furniture of a civilized abode, one of them observed a small looking-glass on which he gazed with surprise and admiration. Mrs. Moffat put into his hand one which was considerably larger. He looked intently at his reflected countenance, and never having seen it before, supposed it was one of his attendants on the other side, and abruptly put his hand behind it, telling him to be gone. But looking again at the same face, he cautiously turned it and seeing nothing he returned the glass with great gravity to mrs moffat saying that he could not trust it nothing appeared to strike them so forcibly as the public worship in the chapel they saw men behaving themselves with the utmost decorum mothers stilling their babes or carrying them out if they cried and children sitting perfectly still and silent the order and fervor which pervaded the services bewildered their minds and they were surprised that the hymns they heard sung were not war songs these chiefs told Moffat that they were under considerable doubt of being able to return home in safety, as they had heard that the Betuana tribes were plotting to waylay and destroy them, and they asked his advice. After consultation with Mrs. Moffat and Mr. Hamilton, he offered to accompany them as far as the Bahurutse country, from whence they could proceed without difficulty to their own land and people. The strangers most gratefully accepted this kind offer, their eyes glistening with delight. A wagon was hired for their accommodation in addition to Moffat's own. The delightful results of Christian fellowship were apparent in the friendliness and generosity of the residents at the station in offering little gifts as keepsakes to their visitors, whom, in their unconverted state, they could only have cursed in their hearts and perhaps with their lips. Having obtained a sufficient number of volunteers to accompany him on what some thought a very hazardous journey, Moffat started with his grateful friends on the ninth of November. Though the road had its perils from wild beasts, there were none from the natives. Having safely conveyed his companions to the Bahurutsi, he was then about to take leave of them, but they so earnestly begged him to add to his kindness by accompanying them to their own country, that at length he consented. The country through which they now travelled was quite different from that which they had left. It was mountainous and wooded, and had numerous streams of excellent water, but the surrounding stillness was often broken by the lion's roar. Having reached the outposts of Mosele-Katsi's dominions, Moffat was again purposing to return home. But the two chiefs arose, and Umbate, the elder of them, laid his right hand on his shoulder and his left on his own breast, and said very earnestly, My father, you have been our guardian. We are yours. And will you leave us? Yonder dwells the great Mosele-Katsi, and how shall we approach his presence if you are not with us? If you love us still, save us for when we shall have told our news he will ask why our conduct gave you pain and induced your return. And before the sun goes down, we shall be ordered for execution because you are not with us. Look at me and my companion and tell us, if you can, that you will not go, for we had better die here than in the sight of our people. He argued, but to no effect. Are you afraid? said the other. No, said Moffat. Then pursued Umbate. It remains with you to save our lives and our wives and children from sorrow. It must be owned that they were adepts in persuasion, and in short Moffat yielded to their great joy as well as to that of his own attendants. On the surface of the country through which they now travelled lay the ruins of innumerable towns, showing what disastrous wars must have raged to render them now without inhabitants. Heaps of stone and rubbish were mingled with human skulls which told their ghastly tale. Passing over some hills to the right, they fell in, to their surprise, with Berend and a large hunting party, with whom had travelled a Wesleyan missionary named Archbell, who had gone on three days before to visit Mosele Katze, who, however, had refused to see him. 
On approaching the capital, one of the chiefs went forward to appear before the king and pave the way for his companions. There, said Mbate, pointing to the crown, dwells the great king Pezulu, that is, king of heaven, the elephant, the lion's paw, with many other sounding titles. Moffat, Mr. Archbell, and two others mounted their horses and rode directly to the town. On entering the great fold, which was capable of holding ten thousand head of cattle, they were rather taken by surprise to find it lined by eight hundred warriors, besides two hundred who were concealed on each side of the entrance as if in ambush. They were beckoned to dismount, which they did, holding the horses' bridles in their hands. The warriors of the gate instantly rushed in with hideous yells that frightened the horses, and then fell into rank with as much order as if they had been accustomed to European tactics. All was silent as the grave, while the men were motionless as statues. Eyes only were seen to move, and there was a rich display of fine white teeth. After some minutes of profound silence the war-song burst forth. There was harmony, it is true, but of a terrific kind, especially when they imitated the groans of the dying and the yells and hissings of the conquerors. After another profound silence, during which the missionary still stood at pause, out marched the monarch from behind the lines, followed by a number of men bearing baskets and bowls of food. He came up to his visitors, and gave each a clumsy but hearty shake of the hand. He then turned to the food which had been placed at their feet, and politely invited them to partake of it. By this time the wagons appeared in the distance, and the missionaries having requested him to inform them where they should take up their quarters, he accompanied them, holding Moffat by the arm, though not in the most graceful way, yet with perfect ease and familiarity. "'The land is before you,' said he heartily. "'You are come to your son. You may sleep where you please.' When the moving houses, as he called the wagons, drew near, he grasped Moffat's arm very tightly, and, though himself the terror of thousands, looked on them with fear, as doubtful whether they were not living creatures. When the oxen were unyoked, he approached the wagons with the utmost caution, still holding Moffat with one hand and laying the other on his mouth in token of surprise. He examined them intently, especially the wheels, and could not think how the large band of iron surrounding the fellows of the wheel came to be all in one piece. Umbate stepped forward to explain. My eyes saw that very hand, said he, pointing to Moffat's, cut those bars of iron, take a piece off one end, and then join them as you see. Did he give medicine to the iron, asked the king in surprise. No, replied Umbate. He used nothing but fire, a hammer, and a chisel. Moselekatse then returned to the town, where the warriors still standing as he had left them received him with immense bursts of applause. Moselekatse did not fail to supply his visitors abundantly with meat, milk, and a harmless kind of beer. He seemed desirous to please and to appear to the best advantage. The following day he treated them to a grand public ball in their honor, and asked Moffat if he had seen anything equal to it in his own country. He afterwards said to him, My father, you have made my heart as white as milk. I cease not to wonder at the love of a stranger. You never saw me before, but you loved me more than my own people. You fed me when I was hungry. You clothed me when I was naked. And taking Moffat's right arm in his hand, that arm shielded me from my enemies. You did it to these two men. You clothed them. You fed them. You protected them. You did it unto me. Thus ended the Saturday of this eventful week. The following morning was marked by a melancholy display of the so-called heroism which prefers death to dishonor. The king gave a great feast. Many oxen had been slaughtered. Everybody was merry except one of his chief officers, called an Intuna. This young man had been guilty of an unpardonable crime and was sentenced to immediate death by being thrown from a rock into a river full of crocodiles, which would devour him in an instant. There was not a tear in his bright black eye, but he looked very sad, while Moffat begged his life of the king. The Intuna knelt before him. Moselekatse said while everybody listened in the deepest silence, You are a dead man, but I shall do today what I never did before. I spare your life for the sake of my friend and father, pointing to Moffat. I know his heart weeps at the shedding of blood. For his sake I spare your life. He has traveled from a far country to see me, and he has made my heart white. But he told me that to take away life is an awful thing and can never be repaired. 
I wish him, when he returns to his own home, to return with a heart as wide as he has made mine. I spare you for his sake, for I love him, and he has saved the lives of my people. But you must be degraded for life. You must no more associate with the nobles of the land, nor enter into the assemblies of the princes of the people. Go to the poor of the field, and let your companions henceforth be the inhabitants of the deserts. The sentence passed. The pardoned man was expected to bow in grateful adoration to him who he was accustomed to look upon and exalt in songs, only applicable to one whom belongs universal dominion. But no. Holding his hands clasped on his bosom, he replied, O king, afflict not my heart. I have merited thy displeasure. Let me be slain like the warrior. I cannot live with the poor. And raising his hand to the ring he wore on his brow, he continued, how can I live among the dogs of the king, and disgrace these badges of honour which I won among the spears and shields of the mighty? No, I cannot live. Let me die, O Pezulu. His request was granted, and his hands tied erect over his head. Moffat's exertions to save his life were in vain. He disdained the boon on the conditions offered, preferring to die with the honours he had won at the point of the spear, which even the act that condemned him did not tarnish. He was led forth, a man walking on each side, till he reached the top of a precipice over which he was precipitated into the deep pool of the river beneath, where the crocodiles, accustomed to such meals, were waiting to devour him. End of section 66. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 67 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Philip Gould The Mountain with Several Caves by David Livingston 1854 Livingston brought with him to the town of Luanda a party of the tribe known as Makalolo. This was their first visit to a city. The editor. Everyone remarked the serious deportment of the Makalolo. They viewed the large stone houses and churches in the vicinity of that great ocean with awe. A house with two stories was until now beyond their comprehension. In explanation of this strange thing I had always been obliged to use the word for hut, and as huts are constructed by the poles being let into the earth, they never could comprehend how the poles of one hut could be founded upon the roof of another, or how men could live in the upper story, with the conical roof of the lower one in the middle. Some Makalolo who had visited my little house at Kolobeng, in trying to describe it to their countrymen at Lignanti, said, It is not a hut. It is a mountain with several caves in it. Commander Bedingfield and Captain Skane invited them to visit their vessels, the Pluto and Philomel. Knowing their fears, I told them that no one need go if he entertained the least suspicion of foul play. Nearly the whole party went, and when on deck I pointed to the sailors and said, now these are my countrymen, sent by our queen for the purpose of putting down the trade of those that buy and sell black men. They replied, truly, they are just like you. And all their fears seemed to vanish at once, for they went forward among the men, and the jolly tars, acting much as the Makalolo would have done in similar circumstances, handed them a share of the bread and beef which they had for dinner. The commander allowed them to fire off a cannon, and having the most exalted ideas of its power, they were greatly pleased when I told them that is what they put down the slave trade with. The size of the brig of war amazed them. It is not a canoe at all. It is a town. The sailor's deck they named the Katla, and then, as a climax to their description of this great ark, added, And what sort of a town is it that you must climb up into with a rope? End of section 67. This recording is in the public domain. Section 68 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Devorah Allen. A Magic Lantern in Africa, 1854, by David Livingstone. Shinte was most anxious to see the pictures of the magic lantern, but fever had so weakening an effect, and I had such violent action of the heart, with buzzing in the ears, that I could not go for several days. When I did go for the purpose, he had his principal men and the same crowd of court beauties near him as at the reception. The first picture exhibited was Abraham about to slaughter his son Isaac. 
it was shown as large as life, and the uplifted knife was in the act of striking the lad. The Bolonda men remarked that the picture was much more like a god than the things of wood or clay that they worshipped. I explained that this man was the first of a race to whom God had given the Bible we now held, and that among his children our Saviour appeared. The ladies listened with silent awe, but when I moved the slide, the uplifted dagger moving toward them, they thought it was to be sheathed in their bodies instead of Isaac's. "'Mother! Mother!' all shouted at once, and off they rushed helter-skelter, tumbling pell-mell over each other, and over the little idol huts and tobacco bushes. We could not get one of them back again. Shinte, however, sat bravely through the hole, and afterward examined the instrument with interest. End of section 68. This recording is in the public domain. Section 69 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Devora Allen. The Electric Wind of the Desert. 1854 by David Livingstone. Occasionally, during the very hot seasons which succeed our winter and precede our rains, a hot wind blows over the desert from north to south. It feels somewhat as if it came from an oven, and seldom blows longer at a time than three days. It resembles in its effects the Harmattan of the north of Africa, and at the time the missionaries first settled in the country, it came loaded with fine reddish-colored sand. Though no longer accompanied by sand, it is so devoid of moisture as to cause the wood of the best-seasoned English boxes and furniture to shrink, so that every wooden article not made in the country is warped. The verls of ramrods made in England are loosened, and on returning to Europe, fastened again. This wind is in such an electric state that a bunch of ostrich feathers held a few seconds against it becomes as strongly charged as if attached to a powerful electric machine and clasps the advancing hand with a sharp, crackling sound. When this hot wind is blowing, and even at other times, the peculiarly strong electrical state of the atmosphere causes the movement of a native in his carosse to produce therein a stream of small sparks. The first time I noticed this appearance was while a chief was traveling with me in my wagon. Seeing part of the fur of his mantle, which was exposed to slight friction by the movement of the wagon, assume quite a luminous appearance, I rubbed it smartly with the hand, and found it readily gave out bright sparks, accompanied with distinct cracks. "'Don't you see this?' said I. "'The white men did not show us this,' he replied. "'We had it long before white men came into this country. We and our forefathers of old.'" End of section 69. This recording is in the public domain. Section 70 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Read for LibriVox.org by Robin Cook. The Merman Missionary, 1854, by David Livingstone. Our friends informed us that Shinte would be highly honored by the presence of three white men in his town at once. Two others had sent forward notice of their approach from another quarter, the West. Could it be Barth or Kropf? How pleasant to meet with Europeans in such an out-of-the-way region. The rush of thoughts made me almost forget my fever. Are they of the same color as I am? Yes, exactly so. And have the same hair? Is that hair? We thought it was a wig. We never saw the like before. This white man must be of the sort that lives in the sea. Henceforth my men took the hint and always sounded my praises as a true specimen of the variety of white men who live in the sea. Only look at his hair. It is made quite straight by the sea water. I explained to them again and again that, when it was said we came out of the sea, it did not mean that we came from beneath the water, but the fiction has been widely spread in the interior by the Mumbari that the real white men live in the sea, and the myth was too good not to be taken advantage of by my companions. So, notwithstanding my injunctions, I believed that, when I was out of hearing, my men always represented themselves as led by a genuine merman. Just see his hair! If I returned from walking to a little distance, they would remark of some to whom they had been holding forth, 
These people want to see your hair. As the strangers had woolly hair like themselves, I had to give up the idea of meeting anything more European than two half-case Portuguese engaged in trading for slaves, ivory, and beeswax. End of Section 70 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Robin Cook, Flagstaff, Arizona, July 2018section 71 of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the world story volume 3 egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section 71 how i found livingston by sir henry m stanley 1871. David Livingston was a celebrated African explorer and missionary. After many years in Africa, he was lost sight of, and it was generally believed that he was dead. James Gordon Bennett, proprietor of the New York Herald, determined to send the young reporter, who was afterwards known as Sir Henry M. Stanley, in search of him. Mr. Bennett was then in Paris. Five hours after receiving his telegram, come to Paris on important business, Mr. Stanley was on his way to learn what was wanted of him. He arrived at night. The Editor I went straight to the Grand Hotel and knocked at the door of Mr. Bennett's room. Come in, I heard a voice say. Entering, I found Mr. Bennett in bed. Who are you? he asked. My name is Stanley, I answered. Ah, yes. Sit down. I have important business on hand for you. After throwing over his shoulder his robe de chambre, Mr. Bennett asked, Where do you think Livingston is? I really do not know, sir. Do you think he is alive? He may be. Then he may not be, I answered. Well, I think he is alive and that he can be found, and I am going to send you to find him. What? said I. Do you really think I can find Dr. Livingston? Do you mean me to go to Central Africa? Yes. I mean that you shall go and find him wherever you may hear that he is, and to get what news you can of him, and perhaps, delivering himself thoughtfully and deliberately, the old man may be in want. Take enough with you to help him should he require it. Of course you will act according to your own plans and do what you think best, but find Livingston. Said I, wondering at the cool order of sending one to Central Africa to search for a man whom I, in common with almost all other men, believe to be dead, have you considered seriously the great expense you are likely to incur on account of this little journey? What will it cost? he asked abruptly. Burton and Speak's journey to Central Africa costs between 3,000 and 5,000 pounds, and I fear it cannot be done under 2,500 pounds. Well, I will tell you what you will do. Draw a 1,000 pounds now, and when you have gone through that, draw another 1,000, and when that is spent, draw another 1,000, and so on, but find Livingston. Two years later, the following scene took place. We were now about three hundred yards from the village of Mujiji, and the crowds are dense about me. Suddenly I hear a voice on my right say, Good morning, sir. Startled at hearing this greeting in the midst of such a crowd of black people, I turn sharply around in search of the man and see him at my side with the blackest of faces, but animated and joyous. A man dressed in a long white shirt, with a turban of American sheeting around his woolly head. And I ask, who the mischief are you? I am Susie, the servant of Dr. Livingston, said he, smiling and showing a gleaming row of teeth. What? Is Dr. Livingston here? Yes, sir. In this village? Yes, sir. Are you sure? Sure, sure, sir. Why, I leave him just now. Good morning, sir, said another voice. Hello, said I. Is this another one? Yes, sir. Well, what is your name? My name is Chuma, sir. What? Are you Chuma? 
The friend of Wakotani? Yes, sir. And is the doctor well? Not very well, sir. Where has he been so long? In Manuima. Now you, Susie, run and tell the doctor I am coming. Yes, sir. And off he darted like a madman. But by this time we were within two hundred yards of the village, and the multitude was getting denser and almost preventing our march. Flags and streamers were out. Arabs and Wangwana were pushing their way through the natives in order to greet us, for according to their account we belonged to them. But the great wonder of all was, how did you come from Anyanyembe? Soon Susi came running back and asked me my name. He had told the doctor that I was coming, but the doctor was too surprised to believe him. And when the doctor asked him my name, Susi was rather staggered. But during Susi's absence, the news had been conveyed to the doctor that it was surely a white man that was coming, whose guns were firing and whose flag could be seen, and the great Arab magnates of Ujiji, Muhammad bin Sali, Said bin Majid, Abid bin Suleiman, Muhammad bin Garib, and others had gathered together before the doctor's house, and the doctor had come out from his veranda to discuss the matter and await my arrival. In the meantime, the head of the expedition had halted, and the Kirangozi was out of the ranks, holding his flag aloft, and Selim said to me, I see the doctor, sir. Oh, what an old man! He has got a white beard. And I, what would I not have given for a bit of friendly wilderness, where unseen I might vent my joy in some mad freak, such as idiotically biting my hand, turning a somersault or slashing at trees, in order to allay those exciting feelings that were well-nigh uncontrollable? My heart beats fast, but I must not let my face betray my emotions, lest it shall detract from the dignity of a white man appearing under such extraordinary circumstances. So I did that which I thought was most dignified. I pushed back the crowds, and passing from the rear, walked down a living avenue of people until I came in front of the semicircle of Arabs, in the front of which stood the white man with the gray beard. As I advanced slowly towards him, I noticed he was pale, looked wearied, had a gray beard, wore a bluish cap with a faded gold band around it, had on a red-sleeved waistcoat and a pair of gray tweed trousers. I would have run to him, only I was a coward in the presence of such a mob. Would have embraced him, only he being an Englishman, I did not know how he would receive me. So I did what cowardice and false pride suggested was the best thing. Walked deliberately to him, took off my hat, and said, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Yes, said he, with a kind smile, lifting his cap slightly. I replace my hat on my head, and he puts on his cap, and we both grasp hands, and I then say aloud, I thank God, doctor, I have been permitted to see you. He answered, I feel thankful that I am here to welcome you. I turn to the Arabs, take off my hat to them in response to the saluting chorus of Yambos I receive, and the doctor introduces them to me by name. Then oblivious of the crowds, oblivious of the men who shared with me my dangers, we, Livingston and I, turn our faces towards his timbe. He points to the veranda, or rather mud platform, under the broad overhanging eaves. He points to his own particular seat, which I see his age and experience in Africa have suggested, namely a straw mat with a goatskin over it, and another skin nailed against the wall to protect his back from contact with the cold mud. I protest against taking this seat, which so much more befits him than me, but the doctor will not yield. I must take it. We are seated, the doctor and I, with our backs to the wall. The Arabs take seats on our left. More than a thousand natives are in our front, filling the whole square densely, indulging their curiosity, and discussing the fact of two white men meeting at Ujiji, one just come from Manuema, in the west, and the other from Unyanyembe, in the east. Conversation began. What about? I declare I have forgotten. Oh, we mutually ask questions of one another, such as, How did you come here? And, Where have you been all this long time? The world has believed you to be dead. Yes, that was the way it began. But whatever the doctor himself informed me, and that which I communicated to him, I cannot correctly report. For I found myself gazing at him conning the wonderful man at whose side I now sat in Central Africa. Every hair of his head and beard, every wrinkle of his face, the wanness of his features, and the slightly wearied look he wore, were all imparting intelligence to me. 
the knowledge I had craved for so much ever since I heard the words, Take what you want, but find Livingston. End of section 71. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 72 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by phone. Western and Central Africa, Part 2, Adventures in the African Jungle, Historical Note. Du Chaillou had an exceedingly good preparation for his work as an African explorer, for he spent his youth on the west coast of Africa, where his father was trader and consul. When only twenty years of age, he set out on an exploration of that part of West Africa lying between two degrees north and two degrees south. He knew the native languages, and with only African helpers he travelled on foot more than eight thousand miles. He was probably the first white man who ever saw gorillas, and his reports of the behaviour of these animals, and of the tribes of pygmies that he had met, indeed of the extent of his explorations in general, were bitterly attacked. Du Chaillou had only used a compass, and so could not prove his records of travel, but he now set to work to learn how to use a camera and various kinds of astronomical instruments. Then he started on a second trip. Meanwhile, others had followed in his footsteps, and proof of his accuracy was afforded in generous supply. Nevertheless, he made a second journey to equatorial Africa. Later he made explorations in Scandinavia and in Russia. He died in 1903, at the age of 68. Less is known of Africa, especially of its central portion, than of any other continent. Its value, however, is so evident that during the last quarter of a century there has been a wild scramble among the countries of Europe for African possessions. England, Germany, Portugal, France, and Italy hold either vast areas of land or spheres of influence, that is, land which they claim the right to occupy and develop. Abyssinia and the Little Republic of Liberia are the only countries of Africa which are free to carry on their own government as they choose. End of section 72. This recording is in the public domain. Section 73 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 73. The Village of Dwarfs, about 1870, by Paul du Chaillu. The day after I had done before the Ashangos the wonderful things I have described to you as I was seated under the veranda of the king with mokonga and a few ashango elders i began to talk of the country and i said to them people say that there are dwarfs living in the forest is it so ashangos how far are they from niembuai at no great distance from this spot said the chief there is a village of them but o oh, guizi if you want to see them you must not go to them with a large number of attendants you must go in a small party take one of your comey men and i will give you my nephew who knows the dwarfs to go with you you must walk as cautiously as possible in the forest for those dwarfs are like antelopes and gazelles they are shy and easily frightened to see them you must take them by surprise no entreaty of ours could induce them to stay in their settlements if they knew you were coming if you are careful to-morrow we shall see them for as sure as i live there are dwarfs in the forest and they are called obongos early the next morning the ashango chief called one of his nephews and another ashango and ordered them to show me the way to the country of the dwarfs so we got ready to start i taking three of my comey men with me rabuka agalo and makandai i had put on a pair of light india rubber boots in order not to make any noise in the forest before leaving i gave a large bunch of beads to one of the ashango men and told him as soon as we made our appearance in the village to shout obongos do not run away look here at the beads which the spirit brings to you 
the spirit is your friend do not be afraid he comes only to see you after leaving niembuai we walked through the forest in the most cautious manner and as we approached the settlement the ashango man who was in the lead turned his head towards us put a finger on his lips for us to be silent and made a sign for us to walk very carefully and we advanced with more circumspection than ever after a while we came to the settlement of the dwarfs over a small area the undergrowth had been partially cut away and there stood twelve queer little houses which were the habitations of these strange people but not a dwarf was to be seen they had all gone nobody here shouted the ashangos and the echo of their voices alone disturbed the stillness of the forest i looked around at this strange little settlement of living dwarfs there was no mistake about it the fires were lighted the smoke ascended from the interior of their little shelters on a bed of charcoal embers there was a piece of snake roasting before another were two rats cooking on the ground there were several baskets of nuts and one of berries with some large wild fruits that had been gathered by the dwarfs in the woods while near by stood several calabashes filled with water and some bundles of dried fish there was indeed no mistake the huts i had seen on my way to niembuai were the same as these and had been made surely by the same race of dwarfs the ashogos had told me no idle stories i wish you could have seen the faces of rebuka igalo and makandai oh 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 they exclaimed shali what are we not going to see in the wild countries you bring us to these people must be niamas beasts for look said they pointing to their huts the shelters of the nshiego mbuve are quite as good i lingered a long while in the hope that the dwarfs would return but they did not we called for them but our voices were lost we followed some of their tracks but it was of no use you cannot overtake them said the ashangos for they can run through the jungle as fast as a gazelle and as silently as a snake and they are far off now they are afraid of you before leaving their settlement i hung on the lower branches of trees surrounding their village strings of beads of bright colours which i carried with me in my hunting-bag for i always had some ready to give away whenever i wanted to do so i had red white and yellow beads with me that day and the trees looked gay with these strings hanging from them we had taken goat meat for the dwarfs and i hung up three legs of goats also and several plantains and i put a little salt on a leaf near a hut and we departed so i hoped that the dwarf seeing what we had left behind us would become emboldened and see that we did not desire to do them harm and that the next time they would not be afraid of us i was pleased to perceive on our arrival in the evening at niembuai that the ashangos seemed glad to see us again though the chief was quite disappointed that we had not seen the little abongos that evening the ashangos clustered around me and wanted me to talk to them not in their own language but in the language of the oguizi spirits so i talked to them and their wonder was great and i read to them from a book all of them listening the while with their mouths wide open then i took my journal and read to them aloud in english and after reading the part which related to what i had done in the ishogo village of mokanga i translated it to them to the great delight of the ishogos the part i read related to my arrival in mokanga how the people were afraid of me and what warm friends we became and how the villagers said i had moved the big boulder of granite at this there was a tremendous shout then i said ashangos the aguizis do not forget anything what i write will always be remembered now i will read you something we have from an aguizi who wrote about dwarfs the name of that aguizi was herodotus and yours shouted the ashangos is shali that aguizi herodotus i continued wrote about what he heard and what he saw just as i do long long ago before any tree of the forest round you had come out of the ground i could not count in their language and say about 
two thousand three hundred years ago that oguizi herodotus travelled just as i am travelling to-day oh oh shouted the ashangos mamo mamo shouted the ishogos listen listen said my comi men in english for they all now could talk a little english and he writes i did hear indeed what i will now relate from certain natives of cyrene once upon a time when they were on a visit to the oracular shrine of amon when it chanced in the course of conversation with the tiarchus the ammonian king the talk fell upon the nile how that its source was unknown to all men etiarchus upon this mentioned that some nasamonians had come to his court and when asked if they could give any information concerning the uninhabited parts of libya had told the following tale the nasamonians are a libyan race who occupy the sotes an tract of no great size toward the east they said there had grown up among them some wild young men the sons of certain chiefs who when they came to man's estate indulged in all manner of extravagances and among other things drew lots for five of their number to go and explore the desert parts of libya and try if they could not penetrate farther than any had done previously the coast of libya along the sea which washes it to the north throughout its entire length from egypt to cape soloeus which is its farthest point is inhabited by libyans of many distinct tribes who possess the whole tract except certain portions which belong to the phoenicians and the greeks above the coast-line and the country inhabited by the maritime tribes libya is full of wild beasts while beyond the wild beast region there is a tract which is wholly sand and very scant of water and utterly and entirely a desert the young men therefore dispatched on this errand by their comrades with a plentiful supply of water and provisions travelled at first through the inhabited region passing which they came to the wild beast tract whence they finally entered upon the desert which they proceeded to cross in a direction from east to west after journeying for many days over a wide extent of land they came at last to a plain where they observed trees growing approaching them and seeing fruit on them they proceeded to gather it while they were thus engaged there came upon them some dwarfish men under the middle height who seized them and carried them off the nasamonians did not understand a word of their language nor had they any acquaintance with the language of the nasamonians they were carried across extensive marshes and finally came to a city in which all the men were of a height of their conductors and dark complexioned a great river flowed by the city running from west to east and containing crocodiles etearchus conjectured this river to be the nile and reason favours this idea oh oh shouted my comi men it is no wonder that the white man forgets nothing shali will what you write about the strange things we see be remembered in the same manner with what that man herodotus wrote i do not know said i if the white people think that what we saw is worthy of preservation it will be remembered if not it will be forgotten but never mind i said let us see for ourselves and what a tale we shall have to tell to our people on our return for what we see no other men have ever seen before us after my story of herodotus the shades of evening had come and a great ashango dance took place how wild how strange the dancing was in the temple or house of the mabuiti idol the idol was a huge representation of a woman and it stood at the end of the temple which was about fifty feet in length and only ten feet broad the extremity of the building where the mabuiti was kept was also dark and looked weird by the light of the torches as i entered it was painted in red white and black along the walls on each side were ashango men seated on the ground each having a lighted torch before him in the centre were two mabuiti men doctor priests dressed with fibres of trees round their waist each had one side of his face painted white and the other side red down the middle of the breast they had a broad yellow stripe and the hollow of the eye was painted yellow they make these different colours from different woods the colouring matter of which they mix with clay all the ashangos were also streaked and daubed with various colours 
and by the light of their torches they looked like a troop of devils assembled on the earth to celebrate some diabolical rite round their legs were bound sharp pointed white leaves from the heart of the palm tree some wore feathers others had leaves behind their ears and all had a bundle of palm leaves in their hands they did not stir when i came in i told them not to stop that i came only to look at them they began by making all kinds of contortions and set up a deafening howl of wild songs there was an orchestra of instrumental performers near the idol consisting of three drummers beating as hard as they could with their sticks on two nagomas tam-tams one harper and another man strumming with all his might on a sounding-board the two mbuiti men danced in a most fantastic manner jumping and twisting their bodies into all sorts of shapes and contortions every time the mbuiti men opened their mouths to speak a dead silence ensued now and then the men would all come and dance round the mbuiti men and then they would all face the idol dance before it and sing songs of praise to it i could not stand this noise long so i left my ashangos to enjoy themselves and as usual before retiring ordered my men to keep their watch in a proper manner don't be disheartened said the chief of niembuai to me after my unsuccessful attempt to see the dwarfs i told you before that the little obongos were as shy as the antelopes and gazelles of the woods you have seen for yourself now that what i said was true if you are careful when you go again to their settlement you will probably surprise them only don't wait long before going again for they may move away before sunrise the next morning we started again for the settlement of the little dwarfs we were still more cautious than before in going through the jungle this time we took another direction to reach them lest perhaps they might be watching the path by which we had come before after a while i thought i saw through the trunks of the trees ahead of us several little houses of the dwarfs i kept still and immediately gave a sign to make my guides maintain silence they obeyed me on the instant and we lay motionless on the ground hardly daring to breathe there was no mistake about it we could see as we peeped through the trees the houses of the dwarfs but there seemed to be no life there no obongos we kept watching for more than half an hour in breathless silence when lo rebuka gave a tremendous sneeze i looked at him i wish you had seen his face another sneeze was coming and he was trying hard to prevent it and made all sorts of faces but the look i gave him was enough i suppose and the second sneeze was suppressed then we got up and entered a little settlement of the dwarfs there was not one of them there the village had been abandoned the leaves over the little houses were dry and while we were looking all round suddenly our bodies were covered with swarms of fleas which drove us out faster than we came it was awful for they did bite savagely as if they had not had anything to feed upon for a whole month we continued to walk very carefully and after a while we came near another settlement of the dwarfs which was situated in the densest part of the forest i see the huts we crossed the little stream from which the dwarfs drew their water to drink how careful we are as we walk toward their habitations our bodies bent almost double in order not to be easily discovered i am excited oh i would give so much to see the dwarfs to speak to them how craftily we advance how cautious we are for fear of alarming the shy inmates my ashango guides hold bunches of beads i see that the beads we had hung to the trees have been taken away all our caution was in vain the dwarf saw us and ran away in the woods we rushed but it was too late they had gone but as we came into the settlement i thought i saw three creatures lying flat on the ground and crawling through their small doors into their houses when we were in the very midst of the settlement i shouted is there anybody here no answer the ashango shouted is there anybody here no answer i said to the ashangos i am certain that i have seen some of the dwarfs go into their huts then they shouted again is there anybody here the same silence turning toward me my guide said oguizi your eyes have deceived you there is no one here they have all fled they are afraid of you i am not mistaken i answered i went with one ashango toward one of the huts where i thought i had seen one of the dwarfs go inside to hide and as i came to the little door 
i shouted again is there anybody here no answer the ashango shouted is there anybody inside no answer i told you o Gweezy, that they have all run away it did seem queer to me that i should have suffered an optical delusion i was perfectly sure that i had seen three dwarfs get inside of their huts perhaps they have broken through the back part and have escaped said i so i walked round their little houses but everything was right nothing had gone outside through the walls in order to make sure i came again to the door and shouted nobody here the same silence i lay flat on the ground put my head inside of the door and again shouted nobody here it was so dark inside that coming from the light i could not see so i extended my arm in order to feel if there was any one within sweeping my arm from left to right at first i touched an empty bed composed of three sticks then feeling carefully i moved my arm gradually toward the right when hallo what do i feel a leg which i immediately grabbed above the ankle and a piercing shriek startled me it was the leg of a human being and that human being a dwarf i had got hold of a dwarf don't be afraid the spirit will do you no harm said my ashango guide don't be afraid i said in the ashango language and i immediately pulled the creature i had seized by the leg through the door in the midst of great excitement among my comey men a dwarf i shouted as the little creature came out a woman i shouted again a pygmy the little creature shrieked looking at me nechende 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 said she oh 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 yo 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 and her piercing wail rent the air what a sight i had never seen the like what said i now i do see the dwarfs of equatorial africa the dwarfs of homer herodotus the dwarfs of the ancients how queer the little old woman looked how frightened she was she trembled all over she was neither white nor black she was of a yellow or mulatto colour what a little head what a little body what a little hand what a little foot i exclaimed oh what queer-looking hair said i bewildered the hair grew on the head in little tufts apart from each other and the face was as wrinkled as a baked apple i cannot tell you how delighted i was at my discovery so giving my little prize to one of the ashangos and ordering my comey men to catch her if she tried to run away i went to the other little dwelling where i thought i had seen another of the dwarfs hide himself the two little huts stood close together i shouted nobody here no answer then i did what i had done before and getting my head inside of the hut through the door again shouted nobody here no answer i moved my right hand to see if i could feel anybody when lo i seized a leg and immediately heard a shriek i pulled another strange little dwarf out of the door it was also a woman not quite so old as the first but having exactly the same appearance the two dwarf women looked at each other and began to cry and sing mournful songs as if they expected to be killed i said to them be not frightened then the ashangos called to the last dwarf who had hid to come out that it was no use i had seen them all they had hardly spoken when i saw a little head peeping out of the door and my ashangos made the creature come out it was a woman also who began crying and the trio shrieked and cried and cried and shrieked wringing their hands till they got tired they thought their last day had come don't be afraid said the ashangos the oguizi is a good oguizi don't be afraid said my comey men after a while they stopped crying and began to look at me more quietly for the first time i was able to look carefully at these little dwarfs they were yellow their faces being exactly the same colour as the chimpanzee the palms of their hands were almost as white as those of white people they seemed well proportioned but their eyes had an untamable wildness that struck me at once they had thick lips and flat noses like the negroes their foreheads were low and narrow and their cheekbones prominent and their hair which grew in little short tufts was black with a reddish tinge after a while i thought i heard a rustling in one of the little houses so i went there and looking inside saw it filled with the tiniest children they were exceedingly shy when they saw me they hid their heads just as young dogs or kittens would do and got into a huddle and kept still these were the little dwarfish children who had remained in the village under the care of the three women while the dwarfs had gone into the forest to collect their evening meal 
that is to say nuts fruits and berries and to see if the traps they had set had caught any game i immediately put beads around the necks of the women gave them a leg of wild boar and some plantains and told them to tell their people to remain and not to be afraid i gave some meat to the little children who as soon as i showed it to them seized it just in the same manner that fighting joe or ugly tom would have done only instead of fighting they ran away immediately very queer specimens these little children seemed to be they were if anything lighter in colour than the older people and they were such little bits of things that they reminded me i could not help it of the chimpanzees and the neshiegur babubes i had captured at different times though their heads were much larger i waited in vain the other inhabitants did not come back they were afraid of me i told the women that the next day i should return and bring them meat for they are said to be very fond of it and plenty of beads after several visits to the settlement of the dwarfs we became friends but it took time my great friend among them was masunda an old woman the first one i had seen and whom i pulled out of her own house but i had some trouble before i could tame friend masunda one day i thought i would surprise the dwarfs and come on them unawares without having told my friend masunda i was coming when i made my appearance i just caught a glimpse of her feet as she was running into her house that was all i saw of masunda at all the other huts little branches of trees had been stuck up in front to show that the inmates were out and that their doors were shut and that nobody could get in these were indeed queer doors i had never seen the like they were of little use except for keeping out the dogs and wild beasts when i went in masunda's hut and got hold of her she pretended to have been asleep so after all these little dwarfs said i know how to lie and how to deceive just as well as other people upon one of my visits to the village i saw two other women a man and two children all the other obongos had gone so i made friends with them by giving them meat and beads i saw that the women were not the mothers of the children i looked at the doors of all the huts they all had branches put at the entrance to signify that the owner was out i do not know why but i began to suspect that the mother of the children was in the settlement and close by where they stood i had my eyes upon one of the little houses as the one where she was hiding so i put aside the branches at the entrance and putting half of my body into the hut i succeeded in discovering in the dark something which i recognized after a while as a human being don't be afraid i said don't be afraid repeated my ashango guides the creature was a woman she came out with a sad countenance and began to weep she had over her forehead a broad stripe of yellow ochre she was a widow and had buried her husband only a few days before where is the burial ground of the dwarfs i asked of my ashango guides ask her said i to them no spirit said they for if you ask them such a question these dwarfs will fear you more than ever and you will never see them any more they will flee far away into the thickest part of the forest we ashango people do not know even where they bury their dead they have no regular burial ground how could they added my guide for they roam in the forest like the gorilla the nishiego mabube the kulu kamba and the nishiego i believe said the ashango that all these dwarfs have come from the same father and the same mother long long ago another time i came to the village of the obongos with two legs of goats a leg of wild boar ten house rats which had been trapped a large dead snake and two land turtles which i intended to give as a feast to the obongos rebuka makanda and igalo were with me and several ashango women accompanied us we had several bunches of plantain for i resolved to give them a regular banquet and we had set out to have a good time in their settlement i had brought beads a looking-glass some spoons knives forks and one of my little geneva musical boxes guns were also to be fired for i was going to show the dwarfs what the oguizi could do when they saw us with food they received us with great joy what a queer language i thought these dwarfs have there was a wild dwarf hurrah ya ye yo owa owa ki ke ki when they saw the good things that were to be eaten 
nearly all the dwarfs were here very few of them were absent masunda who was my friend and who seemed to be less afraid of me than anybody else stood by me and kept her eyes upon the meat there were fifty-nine dwarfs all told including men women children and babies what little things the babies were smoke came out of every hut fires were lighted all round nuts were roasting berries and fruits had been collected in great abundance and snake flesh was plentiful for the dwarfs had been the day before on a feeding excursion rats and mice had also been trapped abongo said i we have come to have a good time first i am going to give to every one of you beads then the ashangos brought before them a basket containing the beads and i asked who was the chief i could not find him and they would not tell me among them were several old people the dwarfs were now eager for beads and surrounded me and though i am a man of short stature i seemed a giant in the midst of them and as for rebuka and igolo they appeared to be colossal ya ya yo yo ye qui quo o a ri ri ke ki ke ki seemed to be the only sounds they could make in their excitement their appearance was singular indeed the larger number of them being of a dirty yellow colour a few of them were not more than four feet in height others were from four feet two inches to four feet seven inches in height but if they were short in size they were stoutly built like chimpanzees they had big broad chests and though their legs were small they were muscular and strong their arms were also strong in proportion to their size there were grey-headed men and grey-headed wrinkled old women among them and very hideous the old dwarfs were their features resembled very closely the features of a young chimpanzee some had grey others hazel eyes while the eyes of a few were black as i have said before their hair was not like that of the negroes and ashangos among whom the dwarfs lived but grew in little short tufts apart from each other and the hair after attaining a certain length could not grow longer these little tufts looked like so many little balls of wool many of the men had their chest and legs covered with these little tufts of woolly hair the women's hair was no longer than that of the men and it grew exactly in the same manner i could not keep my eyes from the tiny babies they were ridiculously small and much lighter in colour than the older people their mothers had a broad string of leather hanging from their shoulders to carry them in there was great excitement among them as i distributed the beads and they would shout look at his de Jeevi nose look at his muna mouth look at his liaru head look at his nechuie hair look at his mishu beard and in spite of my big moustache they would shout is he a bangla ogwezi man spirit or an ogwezi mokasho woman spirit some declared that i was a mokasho others that i was a bagala i did not forget my friend masunda after i had given them beads i took out a large looking-glass which i had hidden and put it in front of them immediately they trembled with fright and said spirit don't kill us and turned their heads from the looking-glass then the musical box was shown and when i had set it playing the dwarfs lay down on the ground frightened by the brilliant sparkling music of the mechanism and by turns looked at me and at the box some of them ran away into their little huts after their fears were allayed i showed them a string of six little bells which i shook whereat their little eyes brightened and their joy was unbounded when i gave them the bells one of course was for friend masunda who hung it by a cord to a race and shook her body in order to make it ring after this i ordered igalo to bring me the meat and taking from my sheath my big bright sharp hunting knife i cut it and distributed it among the dwarfs then i gave them the plantains and told them to eat i wish you had seen the twisting of their mouths it would have made you laugh immediately the little dwarfs scattered round their fires and roasted the food i had given them and it was no sooner cooked than it was eaten they seemed to be so fond of flesh when they had finished eating the obongos seemed more sociable than i had ever seen them before i seated myself on a dead limb of a tree and they came round me and asked me to talk to them as the spirits talk so i took my journal and read to them in english and what i had written the day before after speaking to them in the language of the aguizis i said now talk to me in the language of the dwarfs and pointing to my fingers i gave them to understand that i wanted to know how they counted 
so a dwarf taking hold of his hand and then one finger after another counted one moy two bay three matato four digit mabongo five digio six samuna seven nichima eight nisamuna nine nichimuma ten mabota and then raised his hands intimating that he could not count beyond ten one of them asked me if i lived in the soon gui moon then another if i lived in a yechi star another if i had been long in the forest did i make the fine things i gave them during the night now abongos i said to them i want you to sing and to dance the dwarf dance for me an old dwarf went out and took out of his hut a nagoma tam-tam and began to beat it then the people struck up a chant and what queer singing it was what shrill voices they had after a while they got excited and began to dance all the while gesticulating wildly leaping up and kicking backwards and forwards and shaking their heads then i fired two guns the noise of which seemed to stun them and fill them with fear i gave them to understand that when i saw an elephant a leopard a gorilla or any living thing by making that noise i could kill them and to show them i could do it i brought down a bird perched on a high tree near their settlement how astonished they seemed to be after all i said to myself though low in the scale of intelligence like their more civilized fellow-men these little creatures can dance and sing now bongos that you have asked me about the oguizis i said to them tell me about yourselves why do you not build villages as other people do oh said they we do not build villages for we never like to remain long in the same place for if we did we should soon starve when we have gathered all the fruits nuts and berries around the place where we have been living for a time and trapped all the game there is in the region and food is becoming scarce we move off to some other part of the forest we love to move we hate to tarry long at the same spot we love to be free like the antelopes and gazelles why don't you plant for food as other people do i asked them why should we work said they when there are plenty of fruits berries and nuts around us when there is game in the woods and fish in the rivers and snakes rats and mice are plentiful we love the berries the nuts and the fruits which grow wild much better than the fruits the big people raise on their plantations and if we had villages they said the strong and tall people who live in the country might come and make war upon us kill us and capture us they do not desire to kill you i said to them see how friendly they are with you when you trap much game you exchange it for plantains with them why don't you wear clothing why said they the fire is our means of keeping warm and then the big people give us their grass cloth when they have done wearing it why don't you work iron and make spears and battle axes so that you might be able to defend yourselves and be not afraid of war we do not know how to work iron it takes too much time it is too hard work we can make bows and we make arrows with hard wood and can poison them we know how to make traps to trap game and we trap game in far greater number than we can kill it when we go hunting and we love to go hunting why don't you make bigger cabins we do not want to make bigger cabins it would be too much trouble and we do not know how these are good enough for us they keep the rain from us and we build them so rapidly don't the leopards sometimes come and eat some of you yes they do they exclaim then we move off far away several days journey from where the leopards have come to eat some of us and often we make traps to catch them we hate the leopards the obongo shouted with one voice how do you make your fires tell me and i could not help thinking that however wild a man was even though he might be apparently little above the chimpanzee he had always a fire and knew how to make it they showed me flint stones and a species of oakum coming from the palm tree and said they knocked these stones against each other and the sparks gave them fire then to astonish them i took a match from my match-box and lighted it as soon as they saw the flame a wild shout rang through the settlement abongos tell me said i how you get your wives for your settlements are far apart and you have no paths leading through the forest from one to another you never know how far the next settlement of the dwarfs may be from yours it is true said they that sometimes we do not know where the next encampment of the obongos may be and we do not wish to know for sometimes we fight among ourselves and if we live near together we should become too numerous and find it difficult to procure berries and game our people never leave one settlement for another generation after generation we have lived among ourselves and married 
among ourselves it is but seldom we permit a stranger from another abongo settlement to come among us how far said i pointing to the east do you meet abongos far far away they answered toward where the sun rises abongos are found scattered in the great forest we love the woods for there we live and if we were to live anywhere else we should starve as you wander through the forest i asked don't you sometimes come to prairies yes said they and here an old abongo addressed himself to my ashango interpreter when i was a boy we had our settlement for a long time in the forest not far from a big prairie and farther off there was a big river since then said the old abongo as we moved we have turned our backs upon where the sun rises and marched in the direction where the sun sets which meant that they had been migrating from the east toward the west as the time of our departure from niembuai had arrived i said to the dwarfs that i must bid them good-bye for i was going away toward where the sun rises now you see said i you have always been afraid of me tell me have i done harm to any one of you no no they exclaimed no no said my friend misunda so i shook hands with them and they said to me in parting you will see more little dwarfs in the countries where you are going be kind to them as you have been to us End of section seventy three this recording is in the public domain section seventy four of egypt africa and arabia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section seventy four crossing an african bridge about eighteen sixty eight by paul du chaillu toward noon we approached the ovigui river a mountain torrent which had now swollen into a river and before reaching its natural banks we had to pass through a swamp in the forest for half an hour the torrent had overflowed and its waters were running swiftly down among the trees i began to wonder how we were to cross the bridge the ashiras had been speaking of that bridge and in fact we had delayed our start two or three days because they said the waters were too high at last we came to a spot where the ground was dry and a little way farther i could see the swift waters of the ovigui gliding down with great speed through the forest i saw at once that even an expert swimmer would be helpless here and would be dashed to pieces against the fallen trees which jutted out in every direction not being a very good swimmer i did not enjoy the sight there was one consolation no crocodile could stand this current and these pleasant gentlemen had therefore retired to parts unknown i wanted all the time to get a glimpse of the bridge but had not succeeded in doing so i called mincho who pointed out to me a queer structure which he called the bridge it was nothing but a creeper stretched from one side to the other then mincho told me that some years before the bed of the river was not where we stood but some hundred yards over the other side this he said is one of the tricks of the ovigui i found that several other of these mountain streams have the same trick of course mincho said that there was a muiri a spirit who took the river and changed its course for nothing else could do it but a spirit the deep channel of the ovigui seemed to me about thirty yards wide now in this new bed stood certain trees which native ingenuity saw could be used as piers for a bridge at this point in the stream there were two trees opposite each other and about seven or eight yards distant from each shore other trees on the banks were so cut as to fall upon these which might have been called the piers so a gap had been filled on each side it now remained to unite the still open space in the centre between the two piers and here came the tug unable to transport heavy pieces of timber they had thrown across this chasm a long slender bending limb which they fastened securely to the piers of course no one could walk on this without assistance so a couple of strong vines lianas had been strung across for balustrades these were about three or four feet above the bridge and about one foot higher up the stream 
i could barely see the vine and my heart failed me as i stood looking at this breakneck or drowning concern to add to the pleasurable excitement minsho told me that on a bridge below half a dozen people had been drowned the year before by tumbling into the river they were careless in crossing added minsho or some person had bewitched them the waters of the Ovigui ran down so fast that looking at them for any length of time made my head dizzy i was in a pretty fix i could certainly not back out i preferred to run the risk of being drowned rather than to show these ashira i was afraid and to tell them that we had better go back i think i should never have dared to look them in the face afterward the whole country would have known that i had been afraid the aguizi would have then been nowhere a coward i should have been called by the savages rather die i thought than to have such a reputation i am sure all the boys who read this book would have had the same feelings and that girls could never look at a boy who is not possessed of courage the party had got ready and put their loads as high on their backs as they could and in such a manner that these loads should slip into the river if an accident were to happen the crossing began and i watched them carefully they did not look straight across but faced the current which was tremendous the water reached to their waists and the current was so swift that their bodies could not remain erect but were bent in two they held on to the creeper and advanced slowly sideways never raising their feet from the bridge for if they had done otherwise the current would have carried them off the structure one of the men slipped when midway but luckily recovered himself he dropped his load among the articles in which were two pairs of shoes but he held on to the rope and finished the journey by crossing one arm over the other it was a curious sight we shouted hold on fast to the rope hold on fast the noise and shouting we did was enough to make one deaf another carrying one of my guns so narrowly escaped falling as to drop that which was also swept off and lost meantime i wondered if i should follow in the wake of my shoes and gun at any rate i was bound to show the ashira that i was not afraid to cross the bridge even as i have said at the risk of being drowned it would have been a pretty thing to have these people believe that i was susceptible of fear the next thing would have been that i should have been plundered then murdered these fellows had a great advantage over me their garments did not trouble them at last all were across but minsho aduma and myself i had stripped to my shirt and trousers and sat out on my trial followed by minsho who had a vague idea that if i slipped he might catch me aduma went ahead before reaching the bridge i had to wade in the muddy water then i went upon it and marched slowly against the tide never raising my feet till at last i came to the tree there the current was tremendous i thought it would carry my legs off the bridge which was now three feet under the water i felt the water beating against my legs and waist i advanced carefully feeling my way and slipping my feet along without raising them the current was so strong that my arms were extended to their utmost length and the water as it struck against my body bent it the water was really cold but despite of that perspiration fell from my face i was so excited i managed to drag myself to the other side holding fast to the creeper having made up my mind never to let go as long as i should have strength to hold on should my feet give way i intended to do like the other man and get over by crossing one arm over the other at last weak and pale with excitement but outwardly calm i reached the other side vowing that i would never try such navigation again i would rather have faced several gorillas lions elephants and leopards than cross the ovigui bridge putting ourselves in walking order again we plunged into the great forest which was full of ebony barwood india rubber and other strange trees about two miles from the Ovigui, we reached a little prairie some miles long and a few hundred yards wide which the natives called ajolo it seemed like a little island encased in that great sea of trees what a nice little spot it would have been to build a camp under some of the tall long spread branches of trees which bordered it but there was no time for camping there were to be no stops during the daytime till we reached the apingi country a few miles after leaving the ajiolo prairie we came to a steep hill called mount okonku as we ascended we had to lay hold of the branches in order to help ourselves in the ascent and we had to stop several times in order to get our breath 
we finally reached a plateau from which we could see nukumu nabuali mountains then we surmounted the other hills with intervening plains and valleys all covered with dense forest and at last found ourselves on the banks of a most beautiful little purling mountain brook which skirted the base of our last hill this nice little stream was called the alumi or olumi here we lit our fires built shelters and camped for the night all feeling perfectly tired out and i for one thankful for the nice camp we had succeeded in building for i needed a good night's rest End of section seventy four. This recording is in the public domain. Section seventy five of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 75. Consulting the Man in the Moon, about 1868, by Paul du Chaillou. The people declared they must find some means of ascertaining the cause of the king's sufferings. King Giza had sent word himself that his people might try to find out from Ilogu why he was sick and what he must do for his recovery. Ilogo is believed by the people to be a spirit living in the moon, a mighty spirit who looks down upon the inhabitants of the earth, a spirit to whom the black man can talk. Yes, they said, Ilogo's face can be seen. Look at it. Then they pointed out to me the spots on the moon which we can see with our naked eye. These spots were the indistinct features of the spirit. One fine evening, at full moon, for to consult Ilogo, the moon must be full, or nearly so, the women of the village assembled in front of the king's house. Clustered close together, and seated on the ground, with their faces turned toward the moon, they sang songs. They were surrounded by the men of the village. I shall not soon forget that wild scene. The sky was clear and beautiful. The moon shone in its brightness, eclipsing by its light that of the stars, except those of the first magnitude. The air was calm and serene, and the shadows of the tall trees upon the earth appeared like queer phantoms. The songs of the women were too, and in praise of Ilogo, the spirit that lived in Ugueli, the moon. Presently a woman seated herself in the centre of the circle of singers and began a solo, gazing steadfastly at the moon, the people every now and then singing in chorus with her. She was to be inspired by the spirit of Logo to utter prophecies. At last she gave up singing, for she could not get into a trance. Then another woman took a place, in the midst of the most vociferous singing that could be done by human lips. After a while the second woman gave place to a third, a little woman, wiry and nervous. She seated herself like the others, and looked steadily at the moon, crying out that she could see a Logo. And then the singing redoubled in fury. The excitement of the people had at that time become very great. The drums beat furiously, the drummers using all their strength until covered with perspiration. The outsiders shouted madly and seemed to be almost out of their senses, for their faces were wrinkled in nervous excitement, their eyes perfectly wild, and the contortions they made with their bodies indescribable. The excitement was now intense, and the noise horrible. The songs to Ilogo were not for a moment discontinued, but the pitch of their voices was so great and so hoarse that the words at last seemed to come with difficulty. The medium, the women, and the men all sang with one accord. Ilogo, we ask thee, tell who has bewitched the king. Ilogo, we ask thee. What shall we do to cure the king? The forests are thine, Ilogo. The rivers are thine, Ilogo. The moon is thine. O moon, O moon, O moon. Thou art the home of Ilogo. Shall the king die, O Ilogo? O Ilogo, O moon, O moon. These words were repeated over and over, the people getting more terribly excited as they went on. 
the woman who was the medium, and who had been singing violently, looked toward the moon and began to tremble. Her nerves twitched, her face was contorted, her muscles swelled, and at last her limbs straightened out. At this time the wildest of all wild excitement possessed the people. I myself looked on with intense curiosity. She fell on her back on the ground, insensible, her face turned up to the moon. She looked as if she had died in a fit. The song to Ilogo continued with more noise than ever, but at last comparative quiet followed, compelled, I believe, by sheer exhaustion from excitement, for the people were all gazing intently on the woman's face. I shall not forget that scene by moonlight, nor the corpse-like face of that woman, so still and calm. How wild it all looked! The woman, who lay apparently dead before the savages, was expected at this time to see things in the world of Ilogo, that is to say, the moon, to see the great spirit Ilogo himself, and, as she lay insensible, she was supposed to be holding intercourse with him. Then, after she had conversed with the great spirit Ilogo, she would awake and tell the people all she saw and all that Ilogo had said to her. For my part, I thought she really was dead. I approached her and touched her pulse. It was weak, but there was life. After about half an hour of insensibility, she came to her senses, but she was much prostrated. She seated herself without rising, looking round as if stupefied. She remained quite silent for a while, and then began to speak. I have seen Ilogo. I have spoken to Ilogo. Ilogo has told me that Kingiza, our king, shall not die, that Kingiza is going to live a long time, that Kingiza was not bewitched, and that a remedy prepared from such a plant, I forget the name, would cure him. Then, she added, I went to sleep, and when I awoke, Ilogo was gone, and now I find myself in the midst of you. The people then quietly separated, as by that time it was late, and all retired to their huts, I myself going to mine, thinking of the wild scene I had just witnessed, and feeling that, the longer I remained in that strange country, the more strange the customs of the people appeared to me. Soon all became silent, and nothing but the barking of the watchful little native dogs broke the stillness of the night. The moon continued to shine over that village, the inhabitants of which had run so wild with superstition. End of section 75 This recording is in the public domain. Section 76 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia Read for LibriVox.org Do Shayu the first king of the apingi about eighteen sixty eight by paul du chayu the village was crowded with strangers once more all the chiefs of the tribe had arrived what did it all mean they had the wildest notions regarding me i was the most wonderful of creatures a mighty spirit i could work wonders turn wood into iron leaves of trees into cloth earth into beads the waters of the rembo apingi into palm wine or plantain wine i could make fire the matches i lighted being proof of it what had that immense crowd come for they had met to make me their king a uh, kendo the insignia of chieftain's ship here had been procured from the shimba people from whose country the kendo comes the drums beat early this morning it seemed as if a fete day was coming for every one appeared joyous i was quite unprepared for the ceremony that was to take place for i knew nothing about it no one had breathed a word concerning it to me when the hour arrived i was called out of my hut wild shouts rang through the air as i made my appearance yo 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 the chiefs of the tribe headed by Ramanji, advanced toward me in line each chief being armed with a spear the heads of which they held pointed at me in rear of the chiefs were hundreds of apingi warriors also armed with spears 
were they to spear me they stopped while the drummers beat their tam-tams furiously then ramanji holding a kendo in his hand came forward in the midst of the greatest excitement and wild shouts of the oguizi is to be made our king the oguizi is to be made our king when ramanji stood about a yard from me a dead silence took place the king advanced another step and then with his right hand put the kendo on my left shoulder saying you are the spirit whom we have never seen before we are but poor people when we see you you are one of those of whom we have heard who came from nobody knows where and whom we never expected to see you are our king we make you our king stay with us always for we love you whereupon shouts as wild as the country around came from the multitude they shouted spirit we do not want you to go away we want you for ever immense quantities of palm wine contained in calabashes were drunk and a general jollification took place in the orthodox fashion of a coronation from that day therefore i may call myself du jayu the first king of the pingi just fancy i am an african king of all the wild castles i ever built when i was a boy i never dreamed that i should one day be made king over a wild tribe of negroes dwelling in the mountains of equatorial africa end of section seventy six this recording is in the public domain section seventy seven of egypt africa and arabia read for librivox .org. south africa historical note the transvaal was settled chiefly by the dutch their descendants are known as boers or farmers they came at first to cape colony in the napoleonic wars cape colony fell into the hands of the english the boers were not pleased with british rule and made the grand trek first to natal then to the orange free state then still farther into the wilderness to the transvaal or across the Vaal. for a quarter of a century there was peace but in eighteen hundred seventy seven some of the people of the transvaal asked england for help in their wars against the natives thereupon england planted her flag in the transvaal the boers rebelled and in several battles the british were defeated noticeably at majuba hill where they met with a terrible slaughter the boer republic was restored but england retained all control in foreign affairs before this time both gold and diamonds had been discovered in this region and foreign miners and traders flocked into the country soon these foreigners greatly outnumbered the dutchmen the boers were not pleased they laid heavy taxes upon the unwelcome outlanders and refused them political rights the mutual dissatisfaction resulted in war england sent larger armies than she had ever before put into the field but it was not until nineteen hundred and two that after three years of most determined warfare the little republic was subdued end of section seventy seven this recording is in the public domain Section seventy eight of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia, read for LibriVox.org by phone. The Last Trek by Sir John Everett Millet, English painter, eighteen twenty nine to eighteen ninety six. Painting, page four hundred and thirty six. This picture symbolizes the indomitable pioneer spirit of the Anglo Saxon race, the spirit that has driven them forth to conquer the waste places of the world and has given England a chain of territorial possessions encircling the earth. An Englishman has ventured into the great upland plain of South Africa, a region given over until recently to savages and wild beasts. He had set out to find a home in the wilderness, but has been overtaken on the way by sickness and has lain down on a lonely veld to die. Friends and family are far away, but two natives, his sole companions, sit beside him, waiting patiently for the end. The life's journey of this pioneer is over, but others are ready to step forward and take his place in the vanguard of civilization. Such were the men that conquered and cleared the land, 
opened up its great mineral wealth and turned the african wilderness into a prosperous english commonwealth end of section 78 this recording is in the public domain Section 79 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 3. Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan section seventy nine the diamond fields of south africa about eighteen seventy by anthony trollope the first known finding of a diamond in south africa was as recent as eighteen sixty seven and this diamond was found by accident and could not for a time obtain any credence it is first known to have been seen at the house of a dutch farmer named jacobs in the northern limits of the cape colony and south of the orange river it had probably been brought from the bed of the stream or from the other side of the river the other side would be in griqua land west the land of diamonds as far as i can learn there is no idea that diamonds have been deposited by nature in the soil of the cape colony proper at jacobs's house it was seen in the hands of one of the children by another boer named van nikirk who observing that it was brighter and also heavier than other stones and thinking it to be too valuable for a plaything offered to buy it but the child's mother would not sell such a trifle and gave it to van Kirk. from van Kirk it was passed on to one o'reilly who seems to have been the first to imagine it to be a diamond he took it to cape town where he could get no faith for his stone and thence back to collisburg on the northern extremity of the colony where it was again encountered with ridicule but it became matter of discussion and was at last sent to dr atherston of grahamstown who was known to be a geologist and a man of science he surprised the world of south africa by declaring the stone to be an undoubted diamond it weighed over twenty-one carats and was sold to sir p woodhouse the then governor of the colony for five hundred pounds in eighteen sixty eight and eighteen sixty nine various diamonds were found and the search for them was no doubt instigated by van de kirk's and o'reilly's success but nothing great was done nor did the belief prevail that south africa was a country richer in precious stones than any other region yet discovered those which were brought to light during these two years may i believe yet be numbered and no general belief had been created but some searching by individuals was continued the same van de kirk who had received the first diamond from the child not unnaturally had his imagination fired by his success either in eighteen sixty eight or eighteen sixty nine he heard of a large stone which was then in the hands of a kaffir witch doctor from whom he succeeded in buying it giving for it as the story goes all his sheep and all his horses but the purchase was a good one for a dutchman's flocks are not often very numerous or very valuable and he sold the diamond to merchants in the neighborhood for eleven thousand two hundred pounds it weighed eighty-three carats and is said to be perfect in all its appointments as to water shape and whiteness it became known among diamonds and was christened the star of south africa after a lawsuit during which an interdict was pronounced forbidding its exportation or sale it made its way to the establishment of messrs hunt and roskill from whom it was purchased for the delight of a lovely british countess even then the question whether this part of south africa was diamond diamondifarious had not been settled to the satisfaction of persons who concerned themselves in the produce and distribution of diamonds there seems to have been almost an anti-south african party in the diamond market as though it was too much to expect that from a spot so insignificant as this corner of the orange and vaal rivers should be found a rival to the time-honored glories of brazil and india it was too good to believe or to some perhaps too bad that there should suddenly come a plethora of diamonds from among the hottentots it was in eighteen seventy that the question seems to have got itself so settled that some portion of the speculative energy of the world 
was enabled to fix itself on the new diamond fields in that year various white men set themselves seriously to work in searching the banks of the Val up and down between hebron and Clipdrift, or barclay as it is now called and many small parcels of stones were brought from natives who had been instigated to search by what they had already heard the operations of those times are now called the river diggings in distinction to the dry diggings which are works of much greater magnitude carried on in a much more scientific manner away from the river and which certainly are in all respects dry enough but at first the searchers confined themselves chiefly to the river bed and to the small confluence of the river scraping up into their mining cradles the shingles and dirt they had collected and shaking and washing away the grit and mud till they could see by turning the remaining stones over with a bit of slate on a board whether fortune had sent on that morning a peculiar sparkle among the lot i was taken up to barclay on a picnic as people say and a very nice picnic it was one of the pleasantest days i had in south africa the object was to show me the val river and the little town which had been the capital of the diamond country before the grand discovery at colesburg cobbed had made the town of kimberley there is nothing peculiar about barclay as a south african town except that it is already half deserted there may be perhaps a score of houses there most of which are much better built than those at kimberley they are made of rough stone or of mud and whitewash and if i do not mistake one of them had two stories there was a hotel quite full although the place is deserted and clustering round it were six or seven idle gentlemen all of whom were or had been connected with diamonds i am often struck by the amount of idleness which persons can allow themselves whose occupations have diverged from the common work of the world when at barclay we got ourselves and our provisions into a boat so that we might have our picnic properly under the trees at the other side of the river for opposite to barclay is to be found the luxury of trees as we were rowed down the river we saw a white man with two kaffirs poking about his stones and gravel on a miner's rickety table under a little tent on the beach he was a digger who had still clung to the river business a frenchman who had come to try his luck there a few days since on the monday previous we were told he had found a thirteen carat white stone without a flaw this would be enough perhaps to keep him going and almost to satisfy him for a month had he missed that one stone he would probably have left the place after a week now he would go on through days and days without finding another sparkle i can conceive no occupation on earth more dreary hardly any more demoralizing than this of perpetually turning over dirt in quest of a peculiar little stone which may turn up once a week or may not i could not think as i watched the man of the comparative nobility of the work of a shoemaker who by every pull at his thread is helping to keep some person's foot dry after dinner we walked along the bank and found another river digger though this man's claim might perhaps be removed a couple of hundred yards from the water he was an englishman and we stood a while and talked to him he had one kaffir with him to whom he paid seven shillings a week and his food and he had found one or more stones which he showed us just enough to make the place tenable he had got upon an old digging which he was clearing out lower he had however in one place reached the hard stone at the bottom in or below which there could be no diamonds there was however a certain quantity of diamondiferous matter left and as he had already found stones he thought that it might pay him to work through the remainder he was a most good-humoured well-mannered man with a pleasant fund of humour when i asked him of his fortune generally at the diggings he told us among other things that he had broken his shoulder-bone at the diggings which he displayed to us in order that we might see how badly the surgeon had used him he had no pain to complain of or weakness but his shoulder had not been made beautiful and who did it said the gentleman who was our amphiterian at the picnic and is himself one of the leading practitioners of the fields i think it was one doctor said the digger naming our friend whom no doubt he knew i need not say that the doctor loudly disclaimed ever having had previous acquaintance with the shoulder the kaffir was washing the dirt in a rough cradle 
separating the stones from the dust and the owner as each sieve full was brought to him threw out the stones on his table and sorted through them with the eternal bit of slate or iron formed into the shape of a trowel for the chance of a sieve full one of our party offered him half a crown which he took i was glad to see it all inspected without a diamond as had there been anything good the poor fellow's disappointment must have been great that half-crown was probably all that he would earn during the week all that he would earn perhaps for a month then there might come three or four stones in one day i should think that the tedious despair of the vacant days could hardly be compensated by the triumph of the lucky minute these river diggers have this in their favor that the stones found near the river are more likely to be white and pure than those which are extracted from the mines the vol itself in the neighborhood of berkeley is pretty with rocks in its bed and islands and trees on its banks but the country around and from thence to kimberley which is twenty-four miles distant is as ugly as flatness barrenness and sand together can make the face of the earth the commencement of diamond digging as a settled industry was in eighteen seventy two it was then that dry digging was commenced which consists of the regulated removal of ground found to be diamondiferous and of the washing and examination of every fraction of the soil the district which we as yet know to be so specially gifted extends up and down the vol river from the confluence of the modder to hebron about seventy-five miles and includes a small district on the east side of the river here within twelve miles of the river and within a circle of which the diameter is about two and a half miles are contained all the mines or dry diggings from which have come the real wealth of the country i should have said that the most precious diamond yet produced one of two hundred and eighty-eight carats was found close to the river about twelve miles from berkeley this prize was made in eighteen seventy two it is of the dry diggings that the future student of the diamond fields of south africa will have to take chief account the river diggings were only the prospecting work which led up to the real mining operations as the washing of the gullies in australia led to the crushing of quartz and to the sinking of deep mines in search of alluvial gold of these dry diggings there are now four dutois pan Bufutin, old de beers and colossberg cobbed or the great kimberley mine which though last in the field has thrown all the other diamond mines into the shade the first working at the three first of these was so nearly simultaneous that they may almost be said to have been commenced at once i believe however that they were in fact opened in the order i have given bulfontines and dutois pan were on two separate boer farms of which the former was bought first as early as eighteen sixty nine by a firm who had even then had dealings in diamonds and who no doubt purchased the land with reference to diamonds here some few stones were picked from the surface but the affair was not thought to be hopeful the diamond searchers still believed that the river was the place but the dutch farmer at dutois pan one van week finding that precious stones were found on his neighbors's land let out mining licenses on his own land binding the miners to give him one-fourth of the value of what they found this however did not answer and the miners resolved to pay some small monthly sum for a license or to jump the two farms together now jumping in south african language means open stealing a man jumps a thing when he takes what does not belong to him with the tacit declaration that might makes right appeal was then made to the authorities of the orange free state for protection and something was done but the diggers were too strong and the proprietors of the farms were obliged to throw open their lands to the miners on the terms which the men dictated the english came at the end of eighteen seventy one just as the system of dry digging had formed itself at these two mines and from that time to this dutois pan and bulfontine had been worked as regular diamond mines i did not find them especially interesting to a visitor each of them is about two miles distant from kimberley town and the centre of the one can hardly be more than a mile distant from the centre of the other they are under the inspection of the same government officer and might be supposed to be part of one and the same enterprise were it not that there is a mining board at dutois pan where is the shareholders at bulfontine 
have abstained from troubling themselves with such an apparatus they trust the adjustment of any disputes which may arise to the discretion of the government inspector at each place there is a little village very melancholy to look at consisting of hotels or drinking bars and the small shops of the diamond dealers everything is made of corrugated iron and the whole is very mean to the eye there had been no rain for some months when i was there and as i rode into du Trois pan the thermometer showed over ninety degrees in the shade and over one hundred and fifty degrees in the sun while i was at kimberley it rose to ninety six degrees and one hundred and sixty one degrees there is not a blade of grass in the place and i seemed to breathe dust rather than air at both these places there seemed to be a mighty maze in which they differ altogether from the kimberley mine which i will attempt to describe presently out of the dry dusty ground which looked so parched and ugly that one was driven to think that it had never yet rained in those parts were dug in all directions pits and walls and roadways from which and by means of which the dry dusty soil is taken out to some place where it is washed and the debris examined carts are going hither and thither each with a couple of horses and kaffirs above and below not very much above or very much below are working for ten shillings a week and their diet without any feature of interest what is done at dutois pan is again done at boltfontein at dutois pan there are one thousand four hundred and forty one mining claims which are possessed by two hundred and fourteen claim holders the area within the reef that is within the wall of rocky and earthy matter containing the diamondiferous soil is thirty-one acres this gives a revenue to the Griqualand government of something over two thousand pounds for every three months about seventeen hundred kaffirs are employed in the mine and on the stuff taken out of it at wages of ten shillings a week and their diet which at the exceptionally high price of provisions prevailing when i was in the country costs about ten shillings a week more the wages paid to white men can hardly be estimated as they are only employed in what i may call superintending work they may perhaps be given as ranging from three to six pounds a week the interesting feature in the labor question is the kaffir this black man whose body is only partially and most grotesquely clad and who is what we mean when we speak of a savage earns more than the average rural laborer in england over and beyond his board and lodging he carries away with him every saturday night ten shillings a week in hard money with which he has nothing to do but to amuse himself if it so pleases him at bullfontein there are one thousand twenty six claims belonging to one hundred and fifty three claim holders the area producing diamonds is twenty two acres the revenue derived is six thousand pounds a year more or less about thirteen hundred kaffirs are employed under circumstances as given above the two diggings have been and are still successful though they have never reached the honour and glory and wealth and grandeur achieved by that most remarkable spot on the earth's surface called the colesberg cobbed the new rush or the kimberley mine i did not myself make any special visits to the old de beers mine de beers was the farmer who possessed the lands called Warsweet, of the purchase of which i have already spoken and he himself with his sons for a while occupied himself in the business but he soon found it expedient to sell his land the old de beers mine being then established as the sale was progressing a lady on the top of a little hill called the colesberg cobbed poked up a diamond with her parasol dr atherston who had visited the locality had previously said that if new diamond ground was found it would probably be on this, this spot in september eighteen seventy two the territory of Griqualand west became a british colony and at the time miners from the whole district were congregating themselves at the hill and that which was at once called the new rush was established in australia where gold was found here or there the miners would hurry off to the spot and the place would be called this or that rush the new rush the colesberg cobbed pronounced copy and the kimberley mine are one in the same place it is now within the town of kimberley which has in fact got itself built around the hill to supply the wants of the mining population kimberley has in this way become the capital and seat of government for the province 
as the mine is one of the most remarkable spots on the face of the earth i will endeavor to explain it with some minuteness the colesburg hill is in fact hardly a hill at all what little summit may once have entitled it to the name having been cut off on reaching the spot by one of the streets from the square you see no hill but are called upon to rise over a mound which is circular and looks to be no more than the debris of the mine though it is in fact the remainder of the slight natural ascent it is but a few feet high and on getting to the top you look down into a huge hole this is the kimberley mine you immediately feel that it is the largest and most complete hole ever made by human agency at dutois pan and bulfontein the works are scattered here everything is so gathered together and collected that it is not at first easy to understand that the whole should contain the operations of a large number of separate speculators it is so completely one that you are driven at first to think that it must be the property of one firm or at any rate be entrusted to the management of one director it is very far from being so in the pit beneath your feet hard as it is at first to your imagination to separate it into various enterprises the persons making or marring their fortunes have as little connection with each other as have the different banking firms in lombard street there too the neighborhood is very close and common precautions have to be taken as to roadway fires and general convenience you are told that the pit has a surface area of nine acres but for your purposes as you will care little for diamondiferous or non-diamondiferous soil the aperture really occupies twelve acres the slope of the reef around the diamond soil has forced itself back over an increased surface as the mine has become deeper the diamond claims over nine acres you stand upon the marge and there suddenly beneath your feet lies the entirety of the kimberley mine so open so manifest and so uncovered that if your eyes were good enough you might examine the separate operations of each of the three or four thousand human beings who are at work there it looks to be so steep down that there can be no way to the bottom other than the aerial contrivances which i will presently endeavor to explain it is as though you were looking into a vast bowl the sides of which are smooth as should be the sides of a bowl while round the bottom are various marvellous incrustations among which ants are working with all the usual energy of the ant tribe and these incrustations are not simply at the bottom but come up the curves and slopes of the bowl irregularly half way up perhaps in one place while on another side they are confined quite to the lower deep the pit is two hundred and thirty feet deep nearly circular though after a while the eye becomes aware of the fact that it is oblong at the top the diameter is about three hundred yards of which two hundred and fifty cover what is technically called blue meaning diamondiferous soil near the surface and for some way down the sides are light brown and as blue is the recognized diamond color you will at first suppose that no diamonds were found near the surface but the light brown has been in all respects the same as the blue the color of the soil to a certain depth having been affected by a mixture of iron below this everything is blue all the constructions in the pit having been made out of some blue matter which at first sight would seem to have been carried down for the purpose but there are other colors on the wall which give a peculiar picturesqueness to the mines the top edge as you look at it with your back to the setting sun is red with the gravel of the upper reef while below in places the beating of the rain and running of water has produced peculiar hues all of which are a delight to the eye as you stand at the edge you will find large high raised boxes at your right hand and at your left and you will see all round the margin crowds of such erections each box being as big as a little house and higher than most of the houses in kimberley these are the first recipients for the stuff that is brought up out of the mine and behind these so that you will often find that you have walked between them are the whims by means of which the stuff is raised each whim being worked by two horses originally the operation was done by hand windlasses which were turned by kaffirs and the practice is continued at some of the smaller enterprises but the horse whims are now so general that there is a world of them round the claim the stuff is raised on aerial tramways and the method of an aerial tramway is as follows 
wires are stretched taut from the wooden boxes slanting down to the claims at the bottom never less than four wires for each box two for the ascending and two for the descending bucket as one bucket runs down empty on one set of wires another comes up full on the other set the ascending bucket is of course full of blue the buckets were at first simply leathern bags now they have increased in size and importance of construction to half barrels and so upwards to large iron cylinders which sit easily upon wheels running in the wires as they ascend and descend and bring up their loads half a cart load at each journey as this is going round the entire circle it follows that there are wires starting everywhere from the rim and converging to a centre at the bottom on which the buckets are always scudding through the air they drop down and creep up not altogether noiselessly but with a gentle trembling sound which mixes itself pleasantly with the murmur from the voices below and the wires seem to be the strings of some wonderful harp aerial or perhaps infernal from which the beholder expects that a louder twang will soon be heard the wires are there always of course but by some lights they are hardly visible the mine is seen best in the afternoon and the visitor looking at it should stand with his back to the setting sun but as he so stands and so looks he will hardly be aware that there is a wire at all if his visit be made say on a saturday afternoon when the works are stopped and the mine is mute when the world below is busy there are thirty-five hundred kaffirs at work some small proportion upon the reef which has to be got into order so that it shall neither tumble in nor impede the work nor overlay the diamondiferous soil as it still does in some places but by far the greater number are employed in digging their task is to pick up the earth and shovel it into the buckets and iron receptacles much of it is loosened for them by blasting which is done after the kaffirs have left the mine at six o'clock you look down and see the swarm of black ants busy at every hole and corner with their picks moving and shoveling the loose blue soil but the most peculiar phase of the mine as you gaze into its large pit is the subdivision into claims and portions could a person see the site without having heard any word of explanation it would be impossible i think to conceive the meaning of all those straight-cut narrow dikes of those mud walls at right angles to each other of those square separate pits and again of those square upstanding blocks looking like houses without doors or windows you can see that nothing on earth was ever less level than the bottom of the bowl and that the black ants in traversing it as they are always doing go up and down almost at every step jumping here on to a narrow wall and skipping there across a deep dividing channel as though some diabolically ingenious architect had contrived a house with five hundred rooms not one of which should be on the same floor and to and from none of which should there be a pair of stairs or a door or a window in addition to this it must be imagined that the architect had omitted the roof in order that the wires of the harp above described might be brought into every chamber the house has then been furnished with picks shovels planks and a few barrels populated with its black legions and there it is for you to look at at first the bottom of the bowl seems small you know the size of it as you look and that it is nine acres enough to make a moderate field but it looks like no more than a bowl gradually it becomes enormously large as your eye dwells for a while on the energetic business going on in one part and then travels away over an infinity of subdivided claims to the work in some other portion it seems at last to be growing under you and that soon there will be no limit to the variety of partitions on which you have to look you will of course be anxious to descend and if you be no better than a man there is nothing to prevent you should you be a lady i would advise you to stay where you are the work of going up and down is hard everything is dirty and the place below is not nearly so interesting as it is above one firm at the mine messrs baring gould atkins and company have gone to the expense of sinking a perpendicular shaft with a tunnel below from the shaft to the mine so as to avoid the use of the aerial tramway and by mr gould's kindness i descended through his shaft nevertheless there was some trouble getting into the mine and when i was there the labor in clambering about from one chamber to another in that marvellously broken house was considerable 
and was not lessened by the fact that the heat of the sun was about one hundred and forty degrees the division of the claims however became apparent to me and i could see how one was being worked and another left without any present digging till the claim owners convenience should be suited but there is a regulation compelling a man to work if the standing of his blue should become either prejudicial or dangerous to his neighbors there is one shaft that belonging to the firm i have mentioned and one tramway has been cut down by another firm through the reef and circumjacent soil so as to make an inclined plane up and down to the mine the ground was originally divided into eight hundred and one claims with some few double numbers to claims at the east end of the mine but in truth nearly half of those have never been of value consisting entirely of reef the diamondiferous matter the extent of which has now been ascertained not having travelled so far there are in truth four hundred and eight existing claims but there are subdivisions in regard to property very much more minute there are shares held by individuals as small as one sixteenth of a claim the total property is in fact divided into five hundred and fourteen portions the amount of which of course varies extremely every master miner pays ten shillings a month to the government for the privilege of working whether he owns a claim or only a portion of a claim in working this the number of men employed differs very much from time to time when i was there the mine was very full and there were probably almost four thousand men in it and as many more employed above on the stuff when the blue has come up and has been deposited in the great wooden boxes at the top it is then lowered by its own weight into carts and carried off to the ground of the proprietor every diamond digger is obliged to have a space of ground somewhere round the town as near his whim as he can get it to which his stuff is carted and then laid out to crumble and decompose this may occupy weeks but the time depends on what may be the fall of rain if there be no rain it must be watered at a very considerable expense it is then brought to the washing and is first put into a round puddling trough where it is broken up and converted into mud by stationary rakes which work upon the stuff as the trough goes round the stones of course fall to the bottom and as diamonds are the heaviest of stones they fall with the others the mud is examined and thrown away and then the stones are washed and rewashed and sifted and examined the greater number of diamonds are found during this operation but the large gems and those therefore of by far the greatest value are generally discovered while the stuff is being knocked about and put into buckets in the mine it need hardly be said that in such an operation as i have described the greatest care is necessary to prevent stealing and that no care will prevent it the kaffirs are the great thieves to such an extent of super excellence that white superintendence is spoken of as being the only safeguard the honesty of the white man may perhaps be indifferent but such as it is it has to be used at every point to prevent as far as it may be prevented the systematized stealing in which the kaffirs take an individual and national pride the kaffirs are not only most willing but most astute thieves feeling a glory in their theft and thinking that every stone stolen from a white man is a duty done to their chief and their tribe i think it may be taken as certain that no kaffir would feel the slightest pang of conscience at stealing a diamond or that any disgrace would be held to attach to him among other kaffirs for such a performance they come to the fields instructed by their chiefs to steal diamonds and they obey the orders like loyal subjects many of the kaffir chiefs are said to have large quantities of diamonds which have been brought to them by their men returning from the diggings but most of those which are stolen no doubt find their way into the hands of illicit dealers i have been told that the thefts perpetrated by the kaffirs amount to twenty five per cent on the total amount found but this i do not believe the opportunities for stealing are of hourly occurrence and are of such a nature as to make prevention impossible these men are sharp-sighted as birds and know and see a diamond much quicker than a white man they will pick up stones with their toes and secrete them even under the eyes of those who are watching them i was told that a man will so hide a diamond in his mouth and that no examination will force him to disclose it they are punished when discovered with lashes and imprisonment in accordance with the law on the matter no employer is now allowed to flog his man at his own pleasure 
and the white men who buy diamonds from kaffirs are also punished when convicted by fine and imprisonment for the simple offence of buying from a kaffir but with flogging also if convicted of having instigated a kaffir to steal nevertheless a lucrative business of this nature is carried on and the kaffirs know well where to dispose of their plunder though of course but for a small proportion of its value ten shillings a week and their food were the regular wages here as well as elsewhere this i found to be very fluctuating but the money paid had rarely gone lower for any considerable number of men than the above-named rate the lowest amount paid has been seven shillings sixpence a week sometimes it had been as high as twenty shillings and even thirty shillings a week a good deal of the work is supplied by contract certain middlemen undertaking to provide men with all expenses paid at one pound a week when mealies have become dear from drought there being no grass for oxen on the route no money can be made in this way such was the case when i was in Greekland west it is stated by mr oates an engineer in his evidence given to the committee on the Greekland west annexation bill in june eighteen seventy seven that the annual amount of wages paid at kimberley had varied from six hundred thousand pounds to one million six hundred thousand pounds a year nearly the whole of this had gone into the hands of the kaffirs perhaps the most interesting sight at the mine is the escaping of the men from their labor at six o'clock then at the sound of some welcome gong they began to swarm up the sides close at each other's heels apparently altogether indifferent as to whether there be a path or no they come as flies come up a wall only capering as flies never caper and shouting as they come in endless strings as ants follow each other they move passing a long ways which seem to offer no hold to a human foot then it is that one can best observe their costume in which a pair of trousers rarely forms a portion a soldier's red jacket or a soldier's blue jacket has more charms than any other vestment they seem always to be good-humoured always well behaved but then they are always thieves and yet how grand a thing it is that so large a number of these men should have been brought in so short a space of time to the habit of receiving wages and to the capacity of bargaining as to the wages for which they will work i shall not however think it so grand a thing if any one addresses them as the free and independent electors of kimberley before they have got trousers to cover their nakedness i must add also that a visitor to kimberley should if possible take an opportunity of looking down upon the mine by moonlight it is a weird and wonderful sight and may almost be called sublime in its peculiar strangeness end of section seventy nine this recording is in the public domain Section 80 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Farno Jahangiri. The World Story, Volume 3, Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 80. A Modern Battlefield. About 1898 by julian ralph the picture of our battles which are produced in illustrated papers are not at all like real scenes at the front art cannot keep pace with the quick advances of science and illustrators find that for effect they must still put as much smoke and confusion in their battle studies as when with the old pictures of waterloo if this were left out the public would be disappointed and unable to tell a battlefield from a parade lately a picture in one of our leading papers by a very capable artist showed the british storming a boer position in the middle distance was a boer battery and the only gunner left alive was standing up with a bandage round his head while the smoke and flame and flying fragments of shells filled the air in his vicinity in the rush of the instant he must have been bandaged by the same shot that struck him and as for the smoke and flying debris there was more of these in a corner of that picture than was to be seen in all of the four battles we have fought what then is a modern battle how does it look and sound really the field of operations is so extensive and the range of modern guns is so great that fighting conditions have altered until there is no longer any general noise of battle hurtled in the air 
no possibility of grasping or viewing an engagement from any single point. You may hear one of our big guns lose three miles over on the right and another two miles on the left. If you are near, they make a tremendous noise, yet I have not heard any explosion so loud as a good strong clap of thunder. The guns of the enemy cough far in front of you, and their shells burst within your lines with a louder sound, but with no real crash or deafening roar. Our guns at their muzzles create but little smoke, though our Leadite shells throw up clouds of dust and smoke where they fall miles away. Because the Boers are using old-fashioned powder in the cannon, there is a small white cloud wherever one is fired, and a spurt of red sand where their shells dig into the welt. The smoke of war, therefore, and the so-called roar of battle are nowadays occasional, scattered inconsiderable. Rifle firing has been the principal feature of our fights. It sounds like the frying of fat or like the crackling and snapping of green wood in a bonfire. If you are within two miles of the front, you are apt to be under fire and then you hear the music of individual bullets. Their song is like the magnified note of a mosquito. Zzz, they go over your head. Zzz, they finish as they bury themselves in the ground. This is a sound only to be heard when the bullets fly very close. You pick up your heels and run a hundred or even fifty yards and you hear nothing but the general crackle of rifle fire in and before the trenches. The put-put or wicker drundle felt gun is able to interest you at a distance of three miles. Its explosions are best described by the nickname given to the gun by our regiment, the Blooming Doe Knocker. Its bullets or shells are as big as the bowel of a large briar rub pipe, and they tear and slit the air with a terrible sound, exploding when they strike. The firing of this gun was heard all over the largest of our battlefields, and the sound of exploding shells carried far, because they were apt to fall on the quiet outer edge of the field. The whiz that even these missiles make in flying, however, is like the whispered answers of a maid in love, only to be heard by the favored individual who is especially addressed. Thus the many separate sounds are not loud enough to blend. The crowning all-pervading noises are those of the guns and of the rifle fire and on the vast welt spread over a double line of five to seven miles in length, only those that are very near are very loud. The scene of battle, the general view, is exceedingly orderly. There may be a desperate scrimmage where a company or two are storming a kopje, but level your glass on yonder hill, and what do you see? A fringe of tiny jets of fire from the top where the bowers are, and our men in khaki rising and reclining, and occasionally firing as they wind their way upward. The general view displays an arrangement as methodical as a chessboard. There are several battalions flat on their faces in two or three long lines. Over here is a battery in perfect order with its limber of horses addressed nearby. Another battery, equally well arranged as if to have its photograph taken, is to be seen in the middle field. A third is on the farther side. The cavalry is sweeping across the world in perfect rank and alignment. There is no confusion anywhere, nothing is helter-skelter or slapdash. I remember only two momentary disturbances of this stern, steady discipline. One was in the afternoon, during the Mother River fight, when a large band of mounted bowers made a flank movement on our extreme right and fired a volley at our immense mass of transport and ambulance wagons, water carts and ammunition trains. The drivers were taken by surprise and fell to lashing their mule teams and horses generally to the accompaniment of high-keyed kaffir yells. The route lasted but five minutes or less and was comical beyond description because the leading mules climbed over the wheelers and the faster the bullets fell the louder the kaffirs yelled and the more they plied their enormous whips. The bravery of our stretcher bearer is as much beyond question as it is beyond praise. All historians who tell of the dash and valor of the generals, colonels, majors, captains, and tommies of the army in common justice must also describe how the chaplains, doctors, and stretcher-bearers 
went in and out of the most hellish fire not once or twice but all through every battle it is just outside the range of fire that you see and realize the horrors of war it is there that the wounded crawl and stagger by you it is there that they spend their final output of energy and fall down to lie until assistance comes it is there that you see stretchers laden with their mangled freight and sound soldiers bearing the wounded on their backs and in their arms more certainly to know the brutality and woe of war happen upon a cup j that has just been stormed or a trench that has been carried go to such a place today twenty centuries after christ came with his message of peace on earth and good will to men and behold what you shall see here said i to the photographer in such a place i think it was belmont snap the scene look at the wounded all over the ground quick out with your camera oh i can't said he it's too horrible as you please i said but it's what the public wants you read in the writings of those who know nothing of war about the writhing of the wounded and the groaning on the battlefield there is no writhing and the groans are few and faint there was one man who was simply cut to pieces by a shell at Magerfontein, and his sufferings must have been awful. He kept crying, Doctor, can you do anything? Another begged to be killed, and the first wounded man I saw kept saying, poor fellow in ever so low a voice, Oh, dear, 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 dear. Oh, dear, dear, dear. But there is much less groaning than you would imagine, very little in proportion to the sufferings two things are so common with the wounded as to be almost like rules of behavior they all beg for water it used to be cigarettes that they asked for on the turkey side in the last war in europe and they seem always to be made gentle by their wounds men of their roughest speech profane by second nature cease to offend when stricken down well mate said one whose leg was shattered you never know when your turn will come do you and another simply cried oh dear now and then you heard for god's sake get me taken to an ambulance but no profanity was intended there many may wonder how it feels to be wounded all who had bones shattered by expanding bullets used nearly the same language to describe the sensation you feel they said exactly as if you had received a powerful shock from an electric battery and then comes a blow as if your foot or arm or whatever part it might be was crushed by a stroke with a tremendous mallet it is much the same in a lesser degree if a bone is struck by a more sore bullet but if the smooth slender clean little shot merely pierces the flesh a burning or stinging sensation is the instantaneous result lying six hours in the broiling sun was pretty bad said one whose arm bone was smashed but the really awful experience was the jolting over rocks when i was carried off in an ambulance another man an officer whose foot was smashed by an explosive bullet said look at my pipe that's what i did to keep from saying anything he had bitten off an inch of the hardened rubber mouthpiece that was before his wound was dressed the relief that is given by the dressing of a wound must be exquisite for you hear next to no groans or moans after a doctor has given this first attention in the army of lord methuan the great majority of wounds were in the arms and feet and by other points and experiences in war are more remarkable the chances of receiving a wound seem not to have greatly increased with the improvements in modern death dealing implements there were more than a million shots fired at mother river and yet only about 800 men were hit while the number of bullets that hit water bottles have sacks ration tins and coat sleeves was astonishing the damage to life and limb by the excessive artillery fire was next to nothing on a typical field of battle the armies oppose one another with orderly masses staff officers ride hither and thither batteries rumble to and fro at long intervals as they are ordered to take new positions and in the same way the cavalry appear and reappear on the edges of the field stretcher bearers bring the wounded out of the zone of danger and ambulances roll up get their loads and roll away again 
all day continually as in ceaseless strain. Brave privates bring out the wounded and work their way back into fire again, now running forward, now dropping flat upon the belt. Skulkers work back to the edge of the field in the same way, a few only, and are gathered up and sent forward in batches by the officers who come upon them. At last the cheer of British victory is heard, and the whole force rushes forward, or darkness falls upon an unfinished fight, and we grope about the world, seeking our camps and the food and drink that most of us have gone without too long. End of section 80 this recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fanu Jahangir. Section 81 of Egypt, Africa, and Arabia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org the world's story volume three egypt africa and arabia edited by eva march tappan section eighty one in the south african army nineteen o three to nineteen o four by gustav Frensen. from the general scramble of the powers for territory in africa germany emerged with an extensive tract in the southwest she has made vigorous efforts to develop it as a colony spending much blood and money in her attempts to subdue the natives and turn the country into a promising field for german emigration this story is from a book supposed to be written by a soldier in the german army telling of his experiences in the campaign against the natives in nineteen o three to nineteen o four the editor we were to surround the enemy in an arc to the north and corner them just as one runs in a circle and corners a colt so that it runs back where the boy is waiting with a halter in his hand we were to make forced marches with fewer and lighter wagons which meant smaller and lighter rations and with less and lighter clothing we were about three hundred men marines sailors and the home guards who were leading us the troop of old africans again went on ahead officers and common soldiers all mounted then came the old major with one officer then we foot soldiers in a long thin line veiled in dust here and there in our line were the thirty great cape wagons loaded with the light field pieces and each drawn by from ten to twenty-four long-horned oxen which were driven with much shouting by negroes on both sides of the way was more or less dense grayish green thorn bush the wood of which is as hard as bone and which grows to the height of a man and sometimes twice that height and has curved thorns as long as one's finger in such wise and through such country we now travelled day after day and week after week and day by day and week by week our progress became more painful for soon came the time when we began to suffer from hunger and want when the oxen began to fall from exhaustion and when some of the clumsily rumbling wagons were full of the distress of the wounded or very sick when the sun mounted high over us almost to the zenith and the sand was scorching and eyes and throats were burning the van would halt at a clearing where there ought to have been water but the water was not always there then suffering terribly from thirst we had to dig holes to see if we could find a little water slowly filtering through often it was salt or milky from lime or smelled vile and oftener we didn't find even this miserable loathsome water and we had to go on again thirsty far into the night if we did find water we would make a barricade of thorn-bush around us 
then each mess division would get its meagre supply of food a little meat from a freshly killed ox which had fallen exhausted a little flour and a little rice the meat or flour we stirred up in a kettle with the bad water and set it over the fire calling it meat soup or bouillon with rice or pancakes which they called plinson the cooking utensils were cleaned with sand after that we lay for an hour in the shade of the wagons or of a canvas that had been set up and then started on again weary and indifferent we marched on till evening and often into the night and i don't know that in those weeks we ever sang the moonlight lay wonderfully pale like bright spider webs over the broad bushy land and the unfamiliar stars gleamed strangely confused and restless the gun straps pressed on our shoulders our feet stumbled in the uneven track and our thoughts were slow and dull when we had reached water in the night and had had dealt out to us one or two or if it was more plenty even three cook-pan covers full of the miserable stuff we were too tired to cook properly we stirred up together a little of whatever we got and ate it half cooked we had orders to bring the water to the boiling point before we took it but i have seen the officers and for that matter even the physicians themselves drink it just as it was we were too tired and apathetic so it went on every day for four weeks the country was always flat and bushy we didn't see a single house and we didn't meet a human being it was bad that we couldn't take provisions enough with us if we had been able to many more would have seen their homes again we didn't notice it ourselves but the doctors and officers probably saw that we were gradually getting flabby and weak if we had even had time and inclination to cook properly it would have been better but the water was often so repulsive that it was no pleasure and we had to use it so sparingly that our utensils got foul i rubbed them with sand and i rubbed them with grass but they did not get clean and it was bad that we had only thin khaki uniforms in the morning we marched up to our knees in wet grass at noon in hot sand and all day through thorny brush so that the lower part of our trousers fringed out and soon hung in shreds when as sometimes happened a thunderstorm or a shower came up and then night came on we were horribly cold there were some very cold nights thus it had to come about that we soon became very weak even though we did not notice it ourselves i used to think sometimes with surprise there was so much talk and squabbling among us on shipboard and so many jokes among us where are they and why don't we sing how pale and yellow and thin barons has grown how sunken and feverish our under officers eyes look what awfully thin beards we young men have there were many among us not yet twenty once we came upon a great covered wagon left deserted on the road a farmer or a trader had wanted to escape and had packed his most valuable possessions in the wagon harnessed his oxen to it and driven the rest of his flocks before it he had come as far as this his bones lay eaten by beasts his goods were stolen and round about the wagon were strewn the only things which the enemy couldn't use his letters and books we buried the bones in the bush tied a cross together with string and set it on the grave and took some letters and remnants of books read them and threw them away another day we discovered hidden in the bush on a hill by the way many deserted huts of the enemy they were like great beehives made of a skeleton of branches and twigs plastered over with cow dung although we were so tired we took the time to set fire to these and afterwards stood on a rise in our road and looked back the glow dyed the evening sky for a great distance 
besides this i don't know that anything special happened to us we marched continually along the sandy road in a cloud of dust on both sides of us brush that from time to time was thinner or that yielded to make a majestic clearing our horsemen the old africans and the officers rode often an hour in advance of us and tried to spy out the enemy when they came back the news would often spread through the ranks or at night from fire to fire we are close to the enemy now to-morrow or the day after we shall meet them then we rejoiced and each man sat and looked over his gun and examined his cartridge belt but a new day came and still another and we grew weaker and more exhausted and we saw nothing of the enemy so it went on for four weeks further and further it was bad that we never had our clothes off and could never wash ourselves and seldom and then not thoroughly even our faces and hands but what was worse we could never get enough to eat any more they had given to me the task of getting the rations for our mess i brought less and less to the cooking hole a little rice a little flour a little canned meat and a little coffee there was no more sugar and one day i came back from the wagon with no salt then i baked pancakes made of dirty water and flour the water we drank with our food tasted disgustingly of glauber salts often it was as yellow as pea soup and smelled vile the nights were cold i cannot say that we were cast down we didn't grumble either we perceived that it couldn't go any other way and that the officers endured all that we did we were very quiet and sober though we held ourselves together with the thought we shall soon now come upon the enemy and beat them and finish up the campaign and then oh then we shall go back to the capital and get new clothes and have a bath we'll spring into the water and we'll get a new handkerchief a really clean red checked one and a great lot of good meat and a handful of white salt and a great great mug of clean crystal clear water how it will glisten and we'll have a long long drink and hold out the empty mug and again the water will pour into it and we'll drink and drink and then after a few days we'll travel back to the coast and we'll start for home what shan't we have to tell about this monkey land our boots fell apart our trousers were nothing but shreds and rags at the bottom our jackets got full of great holes from the thorns and were horribly greasy because we wiped everything off on them our hands were full of inflamed places because we often had to seize the thorns with them our lieutenant often talked to us keep up your courage he would say we shall have a fight and throw the rascals back to the west into the jaws of the main division and in july we'll be at home again i marvelled at him that he though not much older than we and suffering all the hardships that we did was always uniformly calm while we were often good for nothing and got angry and grumbled it wasn't because he had learned more than we i think it came from the fact that he was at heart a cultivated man that is he had his soul and mind in control so that he could value justly and could make allowance for the things about him his will would have it so and it came to pass and i've noticed that will-power is worth ten times more than mere knowing we never said a word of how much we thought of him and watched him he was a small man and rode a strong east prussian horse and always wore his felt hat a little over the left ear with the brim tilted up on the left side the old major came sometimes and addressed us while doing so he looked at each man as closely as though he wanted to find out if he were having any sort of trouble we all felt that he was a wise and wide-awake man and that he had a gentle sympathetic heart we felt therefore safe under him and we knew it could not be any different from what it was or he would have changed it and we would run like so many rabbits if we could do any little service for him when any one had run that way we used to jeer at him and say are you trying to burst yourself man 
but when the turn came to any one else he would run just the same sometimes when we were all sitting about our fire-holes i would take myself off over to the old africans who always had their fire by one of the wagons which sergeant hansen conducted then hansen would motion to me for he liked me since i had talked to him in the courtyard of the fort they always sat by themselves not entirely out of pride but also because they were mostly from five to twenty years older than we were some of them had been already ten years or more in the country i used to sit down quietly with them and listen with great eagerness to their talk sometimes they talked of the wild fifteen years struggles in the colony in all or part of which they had shared and of the fighting in the last three months they recalled the scene of many a brave deed and named many a valiant man dead or living i was surprised that so many hard undertakings of which i had never heard or read so much as a word had been carried through by germans and that already so much german blood had been lavishly spilled in this hot barren land they touched too upon the causes of the uprising and one of the older men who had been long in the country said children how should it be otherwise they were ranchmen and proprietors and we were there to make them landless working men and they rose up in revolt they acted in just the same way that north germany did in eighteen thirteen this is their struggle for independence but the cruelty said some one else and the first speaker replied indifferently do you suppose that if our whole people should rise in revolt against foreign oppressors it would take place without cruelty and are we not cruel toward them they discussed too what the germans really wanted here they thought we ought to make that point clear the matter stood this way there were missionaries here who said you are our dear brothers in the lord and we want to bring you these benefits namely faith love and hope and there were soldiers farmers and traders and they said we want to take your cattle and your land gradually away from you and make you slaves without legal rights those two things didn't go side by side it is a ridiculous and crazy project either it is right to colonize that is to deprive others of their rights to rob and to make slaves or it is just and right to christianize that is to proclaim and live up to brotherly love one must clearly desire the one and despise the other one must wish to rule or to love to be for or against jesus the missionaries used to preach to them ye are our brothers and that turned their heads they are not our brothers but our slaves whom we must treat humanely but strictly these ought to be our brothers they may become that after a century or two they must first learn what we ourselves have discovered to stem water and to make wells to dig and to plant corn to build houses and to weave clothing after that they may well become our brothers one doesn't take any one into a partnership till he has paid up his share one old freight carrier who mixed many english and dutch words in his speech said it would be better if the colony were sold to the english the germans are probably useful as soldiers and farmers he said but they understand nothing about the government of colonies they want this and they want that a younger man who had been in the country only three years said in answer there'll have to be a thousand or two german graves in this country before that happens and perhaps they'll be dug this year over these conversations it got to be late at night the fires still glowed a little and in the uncertain light i saw the faces that had become browned and weather-beaten from the burning of the african sun in these hard hot days of marching and cold moonlight nights when we were advancing painfully but still not without courage one week after another through the wild bushy land there was not a house not a ditch not a tree not a boundary in the burning sun by day or the pale moonlight of the clear nights when i was plodding along hungry and dirty and weary 
by the sandy uneven wagon track my gun on my shoulder when i lay in the noon hour in the shadow of the great cape wagons and in the bitter cold nights hungry and restless in a thin blanket on the bare earth and the strange stars shone in the beautiful blue heavens then i believe even then in those painful weeks i learned to love that wonderful endless country end of section eighty one this recording is in the public domain